Test, test, test. test. This evening, SFUSD will provide closed captioning and American Sign Language Translation Services. SFUSD will provide closed captioning and American Sign Language ASL interpreter services throughout today's board meeting. Live transcription can be found here. HTTPS colon backslash backslash www.streamtext.net slash player question mark event equals SFUSD dash board. Attendees who wish to provide public comment to the board and would like an ASL interpreter can use the Q&A box in the Zoom app to type their name or handle and list the item or items on the agenda they would like to comment on. The attendee will need to have a functioning camera in order to communicate with the interpreter and the board. When it is the attendee's opportunity to provide comment, the Zoom host will promote the attendee to panelists and enable the attendee's video. Any member of the public may email their comments with the agenda item identified in the comment to board office at sfusd.edu by 2 p.m. the day of the meeting if they do not wish to make their comment during the board meeting. The comments will be read into the record. And as a reminder, the Q&A function at this meeting is only for ASL interpretation requests. Please do not use it for any other purposes. Questions will not be answered. Language translation, you can go ahead, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. SBUSD is offering interpretation services in Spanish and Cantonese. 
If you need interpretation, please dial the following phone number. After dialing, please introduce the PIN number. This message will be repeated in Spanish and Cantonese. Buenas tardes, el Distrito Escolar Unificado de San Francisco ofrece servicios de interpretación en el idioma español. Si necesita interpretación por medio de Google Meet, por favor marque el siguiente número telefónico, seguido de la clave de acceso. Número 1-319-382-9671. Por favor, introduzca la clave 665-996-976, seguido de la tecla numerada. Gracias. Cantonese interpreter, please. Thank you. Tagahou. San Francisco, Luna Pauke, I come manga video. I would have gone condo market in your formal. So you go to your condo market in your formal. Sing that you matter. Yet say, but say, but say, some, some, ye, but in a sure magma, chat ye, yet. 六零九八九五整，重复一次，电话号码系一四八四八五四三三二八，然后输入密码七二一六零九八九五整。我晒，Thank you. Thank you, President Lopez. That concludes our announcement of translation services. Recording in progress. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. The regular meeting of the Board of Education of the San Francisco Unified School District for February 8th, 2022 is now called to order. Roll call, please. Commissioner Alexander? Here. Commissioner Bogus? Here. Commissioner Collins? Here. Commissioner Lamb, or Vice President Lamb? Here. Commissioner Maliga? Commissioner Sanchez? Here. President Lopez? Here. Student Delegate um, Lam? Here. And Student Delegate Liang? Here. Item one, general information. Item two, opening items. We will begin our meeting with the land acknowledgement. We, the San Francisco Board of Education, acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatashaloni, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatashaloni have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatish community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Item two, approval of board minutes. The regular meeting of January 25th, 2022 and special meetings of December 7th, 2021, December 9th, 2021, December 16th, 2021 and January 27th, 2022. I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Are there any corrections? And I will also check for our virtual participants. Seeing none, roll call vote. Student Delegate Lamb? Yes. Student Delegate Liang? Yes. Commissioner Alexander? Yes. Commissioner Bogus? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Vice President Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Maliga? Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. And President Lopez? Yes. Six eyes. Okay, let's move on to item three, our superintendent's report. I'd like to call on Dr. Matthews. Thank you, President Lopez. Good evening, everyone. Tonight, I wanna to start by acknowledging Black History Month. As a school district that values diversity, we believe that Black History should be celebrated 365 days a year, 366 in a leap year. The diverse histories, experiences, stories, and voices of Black people should be recognized, honored, and uplifted every day. We also value that fun the fundamental opportunity Black History Month offers schools to acknowledge African Americans as critical to the past, present, and future of this country. We recognize the importance, relevance, and origins of Black History Month. The month of February was officially recognized as Black History Month in 1976, but its origins go back 50 years prior when Carter G. Woodson had a vision for promoting African-American history. 
1926, Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History launched Negro History Week to promote the study of African American history as a discipline to celebrate the accomplishments of African Americans. Although we have made pro progress in our efforts to reach each and every San Francisco Unified School District student, we know that there are still persistent gaps in access, experiences, and outcomes of our African American students in our district, city, and country. And we are proud that there are many examples of how students, staff, school sites, and school communities in San Francisco Unified are uplifting the achievements and history of African Americans all year, and especially during the month of February. This month, the San Francisco Alliance of Black School Educators presents the 28th African American Honor Roll for all San Francisco Unified students of African American descent in ages 3 through 12 who have earned a GPA of 3.0 or higher. This year's event will take place on Zoom over three days on February 15th for elementary students, on February 16th for middle school students, and February 17th for high school students. For more information, visit the San Francisco Alliance of Black School Educators website, www.sfabse.org. Congratulations to each and every scholar on the African American Honor Roll. There is so much to celebrate. Happy Lunar New Year and Gung Hei Fat Choi to everyone who's celebrating. In this year of the tiger, let's live our shared San Francisco Unified value of fearlessness. In line with San Francisco Unified's wellness policy, Be Well guidelines, our wellness teams have shared some fun and creative ways to celebrate holidays observed by San Francisco Unified's diverse community throughout the year, including Lunar New Year. To check out these ideas, visit sfusd.edu slash be well, one word. Scroll down to wellness resources and click on ceremonious celebrations to explore resources for different holidays. Now I'd like to provide a health and safety update. As of January 29th, the San Francisco Department of Public Health reported a seven day new COVID-19 case per day average of 694 cases. This is a decrease from the 919 cases on January 26th and what appears to be at the height of the surge, which was 2,229 cases on January 9th. So we are now down to 694 cases. This is a strong indicator that the surge continues to decline as predicted. The city's vaccination rate is at 82%. For 12 through 17 year olds, it is 90%. And for five through 11 year olds, it's now at 64%. 64% of San Francisco residents have received their booster shot and 32% of 12 through 17 year olds have received their booster shot. To support students and staff having access to vaccinations and boosters, we're working with both the San Francisco Department of Public Health and the California Department of Public Health to stand up vaccination clinics at our school sites. Additional school, site additional school site vaccination sites have been added and include Tenderloin Community School, Bryan Elementary, E.R. Taylor Elementary, Moscone Elementary, and Viz Valley Elementary. All information about vaccination sites is on our district website under COVID vaccine resources and includes flyers in multiple languages. Another reminder and encouragement, get vaccinated. If you are not and get your children vaccinated if they're over five years old. Testing. San Francisco Unified has provided 3,579 color tests from January 3rd to February 4th. Since March, 2021, San Francisco Unified has provided over 100,000 color tests. Additionally, we have seen a decrease in the median turnaround time for test results from color, which is now taking less than 24 hours. And in some cases, there has been an 11, hour turnaround time. San Francisco Unified has now been offering weekly testing at our school sites for over a year. Both staff and students have access to the testing options. As of November 2021, we have been able to offer students the additional option of the self swab kits and now have daily color pickups at each school site in addition to the four daily mobile labs and central office locations. Safer Together has added Burton High School as one of their re weekly rapid antigen testing sites starting tomorrow, February 9th. The site will be open from 1.30 to 5 to accommodate staff and students 
who could not make the earlier times at the other sites. We're working on adding one more later afternoon site to open soon. In order to streamline access to testing for the San Francisco Unified School District students family, and families who have not already done so, you should set up a color account for your child today. Students 14 and older can create their own accounts. Students and staff must register for a color self swab testing account to access the self swab testing service available at every San Francisco Unified School District site. Families who need to register their students for account can go to www.color.com slash SFUSD dash students. Once again, to register, register your students for a color account. Go to www.color.com slash SFUSD. Dash students. Is everybody uh, muted who has a zoom on in here? Masking. Over 1.2 million masks have been delivered to schools in January. Distribution of K95 for adolescents began last week as part of the monthly PPE distribution to schools. You can find information about our distribution efforts on the public facing dashboard on our website. Some of you may have heard that California's statewide mask mandate, which requires everyone to wear face coverings indoors, regardless of vaccination status, will be lifted February 15th as anticipated. Health officials have noted that cases have dropped dramatically from the peak of the Omicron surge. The easing of the state order next week will not apply to PK-12 schools. So I want to repeat that. The easing of the masking state order, the lifting of the state order, will not apply to K-12 schools, where indoor masking will continue to be required for all students and staff. Face coverings also will still be required on public transportation due to a federal health order and in certain congregate settings like nursing homes. Also, people who are not vaccinated would still be required to wear masks indoors in all public settings. SFUSD has been actively sharing information about safety protocols, vaccination, and COVID testing offerings with families and students through multiple channels. Essential information about testing has been translated and made available in seven San Francisco Unified School District languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, Vietnamese, Tagalog, Samoan, and English. SFUSD online communications include website, social media, and email. Online communications are essential as an accurate reference for all those who support families in a more targeted manner, including school staff and CBO partners. And are the basis for any information links sent by text and phone calls, as only limited information can be veiled in short messages. A couple of examples to share with you this evening. The SFUSD website is updated regularly and contains an overview of information of SFUSD COVID testing options, schedules, location, and registration details. The Family Announcement Bulletin is a weekly summary of public announcements, resources, and opportunities sent directly to families, SFUSD families who have an active email on file, also receive a monthly family newspaper that contains curated resources and information. Additionally, to remove access barriers for families, SFUSD sent multilingual print mailers to every household in August 2021 with health and safety and COVID testing information. Every student will also receive a print mailer in February 2022 with COVID-19 resources and information on how to register for a color swab, self-swab account. SFUSD shares testing information directly with student audiences through a monthly high school student newsletter and during the recent surge, and is now sharing information in weekly student digests sent to middle and high school students. Finally, pleased, I am pleased to inform you that our school sites will be closed on February 21st, 2022 in observance of President's Day. This is a non-instructional day. 
the most up-to-date academic calendar is available on sfusd.edu slash calendars and is now downloadable in PDF format in seven San Francisco Unified School Dif District languages. Thank you, President Lopez. That ends my announcements for this evening. <laughs> Thank you for that information. And I know there are efforts to get your reports posted publicly yes. so people can access the information further. Yes. Okay, before we hear from our student delegates, I did want to announce, I will be moving up section J on our agenda regarding the independent study item to follow section D after our advisory report. Item four, student delegates report. I'd like to call on our student delegates. Thank you, President Lopez. Uh, this is our student advisory report for this evening. Good afternoon. We want to start off by giving a quick recap of our student advisory council cabinet meeting from last night. We want to thank CPA, the Chinese Progressive Association, for coming in and wanting to work through the COVID demands with us. Additionally, we are excited to announce that we have begun the planning of our annual youth summit. And with that, I'll pass it to student delegate Liang. Um, and then we just wanted to give another update on our Title IX resolution that is still in the works, and we are excited for what's to come. And lastly, as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email Judson at Steele j1 at sfusd.edu and our next full sac council meeting would be on february 4 21st no 14th at 6 p.m and that is open to the public thank you president lopez and that concludes our student delegate report great thank you for that information moving on to section c public comment item one protocol for public comment Please note that public comment is an opportunity for the board to hear from the community on matters within the board's jurisdiction. We ask that you refrain from using employee and student names. If you have a complaint about a district employee, you may submit it to the employee supervisor in accordance with district policy. As a reminder, board rules and California law do not allow us to respond to comments or attempt to answer questions during the public comment time. If appropriate, the superintendent will ask that staff follow up with speakers. Item two, comments from SFUSD students. We will hear from SFUSD students who wish to speak on any matter. Students will have up to two minutes to make comments and may also speak at any other public comment time. Thank you, President Lopez. So please raise your hand uh, to speak if you are a student at this time. Uh, again, to reiterate, you'll have one minute each for a total of 15 minutes. Can that be repeated in Spanish and Chinese, please? Buenas tardes. Por favor, levante su mano si desea añadir un comentario público. Le recordamos que los comentarios públicos en este momento están únicamente hacia los estudiantes. Eh, se les va a dar un tiempo de 15 minutos, un minuto por persona. Gracias. 而這個是學生的公眾發言時間,如果你是學生的話,請你是想任何在疫情或者不在疫情的時間,你是想學生的公眾發言時間。Thank you. And just to clarify, apologies, uh, students are getting two minutes. My apologies, I misspoke. Hello, Darcy. Sorry, I forgot it was students first. I'll be back. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello, Cal. Hello, I apologize for any background noise. I am still at school, but I really wanted to talk about the UESF tentative agreement that was passed by the union today and will likely be passed by the board in the future. One of the district's main pillars is being student-centered, yet tonight the board in closed session will likely have favorable discussion to move forward with an agreement that only causes harm to its students. The, purpose, the proposed UESF agreement takes vital resources away from students. AP classes are essential in providing students with a rigorous and challenging course load, and moreover, these cuts don't only harm AP classes themselves. They're also detrimental to other enrichment programs like visual and performing arts, language, and even our peer resources program, all of which are programs that are often highlights of students' time in high school and make it so much more bearable. 
I implore you all in the future to vote no on this agreement because of how much it impedes students' learning experiences. I also encourage the district to publicly accept accountability for its role in forcing the creation of this agreement. It's been caused by the district's lack of proper budget control in the past, and also because teachers feel underpaid and they're willing to trade in their other teachers to get a one-time bonus or two-time bonus. The district shouldn't be throwing teachers under the bus as a result of its own long-standing negligence when it comes to the budget, taking away the livelihood of 60 real people. And I think that's something that's truly being forgotten in this discussion. These teachers that would be fired are real people with real bills to pay, real families to support, and real futures and retirements to worry about. These teachers are not pawns that can be tossed aside in a political game. So I really hope that considering both how this agreement detrimentally affects students and how it detrimentally affects the teachers who would be fired, that the Board of Education does not allow this agreement to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Astrid, or Astrid. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Astrid. I'm an SFUSD high school junior. I'm calling to make public comment about tonight's closed session conference with labor negotiators, specifically around the UESF contract. If this contract moves forward, over 60 full-time teaching positions could be cut, and AP programs that do not fulfill graduation requirements will be cut. 11,000 SFUSD students participate in AP classes annually. At some schools, the money from the AP prep period bonuses is also used to supplement other programs like art, languages, and peer resources. These are all classes that students take out of passion and interest. That is not fair to students or teachers. So I urge the board to vote against this agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Zia. I had to promote you pan to panelists in order to speak, so your video will be on. Can you me? can go ahead. Zia, I see you, but I think you're on mute. Oh. Um, I can... can you hear me? Yes, you can speak up a little bit. But yes, we can hear you. Okay. Hello, hello, school school board. I'm Zia Langton from Cobb Elementary School. It has come to my attention that you are trying to take away the teachers that help us with our education and who we love. There, there is a way that you can save some money. One way is that you can keep all the lights at all of the school sites off at night. This would save the school district millions and millions of dollars. Children are born every day. More people can get a public education in San Francisco. Isn't that what you want? These teachers and staff are helping us so much. Please don't take them away. Thank you, Zia. It says KW. KW. Okay. Hello, Tansy. Uh, same thing. Um, you are being promoted to panelists in order to speak, and your video will be on. You can go ahead, Tansy. Tansy, are you there? Hi. Hi, you can go ahead. Good evening, everybody. I am Tansy. Now I am online learning, but I will be back in person to my home school, Sheridan. Sheridan means a lot to me. I am able to go to the same school with all my siblings. I get a lot of help from Miss Savory, my reading teacher. The teacher. She does so much to help me learn how to read better and how to improve myself on the reading. Please don't cut any money from Sheridan. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Rachel.
Thank you. My name is Rachel Robles. I'm a Sheridan parent with a daughter in the fifth grade. I have just enrolled I'm, my youngest daughter. I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry to interrupt. Is your student going to speak right now? Because this space is for students only. You will be able to speak publicly after the student section. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, Kylie. Uh, same thing, I had to promote you to panelists in order to speak, uh, so your video will be on, but you can go ahead. Um, hello. Um, my name is Kylie. I am a student at Dr. William L. L Cop School, and I don't want our teachers to go, especially our mentors. Our teachers work very hard for us. We need them to learn and get an education. My kindergarten teacher taught me to read. Now I'm a, at a very high level. My first grade teacher was very nice, playful, fun, and inspiring. My mentor also helped me be a great reader. And now we play a lot of games and talk about life. Help keep teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Catherine. Yes, hi. Catherine, are you a student? I'm reading a letter on behalf of one of my students that they wrote. So I'm reading a student letter. It says, hi. My name is Anjali. I'm a student at Cobb School, and I heard about the budget situation that's going on in our school district. I feel so upset because some of our teachers may leave, and the future of our the future of our school and my friends could be harmed. Both my little brother and I speak Spanish and English. Because of this, he and I both needed some help with our reading and other subjects that we struggled in. The teachers at Cobb have worked with us before school, after school, and during school to help us improve our reading. Do not take our wonderful teachers from Cobb kids. We just want to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Alan. Yes, I'm here. Hello, I'm Alan Wong. I am a senior at Abraham Lincoln High School, and I just wanted to bring up the uh, bring attention to the SEC demands letter that um, we've been working with. I'm actually a part of the Chinese Progressive Association, aka CPA, and together with the Student Advisory Council, we have been working to improve, um, well, improve and expand on the demands that have been made based off of student surveys. We've also pulled other teachers around uh, schools to ask what they feel like we need in our education. And we just want to, you know, make sure that everyone is up to date and um, considering the um, considering our future plans, including potential options for hybrid and virtual um, transparency around resource distribution, including COVID-19 uh, tests and PCR tests, as well as um, better enforcement strategies for safety protocols and, and all in preparation for uh, spring break. That is all. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Amina. I had to promote you to panelists as well, so your video will be on. Amina, you can go ahead. I mean, are you ready to go? Yeah. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Amina. I am a student at Cobb Elementary, and I really don't want y'all to take my old kindergarten teacher away because when when it was my first day at kindergarten, she welcomed me. Miss, her name is Miss Snell. She welcomed me when I was so shy and. I made friends, new friends too, because when I walked in, she helped me put my stuff away, and I really love her a lot. So don't take Miss Snow away from us, please. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Beatrice. Um, can you see me? 
No. Oh, um, wait, mom, where's the, um, the, uh, yeah, check over here. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me see something. Okay. For some reason, I can't turn on my camera. You don't, you, um, because you're an attendee, you do not have a camera access, so you can just speak oh, okay. no. Okay. You have two okay. minutes. Are you a student? Uh, yeah, I am a student, actually. Great. Go ahead. All right. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Kenneth Stewart. I work at, I mean, I go to Mission High School. Um, my mom is actually part of the uh, SFUSD district. And right now, they are currently laying her off um, because of her new managers who have not. Um, Okay, yeah, well, with her work right now, she has like a lot of seniority and she's been working in the SFUSD district for a while. And um, for some reason, they're like laying her off and they did this the last time. Uh, but yeah, they did this the last time and um, she should have like enough seniority to stay in uh, the district because I believe that she deserves it and she's been working there for a while. And she has a lot more experience than most other people. And I would really like her to keep her job. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, Danny. Uh, hello. Yes, you can go ahead. Oh, okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Danny, and I'm a student at uh, Cobb Elementary School. And I don't want any of the staff to leave because I see the staff having fun with some of the students and also the students will lose their mental will lose some of their mentors all of the staff and teachers are amazing please keep our staff and teachers thank you thank you hello selena Go ahead, this is for a daughter here. Hi, I'm a student. I understand school districts face a financial deficit, um, but our school staff and teachers shouldn't. Um, I'm sorry, um, can you identify yourself? Are you a student? What school do you go to? I'm a student at Lowell High School. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. And they shouldn't. Uh, just to say the thing again. Uh, just uh, sorry, this is her first time saying it. She's a little bit nervous. Uh, you want to just start from the beginning? Yeah, just, just say it again. Okay, just introduce yourself, Deidre. Okay, here, here. Um, okay, you have to introduce yourself first. To continue what I was saying, um, I understand that the school district faced a financial deficit, but our schools, teachers, and students shouldn't be sacrificed because of that. Okay, thank you. Hello, Sherry. Hi, my name is Sherry, and I'm a senior at Lowell High School. Um, time and time again, we see policies created that negatively impact the exact people our schools are created to serve. Policies created and contracts that without enough impact from these people, in which is case teachers and students. And while I most likely won't be attending an SFUSC school next year, there are thousands of students who are and thousands of students who will miss out on unique programs like AVID or peer resources, programs that have helped me and thousands of other people find their way through high school and interest for beyond. I firmly believe that we can't trade student opportunities and well-being for things like one-time bonuses. And I hope that as a district that claims to support students and put them first, that we will uplift students and teachers by providing opportunities for them to learn instead of cutting them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and President Lopez, oh, one more. Should we do one more, President Lopez? After, thank you. Hello, Claire. Claire, are you there? Okay, it looks like that concludes public comment on uh, for students. Okay, thank you. 
And as a reminder, students can still make comment throughout tonight's agenda. Item three under section C is comments from the general public on all items that are not on tonight's agenda. Commenters will have one minute to speak and we will have up to 20 minutes of public comment time. Thank you. Um, again, uh, this is public comment uh, for anyone. Uh, items that are not on the agenda, please raise your hand if you care to speak. Can that be repeated in Spanish and Chinese, please? Buenas tardes. Por favor, levante su mano si desea añadir un comentario público. Le recordamos que usted puede opinar sobre todas las cosas que no estén en la agenda. El tiempo es de 20 minutos, un minuto por persona. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Darcy. Hi, this is Darcy Blackburn. We're speaking with Sheridan School. I believe there's a number of parents lined up. Is this the time oh. for us to speak? Okay, yes. Yeah, so I needed to start from the beginning with your group, but it looked like the first person wasn't on. Okay. So I may circle back to you all, okay? Okay, Thank that'll you. be great. So should I start or should I wait? No, no, I you, should, you should wait and I will, I will announce when you're going to speak, okay? And I'll no let me... problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Hello, Chris. Hi, um, Chris Klaus. I'm a special educator at Washington High School. I'm calling in to speak about the bell schedules for next year, since I, this is the time to speak on things not on the agenda. Um, I'd just like to point out that we have two amazing board resolutions at play with an issue around scheduling. We have the ethnic studies resolution and we have an arts resolution from a few years ago. I love the ethnic studies resolution and I love the arts resolution. Unfortunately, they don't play well together when you look at a student's class schedule in a six period school day. At this point, when ethnic studies comes down the pipeline as a graduation requirement, it's going to be very difficult for students to actually be able to enroll in higher level arts classes and other electives that really make high school so much fun and really allow them to custom to customize their experience and tailor it to what they want to learn most. Um, from a SPED teacher perspective, it also makes it really hard with a six period schedule and this added requirement for students with IEPs to take electives. So please consider allowing schools to go to a seven day bell schedule, thank you, or a seven period bell schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm calling to implore the board to require the superintendent and the policy team to release immediately the number of kindergarten consolidations and general class closures at the elementary schools. I firmly believe, based on both Dr. Matthew's history in Oakland and my own understanding as a teacher in California for over 20 years, that the district is gearing up to do math site closures uh, one year out. Moreover, these decisions do not appear to be made based on the best available data or, here, or our equity values. We heard tonight from two schools that have high amounts of low income students. I am a teacher at Junipero Serra, despite rising kindergarten requests, including more than enough first place requests to fill our classrooms, we are slated to lose numerous classrooms next year. And we have been told that only first round data from EPC will be used, given that we and many other schools serve families that the district does not reach during the first round. We expect and demand better. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Supriya. Hello, thank you for taking my call tonight. This is Supriya Ray calling. I have a child in elementary school and a child in middle school in SFUSD. I'm calling with uh, two comments about outdoor matters. The first is a request that the school district clearly inform schools that masking is only required indoors and not outdoors, despite the fact that neither SFUSD or SFDPH require masking outdoors. As far as I can tell, the large majority of schools are still requiring it. And to have our kids being wearing masks when it's not 
considered important for health or safety pretty much anywhere else is, you know, we need to give them a break and let them take off their masks when they're outside and where it's safe. Second thing I wanted to mention is I really would urge again that the board, you know, urge the district to move forward on longer term outdoor planning for the schools in SFUSD. However much time it may take to get the bonds actually issued, the bond funding that's been talked about, there is no reason that that needs to delay planning. And it has been since October now, since the board passed that money, uh, passed the bond funding to be reallocated to outdoor use and no meetings at all have occurred. Nothing has occurred in terms of consultation with schools or parents that I am aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Forgive me if I mispronounce Ketty. Hi, I am a parent at Lakeshore and I'm asking you not to fund the schools based on a popularity. Lakeshore is a wonderful school and I fell in love with it just because I had a chance to tour it and the families do not have the chance to see it. And obviously they didn't include it in their list. So please do not make decisions of funding and cutting our wonderful teachers from school that we love so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Megan. Hi, I'm Megan Kaluza, behavior analyst in the school district. And um, I'm imploring the district to um, consider all of the many things on educators' plates right now and offer more assistance specifically around um, the new Empower system and the new um, way that pay stubs look. There's a lot of confusion around our pay. And of all the things we need to think about right now, our students, layoffs, keeping our schools stable, being paid so that we can pay our bills is one of those things we'd like to not have to stress about. There are so many more important things. So um, offering in-person support, I've gone to the self-help website many times and not found as much help as is needed. And we're going to each other to try to help, but it's not enough. Um, and it, it's very stressful in a very stressful time. So please provide more support so that our educators can really focus on the important stuff at our schools. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with the, the, the Sheridan group. Um, you had 12 people on this list. The first three are not on the list. So I'm gonna start with the fourth and go from there. Hello, okay. Rachel, go ahead. Rachel Robles. Thank you. My name is Rachel Robles and I am a Sheridan parent with a daughter in the fifth grade. I, have in, I just enrolled my youngest daughter for the kindergarten next year, but I learned that the district is planning to remove one of the kindergarten classes. It is possible that she will have to go to another school since Sheridan may not have enough space for her. It's very important that she attend Sheridan school because it's the closest to our house and having to travel another distance from home to take a child to school, it's a big deal for me because I'm gonna say it, Often we have, I have to choose between food or paying for gas. And I'm gonna say it again. Sometimes I have to choose between food and paying for gas. And so if I have to bring my child farther to a school from my house, why? My oldest daughter has been in Sheridan since kindergarten. I already know the teachers and they are excellent. And- Teacher? Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Who, everybody who's on a panel here needs to mute their mute their mute yourself. Thank you. Hello, Rebecca. Hello. Um, my name is Rebecca. I have two boys that attend Sheridan Elementary School. My oldest son started off in one of Sheridan's special day preschool classes. From the beginning of our journey, it has felt like a home to our family, whether it was making adjustment from special education preschool to general education kindergarten class, 
or helping to get the right accommodations for their success, Sheridan has gone be above and beyond in every way. I believe that Sheridan Elementary School helped facilitate emotional and educational growth in a personal way I could not have received elsewhere. My boys enthusiastically talk about how much they love their teachers, gardening, drumming, and theater courses and all other activities at Sheridan, along with their lifelong friendships made with peers. I would personally hate for anyone to miss out on the opportunity to send their children to our school. And that is exactly what I fear when I heard the decision had been made to reduce the incoming kindergarten population from two classes to just one. Over time, that would mean essentially cutting the school in, in half. I ask that you not allow that to happen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Christopher? Christopher Beck. Uh, yes, good evening. Um, I have a child in Sheridan Elementary. Um, hearing that Sheridan will slowly be losing classes made me want to speak up. Um, Sheridan has been absolutely essential and meaningful for my family. Um, the entire faculty and all the amazing programs has made my and my child's life possible. Um, there has got to be a better way of addressing a budget shortfall than denying kindergartners and children starting their educational path um, to not be able to have Sheridan. Um, Sheridan has been a crown jewel of the neighborhood. And in my personal opinion, as a um, behavior specialist, it would be a catastrophic outcome for the emotional and social development of the children who will be living here in San Francisco in the future. Please find some other way so that we can keep Sheridan live and alive in the future for the children coming up next. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Darcy. Yes, I'm Darcy Chan Blackburn. I am a first grade teacher at Sheridan. Historically, our school has had many families register their children to attend kinder um, during the first week of school. By limiting our site to, the first, to one kindergarten class based on the number of families registered by the first round is unacceptable. I'm speaking for the families in our school neighborhood that cannot attend this meeting. They are families who do not speak English as a first language. They have more than one job in order to put food on the table and pay bills. They do not have adequate access to technology or Wi-Fi, and most of them don't even know that they can register their child for school as early as February the year before their child is old enough to attend kindergarten. Sheridan provides a very loving, safe, and happy community for our students and their families. The 94112 zip code has the highest concentrations of students who attend SFUSD. Do not bar the, those community members access to our school. Do not let SFUSD cut us back to one kindergarten. The families in our neighborhood need us to be accessible to them. Thank you. Thank you. Carol, Carol S. Good evening, I'm Carol Savory and I'm an RTIF at Sheridan Elementary. Sheridan fully expected to lose a classroom teacher in the 22-23 school year due to declining enrollment, but we did not expect the central office mandate that we must close one of our two kindergarten classrooms. This mandate unnecessarily and forcibly shrinks the size of our school, not only next year, but permanently. With only one kindergarten classroom, we will only have enough students to fill one first grade classroom the next year, one second grade classroom the following year, and so on, until we only have one classroom at each grade level. Our administrators should be able to make school and classroom configuration decisions that are in the best interest of our students and their families. This mandate was made with no regard for the decision making at the school level or for the students and families we serve. We accept closing a classroom due to declining enrollment numbers, but we cannot accept an uninformed classroom configuration mandate that serves absolutely no one in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Karen. Karen O. Thank you. Hi, my name is Karen Osher and I'm the literacy coach at Sheridan Elementary. It is incredibly important that you reconsider your decision to eliminate a kindergarten classroom at Sheridan. 
the Sheridan community can only conclude by forcing us to close a kindergarten classroom next year, our district is saying they want to slowly but surely close the school. Closing a kindergarten will lead to closing a new classroom each year. Schools that have, excuse me, schools that have only one classroom per grade level are not thriving places for learning. Prospective families will see the Sheridan as a dying community, but you know this. There are no thriving schools that have such a small number of classrooms. Are we to assume that this is your intention? Likewise, using enrollment from data from round one to justify your decision is not in alignment with the ideals and vision of this district. Families who sign up during round one are rarely from marginalized communities, but you know this. We understand that consolidations have to happen in order to balance this budget, but please allow families in our community to have shared as an option. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Naomi. I don't know if this is Naomi Perlman, but it's only Naomi. Are you there? Naomi? Hello, Bonnie. Hi. Thank you. My name is Bonnie McLevick and I've been teaching kindergarten at Sheridan for seven years. Sheridan is a loving, thriving, family-focused community. Our students attend school with their siblings, cousins, and family friends. The pattern I see year after year is that many families who live in our neighborhood register their students far later than round one. At Sheridan, we are honored to accept each and every student to our school, no matter how late in the year they enroll. Due to the district-wide pandemic enrollment crisis, we only have 31 kindergarten students enrolled this year but I'm confused as to why Sheridan is being capped at only 22 students next year. Even during this year of low enrollment, we would have had to turn away nine families, forcing them to transportation out of the neighborhood and face the possibility of sending multiple elementary age siblings to separate schools. Thank you. Thank you. Alita. Hello, everyone. Tonight, I'm commenting on <clears throat> excuse me, on behalf of the OMI Community Collaborative. As we've heard from many here before, Sheridan is an amazing and thriving community. And it's in fact, the closest thing we have to a, um, to a community school in the district, in our district, in our neighborhood, in the Lakeview OMI. Um, we might not be on the official community schools list, but we have amazing partnerships with the CBOs and other partners of the OMI Community Collaborative, such as Youth First, the OMI Family Resource Center, uh, many of the faith-based organizations. And Sheridan is exactly the kind of school that we need in the middle of our neighborhood. And we're in the process of an enrollment system redesign. Why on earth in the most populous zip code of SFUSD students, when we're talking about just building our zones now, would we be kneecapping a school? Why would we be cutting it in half when we're still in the process of redesign? I, that logic befuddles me. Please keep Sheridan whole. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the handle says the Rossoff family. Hello, my name is Angela Rosoff. I have two children in the school district. I wanted to voice a concern about the priorities around how the budget is being allocated next year. Is it truly necessary to cut so many amazing teachers at the school site level? What about the administration? Have you considered the cuts that could be happening on the administrative level? There's a 15 page document of school administration at the central site, have you cut any of those jobs? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Carl. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead and hold on a second. Please, if you are a panelist, please mute. Carl, go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Carl Hoffman, and I am uh, 
department head, math department head, and school site council president at Lowell. And I'm speaking to strongly oppose the removal of AP funding from high schools. Uh, AP funding is one type of specialty funding. Other types are LEP, Title IX, Title I, and PEEF. These funds are distributed among schools in differing proportions based on the specific needs of the school student populations. Some schools get a large chunk of funding from one or more of these sources while getting smaller amounts from others. The weighted student formula was designed to be complemented by all of these sources of funding. Only with all of these pieces of the puzzle in place does the weighted student formula function properly. Simply removing one of these specialty funds, the AP funding, has a drastically lopsided effect on schools, barely affecting some schools' budgets while brutally reducing others. This is grossly inequitable on a scale which this school board should not tolerate if it really cares about equity. Thank you. Thank you. And President Lopez, that concludes the time allotted for public comment. Okay, thank you to the public for coming tonight. We'll be moving on to section D, advisory committee reports and appointments. Our first item is our parent advisory council. I'd like to call on the PAC representative, Michelle Jacques Menegas. Thank you, President Lopez. Good evening, commissioners, student delegates, superintendent, staff, students, families, and members of the public. My name is Michelle Jacques Menegas, and I am the coordinator for the Parent Advisory Council, or PAC, to the San Francisco Board of Education. The role of the PAC is to present parent perspectives in order to inform Board of Education policy discussions and decisions. This is our report for the February 8th, 2022 Board of Education meeting. I am joined in presenting the report this evening by PAC member and co-vice chair, M. Villaluna. M. If for some reason M is not available. Oh, oh you there? Okay, good. Yes, I'm just trying to set up, I'm sorry. No worries. Emma is coming from uh, having picked up their child at, from school. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. The PAC would like to take this opportunity to remind the board for our support for all parent advisory councils in our district, especially when those parent groups represent a portion of the SFUSD family student population that has been historically oppressed, but never provided the official space to advise the school board. Cissexism, heterosexism, and transphobia still plague our school district and our school board. In a city that prides itself as being queer and trans friendly, our school district needs to show up for queer trans parents, students, and families. Suicide, mental health problems, bullying, and violence still happen to queer trans students in our district. The QT PAC resolution will save countless lives by ensuring them the presence of queer and trans parents, the best advocates other than queer and trans students themselves to do this work. In 2019, this board passed the Our Healing in Our Hands resolution, sponsored by Commissioner Lamb, Collins, and Moliga. Creating a QT PAC will ensure that queer and trans parents have a council where our voice is heard and where we can help move the district forward in destroying cis sexism and heterosexism through a review of policies, state mandates regarding parent forms, restroom signage, and other issues which affect families and all students in their everyday life. In the queer city in the world, we can and must do better by our queer and trans parents and SFUSD. We encourage you to pass the QT PAC resolution today. The PAC would like to appreciate the efforts of district staff 
and labor partners on coming to an agreement on supporting the health and safety at school sites by committing to provide appropriate masks like N95s for all students and staff. We would like to acknowledge that there is, in theory, the capacity for all sites to conduct weekly testing. However, we want to clarify that there is still confusion and discrepancy at sites at across the district in regards to the availability of KN95 masks and of tests, as well as who is prioritized when there are not enough masks or tests for all who need them at a site. The message we are hearing from central office is not consistent with what families are hearing from principals. The PAC also wants to elevate the concerns of families of children with IEPs. The Community Advisory Committee for Special Education is hearing from families who are really worried about COVID right now. It is front and center for them in all of their questions about remote schooling, independent study, learning, et cetera. In addition, they're worried because there is not enough information about the effects of COVID on medically fragile students, with students with disability, developmental disabilities, et cetera. We encourage the district to utilize the funding available from the state to fund additional health and safety measures if and when they become available. All of this goes back to our report from last month, where we stated that everyone needs timely and accurate information in order to make the best informed decisions they can within their situation. This discrepancy between what is recommended and required and what is being provided and then available is difficult to navigate and put parents in a tough position. One that is even more challenging for our families who are not native English speakers. We need clarity. I'm gonna hand it back over now to Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Em. The PAC held our regular monthly meeting on Thursday, February 3rd. 2022, we were joined by Crystal Van and Olivia Zhang of Chinese for Affirmative Action, who shared an overview of the economic justice and immigration support services that their organization provides, as well as their work as part of a collaborative effort to support the rights of non-citizen SFUSD parents in registering to vote for school board elections as per Proposition N. They also provided detailed information on how SFUSD parents can register and vote in school board elections in San Francisco, which we found very useful and which uh, there's a link provided in the agenda to that meeting that's on our webpage. The PAC also received an update on the SFUSD Arts Equity Plan from Director Sam Bass and had the opportunity to ask questions and provide feedback. We greatly appreciate the plan's focus on ensuring equitable access to the arts and creativity curriculum for all SFUSD students through dedicated staffing at elementary, middle, and high schools and support for staff across sites through ongoing professional development and professional learning communities. We encourage the board to continue their support of the plan and, in, and the efforts to secure stable funding for dedicated arts educators at all elementary schools as a way to ensure stability and deepen community connection at sites. In addition to our regular business items, we also discussed ways to elevate SFUSD family voice and create greater equity among advisories in reporting out to the Board of Education. Consideration of these efforts are currently underway by the various advisories and within the advisory alignment group as a whole. Upcoming opportunities for families to engage in district and school site level issues include the following. Mission Graduates is hosting a Spanish language Facebook Live event at noon 
this Friday, February 11th, 2022, on budget issues. Anne Marie Gordon, Executive Director of SFUSD's Budget Services, will review key points from her previous budget related presentation with mission graduates in, from December 2021. And will provide updates and changes to site budget allocations and capacity setting at sites for the 22 23 school year. SFUSD's School Planning Summit will be Saturday morning, March 5th, 2022. The summit will be virtual again this year and principals will have the option of planning with their school site team on that day or at another time that week that works better for the families in their community. The summit focuses on the budget planning process involving school site councils. However, all families are welcome to attend the online plenary session and also to participate in their site's planning process. Attending a PAC meeting is also a good way to be involved and to get an idea of what we do. Our next meeting will be held from 6 to 8 p.m. on Thursday, March 3rd, 2022 via Zoom. PAC meetings are open to the public and all are welcome to attend. We encourage anyone who is interested to join us. Meetings are conducted in English. Translation and interpretation can be provided with sufficient advance notice, and we do provide closed captioning. Meeting information can be found at sfusd.edu slash PAC. Agendas, Zoom links, and information on how to dial in via phone are posted at least 72 hours in, uh, in advance of the meeting. If you are interested in attending a PAC meeting, would like to partner with the PAC, or have any questions or comments about this report or the PAC's work in general, please contact us at pac at sfusd.edu. This concludes our report, and we thank you for this opportunity and welcome your questions. We would also like to request that this report be linked in the agenda for this meeting on board docs. Thank you. Great, thank you. I, I do believe the report is already on board docs and I was using it to follow along. So thank you. I, I didn't see it in the, the column on the left, but I see it in the, on the item. Thank you. Before we begin our discussion, I'd like to open it up to public comment. Thank you, President Lopez. Please raise your hand if you care to speak uh, to the PAC report. And can that be repeated in Spanish and Chinese? Buenas tardes. Por favor, levante su mano si desea añadir un comentario público con relación a PAC. Gracias. Y con relación a PAC, poco PAC, para que se vaya muy poco rápido y que quede más tenido que eso. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, President Lopez, uh, the amount of time for this. Thank you. All right. We'll have one minute. Hello, Lita. Wow, I get the honor of going first. Thank you very much. Um, on behalf of the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education, we would very much like to thank the PAC for elevating the concerns that families of students with IEPs have right now. Um, <laughs> yes, things are moving so quickly. Um, but having said that, the legal, state, and federal obligations of the district have not changed, even in these very uncertain times. So we are always grateful to the PAC for partnership, for elevating our voices, for being strong allies with us, and we look forward to our continued partnership this year and beyond. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Hello, Gregory. Sorry, I did not mean to have my hand up at this point. No problem. Hello, Ms. Marshall. Ms. Marshall. Ms. Marshall, are you there? I'll come back to you. Hello, Sam. Hi, my name is Sam. I'm a member of the CAC SPED CAC. I would, uh, uh, sorry, uh, SPED Community Advisory Committee. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, 
I wanted to thank the members of the PAC for this great presentation. I really appreciate all of your work. And I know as a, a CAC member, it's all volunteer. It's really hard to get organized and, and um, get everything together. And I really wanna express my support for the QT PAC. And I believe that they should have support from our school district and every level that they can. I was looking forward to working with them because we have a lot of crossover and I feel it is a, a student and parent population that deserves a, a place at the table. I really don't quite understand what happened, but it just did not seem very straightforward and clear. Um, our ethics are to have inclusion and inequality and and this pack is an important voice thank you thank you hello marissa i'm sorry go ahead marissa can you hear me yes <laughs> um I'm representing the parents and teachers of Buena Vista Horace Van, and um, we'd like to speak in support of the QT PAC in addition, um, in addition to the what was presented by the PAC. Um, we ask that the board fully funds the QT Parent Advisory Council so that it can be uh, the most effective in its support of and advocacy for 2S LGBTQIA plus families. We've heard from members of other PACs how essential it is to have a paid staff person dedicated to coordinating their efforts. By approving the funds for a staff person, you will ensure that the leadership, creativity, and connections of the community brought together by a newly approved QT PAC will produce tangible benefits for the district. Like other parent advisory councils, a QT PAC is a core part of efforts to support SFUSD in developing affirming practices that support 2S LGBTQIA plus parents and their families and ensure that their rights are protected. These are our families. We are and always have been a part of this district. Please, please fully fund the QT PAC. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Josephine. Hi, I just wanted to um, praise PAC for you know, running an inclusive body. It's a model for any PAC or any committee for doing that. Um, even though members may have different voices and opinion and can't agree, not necessarily agree on everything, but they all are able to speak their pieces in, in PAC. Um, I also support um, the QT PAC. Um, I wish that every group in our SFUSD would have a place. Um, unfortunately, right now, the school district is under financial crisis and under state takeover, the risk of under state takeover. I wish there's a way to recognize the body um, yet delay the funding. Uh, CPAC has been operating, as far as I know, has been operating for nearly a year. Uh, they haven't gotten any funding. They ran it on passion and it's doing great work. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Sammy. Hello. Um, thank you for PAC's uh, report. And I'm also appreciate the uh, focus on the instructional uh, support for teachers. And I also hope that the district could be also supporting online learning by providing some uh, teachers that who are available uh, to do that. Because um, some I know some of the teachers they uh, just worry about the COVID, and then they have to take care of the family members at home. So maybe they can do uh, some instructional support for the online learning program such as OLP and ODLP, especially for ODLP program, many students do not have support. They, stu they study at home and only have 30 to 40 minutes uh, um, question supporting for the homework. They do not have um, actual um, lecture time. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, Hova. Hi, my name is Hava, and I'm also a CAC member. Um, 
I wanted to say two things. The first is I also support the QT PAC. And regarding the finances, it is my hope that there is some resolution. Um, many other advisory groups rely on a variety of different ways to survive, some through grants, some through district. Um, I'd like to call on the community to make this happen. It's that important. Um, I don't know how, where the solution is for finances, but it, this advisory committee needs to happen. So that's the first. And the second, I, I deeply appreciate the PAC talking about students with IEPs, um, especially in regards to immune compromised students. I am immune compromised. Um, when talking about masks, please keep those students in mind. However, I also wanna uplift learning loss, whether they are home or in school. Um, I've been asking for this to be on the agenda on the BAE for since August. Please, please do not forget these students that are behind. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Hello, Ms. Marshall. Ms. Marshall. Okay. <clears throat> I believe that concludes the public comment on this item. Okay, thank you for checking that. Uh, sorry, I raised my hand, I was in call. Can I speak for a minute? Sorry, yeah. what's your name? What's your name? Selena. Yes, go ahead. Selena. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Uh, hi, this is Selena, and I want to um, send kudos to my uh, PAC members and also Michelle for um, actually always working so hard for um, all the uh, school students, teachers, everyone in the community. So I really want to praise them for all the hard work. And unfortunately, I missed the last meeting, but um, there were um, um, there were so many um, uh, praises I hear from my community regarding the non-citizen voting. So I really um, want to say thank you all for actually um, providing that opportunity for all voices to be heard in this city. And um, they really feel um, this is how inclusion is um, and works in this uh, diverse city. Um, some of the parents are, um, also asking um, if could be, they were asking me for the board document, if they're, um, they can be available in their language. So I did search up today. I didn't see that um, the board document for the agendas are, um, I don't think they're translated into threshold languages uh, recognized by the San Francisco. So I just wanna um, Thank you. maybe bring that. Thank you. Hello, Jordan. Hi, good. Can you hear me now? Yes. I'm good at good evening. My name is Jordan Davis. My pronouns are she and her and I just wanted to I guess it's time to say this like uh, I just wanted to throw my support behind the QT pack. I'm and I'm just sick in that some people just don't want this to happen and they're like uh, complaining about how are we going to pay for it? Well, this is a good idea. It helps to keep the board like focused on the uh, important issues. That's why we have PACs to focus on each like little issue. And I mean, if this is not uh, passed tonight, I'm going to be really upset and I will hold people accountable. I'm not like a member of the SFUSD community, but this will have reverberations across the LGBT community, uh, whatever you do tonight. So thank you, I yield my time. Thank you. Hello, Brandy. Hello, my name is Brandy. I'm a public school parent, also speaking in support of the QT PAC. Um, as the previous caller said, um, it's really important for the board to um, be to pass this tonight. So many people are watching our school board and I just want folks to think about what kind of message that sends to our youth. 
if we don't pass this? Our youth are listening. I know also when our youth uh, spoke at City Hall and talked about bullying, they specifically talked about how queer students are targeted. So I just want people to approach this with empathy. And I also, because so many people are looking at the San Francisco School Board, if that doesn't pass tonight, think what kind of message that sends to other students at other schools throughout the US. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe that concludes public comment. Okay, thank you for checking. Um, and I just wanna recognize there is some confusion because we will be discussing the QT PAC resolution later on on the agenda. So I appreciate folks from the public who have made comment and will break down the opportunity to comment during that time since we have heard from multiple voices. I'd like to now open it up to questions or comments from our student delegates or commissioners regarding the PACS report. And I am also keeping an eye on participants who are zooming in. Okay. I I believe we're saving our conversation probably for the item later on on the agenda. Great. Thank you all very much. I didn't, I didn't see your hand. Oh, sorry. There is a comment. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm always appreciative of the PAC and your reporting. And um, we'll save our comments for the QT PAC, but appreciate your support. Um, I wanted to talk about just I just wanted to highlight that um, one of the comments said that there's a difference between things being recommended and required and also between things being provided and available. And I just wanted to validate that I'm very excited that our district is expanding testing and vaccines throughout the district and that we have now made pickups of um, the take home color tests daily uh, pickups at our sites. And so I really appreciate that. That is not something that was available last fall, was that um, they were weekly pickups. But I also want to recognize that I am consistently hearing from community members that despite the fact that um, the superintendent has said that weekly testing has been available to families all year, that that is still not something that I'm hearing from families at all um, school sites. And so I think there may be um, a question of communication. I heard from, and specifically, I just wanna highlight this idea that um, non-native English speakers especially need clarity. And I, I do wanna acknowledge as well, as things change, communication changes, and it's, it's hard to get that communication out there. So I just wanted to hear from the PAC, just, you know, the comments that you made around testing availability, I'm hearing from some people it's easy at other places they're saying that they're getting told or they had been getting told that they needed to be symptomatic in order to take, get the take home tests. And so I just was hoping that you could clarify that a little bit so that staff can hear it because I'm hearing it and I just I'm trying to connect the dots and also, you know, help us to improve our communication. Yeah, I can respond to that, Commissioner Collins, and I appreciate your looping back on that issue um, because we are hearing very different things from families. Um, families are being told by principals that there's not enough tests to go around um, or that students are not prioritized, that staff are prioritized. And um, so whether it's sort of that reality of on the ground versus the ideal of what we're trying to offer or whether it is this sort of a breakdown in communication um, and it's just not getting, the, the, the current word isn't getting out to everyone. Um, the reality is that, yeah, not all of our families are feeling like they actually do have the kind of access that's being promised. Thank you. I was wondering if Superintendent, if you had any thoughts on that? Yeah, Ms. Jeff. Menegas, I will check in with you after the meeting so I could get specifics uh, because we're 
really clear about the availability of the test. So I'll check in with you afterward to get specifics on which schools you're hearing this from. Great, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, and I'd also, I, I am seeing communications that did go out from the district. Has the district ever communicated to sites that they should withhold tests in order to preserve them for, because there's a lack of test kits? Because no. that's what I've, I've heard from some staff members. No, we have not. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for clarifying, and I can support with connecting afterward uh, to get more clarity. I also, I, I just wanted to appreciate being able to attend your monthly PAC meeting and a reminder to my colleagues, I know we're trying to make an effort to meet with more of our advisory committees during your time and your space um, to be able to connect around the issues you are uplifting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're still under section D. I'd like to see if there are any advisory committee appointments from commissioners. Okay, seeing none. As, sure. Are we, is there any, are there any um, spaces that are open? That currently there are seats for the charter committee and unless staff has other information. Just charter oversight right now. Yeah. And if parents are interested in applying for that position or community members, who should they contact? Chris Armand Trout. Thank you. Great, thank you for uplifting that. So as I mentioned earlier, we will be moving up section J, proposals for immediate action and suspension of the rules, which is the independent study board policy in order to accommodate students who would like to comment. So section J item one, I need a motion and a second to suspend the rules and public comment. So moved. Second. Thank you. And item two, board policy 6102.6 independent study. I'd like to call on Superintendent Matthews to introduce the designee to read the recommendation. Uh, reading this recommendation is to the record will be our general counsel, Danielle Hawk. Ms. Hawk, are you there? I am. I apologize, Superintendent. I wasn't aware if this was mine, but I'm happy no, I'm to do it. pointing to me. It's me. Oh. Is that you, Deputy Superintendent for Martel? Yes. I don't know if you're going to officially introduce me. Apologies. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> so, yes, we are asking um, that the Board of Education approve amendment to Board Policy 6102.6 Independent City. We're requesting that the Board vote to suspend the rules. Um, the proposed amendment to this policy adds an additional eligibility criteria for short-term independent study. Under this proposed amendment, short-term independent study would be available to students who wish to engage in short-term preventative quarantine from school based on concerns that in-person instruction will put their health at risk due to current surge in COVID cases as determined by the parent the Deputy Superintendent, Deputy Superintendent, apologies. Okay, yeah. Would you mind slowing down? Sorry. Thank you. So again, we're asking that the board approve amendment to board policy 6102.6 for independent study. We're requesting that the board vote to suspend the rules. The proposed amendment to this policy adds an additional eligibility criteria for short-term independent study. And under this proposed amendment, short-term independent study would also be available to students who wish to engage in short-term preventative quarantine from school based on concerns that in-person instruction will put their health at risk due to the current surge in COVID cases as determined by the parent or guardian. Okay, thank you. So for clarity, we moved and suspended the rules. Now I need a motion for board policy 6102.6 independent study. And a second. So moved. Second. I think we need to vote on the suspension of the rules. We, we've just moved and seconded it. Yes, you're yes. right. 
Um, student Delegate Lamb? Yes. Student Delegate Liang? Yes. Commissioner Alexander? Yes. Commissioner Bogus? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Commissioner Vice President Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Maliga? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. And President Lopez? Yes. Seven eyes. Great, thank you. So we moved and seconded the board policy. Thank you, Commissioners Collins and Lamb. Let's open it up to public comment before we begin our discussion. Thank you. Please raise your hand if you care to speak to the board policy and independent study. Uh, could that be repeated in Spanish and Chinese, please? Buenas noches. Por favor, levante su mano si desea añadir un comentario público con respecto a los estudios independientes. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Alita. Hi again, everyone. Um, thank you so much for um, this update to the independent study resolution. Um, uh, it's we have, as we talked about in the PAC report, a lot of families that are really working hard to keep up to date with information and um, it's so many children with IEPs are immunocompromised and really need access to both online and in-person program, depending on where we are um, in this saga of COVID. Um, I just want to remind everyone that, as I said before, neither state nor federal laws as they relate to uh, students with disabilities have been waived. Um, they haven't been stopped. So any programs that we put in place as a district, we are still bound by the IDEA to provide supports and services to our children in whatever the current least restrictive environment is. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, Rory. Hi, um, again, I think there's no consideration here for teacher training, support, professional development. I have no idea how to do independent study. I asked on Facebook, many people don't know how to do independent study. So just to note, again, every time you're putting forth these resolutions, you have to consider staff support so that we can do this with fidelity and to the best of our ability. Thank you. Thank you. President Lopez, that concludes public comment. Great, thank you. Let's open it up for discussion. Any comments from our student delegates or commissioners on this item? Student Delegate Lamb. Thank you. Um, I think Agnes and I both agree that we are super happy to see this coming forward because this was in our letter um, to the superintendent uh, around the Omicron surge. And so this was one of the, the bigger items on there that we really wanted because students uh, during the Omicron surge were staying home, were taking preventative measures and may still continue to do so in the following weeks, months, um, depending on you know the state of COVID in our city. Um, and so this is a huge win for the SAC, um, but we do also wanna urge that yes, as we open this up, to more students, we also want to make sure that teachers have adequate preparation for the incoming um, amount of students that are signing up. Is there any comment or response to our student delegates before I hear from other commissioners? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, in addition to this amendment, we are working with our curriculum and curriculum and instruction team to create um, activities and lessons that are both grade level appropriate and specific to secondary content that teachers can use if they would like to create um, independent study assignments um, using those. But they also still continue to have the flexibility to design lessons and activities on their own because some teachers, of course, want to keep up with the scope and sequence of their class. Mm -hmm. um, additionally, we are having conversations around how we might be able to support with a central independent study option where there might be um, opportunities for students to engage asynchronously in a webinar format. But again, that would not be um, aligned to whatever the students are working on in their specific classroom, but that would be another option that we're offering for students and teachers as well. 
Just a follow-up question. Is there any guidance in terms of um, assisting teachers with the technology that comes around um, supplementing their current classroom curriculum? For example, um, some teachers on their own volition are posting things on Google Classroom or, for example, sending out emails to students that have missed class. Are there any like district or central supports that help with formulating those plans and formulating those, I guess, timelines? So if I understand your question correctly, the activities and the lessons that we've created are also using those same formats, Google Classroom, Seesaw, et cetera. So it's nothing new for the students or the teachers to learn to, to access. We're using that same platform that they're using to, to get information out to students. Is that the question? Yes, but I guess for teachers that maybe don't use Google Classroom as often or, for example, are not used to sending out like emails to the students that are absent, um, is there any additional support in helping them either learn the tech but also like um, prep lesson plans around? Yes, our DOT team has a help desk that they that we just have year round, but that definitely we ramped up during school closures. Um, and then we also have uh, videos and things like that for teachers who are trying to learn new software. Um, a lot of folks continue to use what was used during school closure, but all of those resources that we had during the closure, we still have now. And that help desk is around the clock. Well, not around the clock, but it's always available. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to tag along on the questions that you were asking and just see if maybe we could get a follow-up in the curriculum committee on what, the ways that we're supporting Edu like the consistency, you know, the things that you're talking about, it'd be great if we just, I'm, I'm just asking if um, that would, whoever's the chair now of that committee. Oh, good. Um, great. So if we could do a follow up, then that'd be a time we could dig in and get more information. Thank you. And uh, our chief of technology, Melissa Dodd, just pings my arm to remind me to also say we also have office hours. The DOT has office hours where teachers can come and get really direct support with those softwares as well. Okay. I Next is Commissioner Sanchez and then Commissioner Bogus. Um, I think the student delegate Lamb covered my questions. I had a question. Just if as, as we as we pass this policy, how how many more people would be able to access these resources this semester? And is there any so like would students who didn't qualify before who now qualify be able to access? Um, this independent study option kind of in real time as we're passing this? Or is this something that people shouldn't expect to see access to this semester? So once this is passed and approved by the board, it's just an additional criteria that uh, allows students to be eligible. So students can access this short-term independent option as soon as possible. And is there any limit on the number of students that can participate in it or restrictions that go beyond students that would prevent them from being able to participate? No, just I want to be mindful that um, folks understand that this is short term independent study. And so it's only for, uh, you know, as long as 15 days. And so that you would need to reapply if you need to have the, um, that option beyond the 15 days. So that's the one kind of stipulation. It's not for the entire year semester. No, I just wanted to make sure. I think the clarity that as if this is voted and passed tonight, that families would be able to kind of access it as they need starting now, um, and they shouldn't have any issues with that is just real good clarity to, to see how the policy translate to our everyday experience in the classrooms. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments before we vote on the motion? Oh, Commissioner, Vice President Lamb. Just for clarification, so um, if the proposal uh, policy gets passed tonight, um, Deputy Superintendent Board Morthal, what are um, how do students or families be able to access next steps? So uh, families or students should reach out to their classroom teachers, let them know they're requesting independent study, short-term independent study. Thank you. Okay, we'll do one quick scan online. Seeing no other comments, let's do a roll call vote on the motion. Student Delegate Lamb? Yes. Student Delegate Liang? Yes. Commissioner Alexander? Yes. Commissioner Bogus? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Com Vice President Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Maliga? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. And President Lopez? Yes. Seven eyes. Great. 
Moving back to the top of our agenda, section E, consent calendar. Board members may remove or sever items prior to the vote. I need a motion and a second on the consent calendar. So moved. Second. second. Thank you. Let's hear from public comments before we begin. Thank you, President Lopez. Please raise your hand if you care to speak to any items on the consent calendar. Can that be repeated in Spanish and Chinese, please? Buenas noches. Por favor, levante su mano si desea hacer un comentario público con relación al calendario público. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Josephine. Um, I don't know if I, I'm at the right item, but I just wanted to praise uh, uh, Deputy Su Superintendent Fort Martha for suspending the regular study and uh, making independent online study available ASAP. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, Catherine. Yes, I'm not sure if this is the right time to be speaking on the last issue we were just talking about with the help desk and teachers. Is that? It, it is not. This is the consent calendar. Okay. Thank you. Hello, Patrick. Hi, thank you very much. Patrick Wolf, Executive Director of Families for San Francisco and also a public school parent. I would like to add my voice um, to the issue around AP prep test. Um, I'm sir, I'm sorry to, or excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, this is only for comments on the consent calendar. I'm sorry, is this not um, part of the consent calendar? It is not. Okay, my apologies. Clearly, they need to come and sit in Sophia's classroom and relearn their alphabet. I'm not sure who that was, but please don't make comments uh, uh, when it's not your turn, and please mute yourself. That concludes public comment. Thank you. Yes, often we move things around to accommodate students or families who'd like to speak on them. So as mentioned, we are on section E, consent calendar. And now I'll see if there are any items withdrawn or corrected by the superintendent. None. Any items removed for first reading by the board? Seeing none, any items severed by the board or superintendent for discussion or vote tonight? Seeing none. Roll call vote on consent calendar. Student Delegate Lamb? Yes. Student Delegate Liang? Yes. Commissioner Alexander? Yes. Commissioner Bogus? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Vice President Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Maliga? Yes. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. And President Lopez? Yes. Seven eyes. Thank you. Section F, discussion and vote on consent calendar items severed for separate consideration. There are none tonight. Section G, proposals for action. Item one, resolution number 2111-9A1 in support of equitable representation and services for two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, asexual parents and families and creation of a queer and transgender parent advisory council. I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Thank you. And I'd like to call on the resolution's author, Commissioner Collins, to give a brief summary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, having trouble with microphones. Um, I just wanted to say um, how appreciative I am of community members who worked on this resolution with me. This has been a long time coming. Um, as a parent in the district, in mostly um, in schools where 
um, black students were underrepresented. I know how powerful it is to be a member of an affinity group and have the support and the, and the partnership of other families across the district in advocating for visibility uh, for my children and for all children. And I know that um, for queer, trans, two-spirit, lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, non-binary youth and families, um, there has been, um, there are a lot of families in the district and yet there are no ways that um, they are really visible in our district. And I have witnessed parents and children having to advocate individually um, for their schools to be more welcoming and more, um, more, more inclusive. Um, and that shouldn't fall on the sh shoulders of an individual child or individual parent. And so in partnership with our family coalition and with queer and trans and non-binary families across the district, um, I was able to um, author a resolution to support a parent advisory committee in um, helping to be a mechanism for accountability and visibility in our district. And I think that this is especially important for children who are in the 2S LGBTQIA community because while we can identify students that are black or Simone Pacific Islander, um, or even students that have special education needs, um, we don't collect data on students in the 2S LGBTQIA community and um, families may or may not always identify. And yet it really is important for their voice to be heard. And we see that because in some cases we aren't following state guidelines. And it's in those, those brave parents that speak up and say, hey, we could be doing things better. That's when our system improves. And so this resolution basically introduces an official 2S LGBTQIA parent advisory committee to serve as a voice for students and families in our district that we know exist and yet may or may not be counted. Um, and additionally, it, caught, it, it puts forward um, requests that I've heard from families um, for a long time in terms of making sure that our schools are more inclusive and, follow, and following state guidelines. So um, as a district, we are required not to discriminate against students and yet inadvertently, because we don't have maybe specific guidelines around how to include um, pronouns or um, non-heterosexist um, um, parental structures. Um, additionally, where we don't have signage, those are things that we should be doing. Um, and according to state law, there are things we should be doing to make sure our schools um, are non-discriminatory. Non and so those are also called out as well. Um, and then I guess I just wanna say that um, there was a discussion in the last um, budget meeting that related to um, concerns around budget items um, for paying for someone to serve as a liaison for the, the 2S LGBTQIA PAC. And um, based on a recommendation from staff and uh, also from Commissioner um, Alexander, we have added language to the resolution <laughs> to um, include it in, include concerns around funding that position in a larger conversation around um, balancing our budget. So if you've seen this before, then that is the one change that we've made. Thank you. And Commissioner Alexander, who is the chair of the Budget Committee, will be reporting out on this, but I'd like to give the opportunity to add any more information now if you'd like. Yeah, thank you. I think we we had a lively and um, I hope productive discussion at the budget committee on this topic on how to uh, implement this resolution. And I think it's really, really an important one. I think uh, there's broad agreement that it's really important. 
um, and how to make sure to do that in light of questions around the budget and the deficit. Um, and I think we had a proposal, and I actually was not sure if that was included in the amended resolution that was posted or not, because it actually, when I look on board docs, it looks like both docs are the same, but maybe I'm missing something. So maybe staff could clarify that point. And if, was there a, Oh, thanks. Yes, Justin. yes, Commissioner Alexander, that was uh, that was an inadvertent technology mistake. So the you see, we we tried to attach an amended resolution, but it, it didn't take on the on the Google Docs. So it was a mistake. I I'm, the general counsel can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe I'm going to read the amended language in the meeting this evening, and um, the general counsel can um, clarify that for us. But yes, we which would include the language that was proposed at the budget committee. Correct. Oh, okay, great. I wonder if we could maybe do that if it's okay with the President Lopez before public comment, just so folks understand the, the options that are that are on the table for the board. That's correct, so are, have you- Yeah, that's shared? basically all the contact. I, th I think I, I w was supportive of the amended language, um, and so um, I think that might be a, a, an effective way to move forward. Should I do that now? Yes, please, Justin. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, Danielle. I'm, yes. Sorry, let me try that again. Yes, okay. please. Okay. If you Thank could you. read it <laughs> now before public comment, that would be helpful. Okay, you're breaking up a little, but I did hear you say that. I should go ahead and read it now. Thank you. So th this is being added um, to the last uh, final, be it resolved, um, statement. So I'll read the entire thing and then add the amended language. So finally, be it resolved that the board directs the superintendent to work with staff to identify the resources required to develop an impl implementation plan that includes a budget analysis to identify a minimum level of staffing and funding to accomplish the goals set forth in this resolution as well is an audit to the current levels of funding programming for SLGBTQIA plus students that includes genders and sexualities, alliances, GSAs, psychoeducational supports such as Q Group and district wide student voice and leadership such as the Queer Trans Advisory Council, QTAC. The amended language is and that the costs associated with this resolution be included in the district's budget balancing plan and or annual budget with offsetting revenues or expenditure reductions. Great, thank you for including that for the public before they gave comment and before we discussed and voted. Let's open it up to public comment on this item. We'll do one minute each and I am reminding folks who have already commented on this previously to leave space for other voices. Yes, please raise your hand if you care to speak to the, the Kitipak resolution. Um, could that be repeated in Spanish and Chinese, please? Buenas noches, por favor, levante su mano si desean un comentario público con relación a esta resolución. Gracias. Yo le siento digo Kitipak, que y fue un papel y ni que va a tener que hacerlo. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Marshall. Ms. Marshall, are you there? We'll come back. Julie. Hi, um, my name is Julie and I'm speaking in support of the QT PAC. Um, this is long overdue in a city like San Francisco um, where we have um, so much, um, so many opportunities for queer families, but also still so many inequities for queer families in our schools. Um, I wanted to speak to the idea that um, it's not appropriate for queer families to have their own PAC. Disability justice organizers often talk about how <clears throat> they don't get to be raised by parents that share their identity and they don't get to raise their own community's youth. Similarly, while some queer youth have um, or are raised in queer and or supportive families, many parents don't understand or are hostile to queer youth and it's fully appropriate to have a pack made up just of queer, queer folks. 
I also wanted to say I was disappointed to see in the budget committee um, board members make uh, re multiple requests to staff that seem to be deferring their responsibilities and asking um, for staff to make recommendations that would allow them to vote no, including members of LGBTQAI communities. Thank you. Assume Hello, Mimi. Can you spotlight me? Mimi? Can you hear me? Yes, you can go ahead. All right, great. Hi, my name is Mimi I'm an executive director at Our Family Coalition. Um, we're an organization dedicated to advocating and uh, supporting LGBTQ families and their children. Over 10 years ago, um, our own parent advisory uh, committee were talking about the importance of having a QT pack at SFPSD. And what um, it's, everyone has said it's long overdue. Um, it's something that's needed. I also wanted to speak to how it would, it really actually saves the school district's money by having a panel of experts that can cut. I'm sorry, we're losing your connection a little it bit. It is a no-brainer. Um, I'm here to support and hope uh, that you actually push and vote for the establishment of the QT pack. And that's our comment and we support both Mari and anyone and everyone else is here for this pack. Thank you. Hello, Carrie. Hello, my name is Carrie. I'm an SFUSD educator as well as the parent of a gender curious first grade SFUSD student here in the background who prefers to use the all gender bathroom at school. I'm calling to speak in support of the QT PAC generally and specifically in support of the QT PAC having paid staff support. There is so much work that needs to be done, not only just to bring us up to legal compliance with um, supports for um, all of our students in school, but um, to go beyond what's legally required and make SFUSD a true Truly inclusive community. Thank you so much for supporting this resolution. Thank you. Hello, Sienna. Hi, good evening. Hi, my name is Sienna Dunn, a parent within the District APAC, speaking on behalf of the leadership team. We want to appreciate the parent leaders tonight who helped to write and champion this resolution. Every student, family, and educator in SFUSD deserves to feel a sense of belonging in this district. For APAC, we have consistently asked for a seat at the table. Each year since our, since our inception, we have gotten closer to feeling like we have one, or at minimum, our voices matter. Queer and our trans parents deserve, to, deserve that too. For that reason, we support much of the language in the resolution. We also understand the seriousness of the budget cuts, cuts that our kids are about to take the hardest hit from. We want to support the development of a QT pack and suggest that if budget is the only holdup, instead of an all or nothing approach, the board should explore what can be done within the current infrastructure and maximize it while continuously advocating and demanding for what is justly deserved, safe spaces physically, publicly, and within affinity. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Celestina. Hi, this is Celestina. My pronouns are she, her, meow. I am a parent to a seventh grader who is non-binary and also um, a, a queer mama and Basically, I really appreciate hearing the parents' perspective, um, and I support my seventh grader with my full heart, and I can't even begin to tell you what it means to me to um, see my child be supported in school, and I also just want to say how far we have come from when I was in school that I would have never considered going to an adult to talk about all of the bullying that I was subjected to, and whether or not you believe, um, if you believe in LGBTQ rights, or you believe that it is worth it to have um, an LGBT um, parent advisory committee, I would really urge you to think that we all, to think about the fact that we all as human beings deserve to be loved and respected, and please consider this a priority regardless of the funding. Thank you. Thank you. M, would you like to go ahead, M? Yes. 
Hi, um, I am M. Um, my pronouns are they, them. I cannot express how historic this resolution would mean for a community in the school district who many times does not seem visible, but we know that we are visible. We know when we see each other and we talk with each other and we have community with each other. I'm asking you, urging you today to pass this QT pack because justice delayed is justice denied. And we deserve justice as trans queer parents in this district. We see the issues that are going on with our students and in our families. I think it is irrehensible how still our school district is not in compliance with bathroom signage, with restroom signage and with forms. I am tired of doing one more public comment, begging for non-binary to be put on a form so a parent or a student can feel heard. Please pass this now. Thank you. Hello, Alita. Hi, everyone, yet again. Um, on behalf of the Community Advisory Committee for Special Education, we strongly encourage the, vote, the board to vote and approve the QT pack tonight. Um, I do want to caution everyone, though, in, in the budget analysis that's going to be coming with this bill. Um, please don't tie the cost of things like forms or signage to this pack. Um, we don't charge the CAC for all of our inclusive practices. We don't charge the DLAC for all of our interpretation and translation in the district. Um, and it's not fair to do that to the QT pack either. As, um, as an active participant in an advisory committee, I can't tell you how important having safe spaces for families, having an affinity space where you can just be open and honest about your shared experience in our schools. It's so transformative. Um, and really what all of our our um, QT families deserve as well. So thank you for considering this and please, please pass it. Thank you. Hello, Ms. Marshall. Okay, President Lopez, that concludes the public comment on this item. Okay, thank you for that. I'd like to hear from our student delegates or commissioners if you have any questions or comments on this item. Commissioner Bogus. I had questions. Um, I, I guess I'm curious in regards to the implementation timeline. I do see the, I saw the documents from the budget committee with kind of the budget outline with the one time expense versus ongoing. And I guess I'd just like more clarity on that. And if we could break down those expenses in fiscal years, just so that we can kind of be aware of kind of, I guess the dynamics of if those would be in this fiscal year, if those would be for next school year and just kind of how um, we're looking at that as a district uh, as we move forward with this. Is there staff who can respond? Um, good evening, commissioners. I'm Megan Wallace, Chief Financial Officer for the School District, and I prepared the fiscal impact analysis that was presented at the February 2nd Budget and Business Services Committee meeting. Um, so I believe I'm, I'm probably the best one to start off with regard to discussing the fiscal impacts. Um, however, I may need to ask for support uh, from my colleagues who um, may oversee the individual expenses. Um, but Commissioner Bogus, your question was with regard to the timing of the various expenses and what fiscal years they would hit. Um, I would say that uh, they are annual costs. Um, so since we're underway with this current uh, fiscal year, um, and also um, just you know, just to make it simpler, I would say um, if they were to start next fiscal year, as an example. Um, although I will say the, the timing of the, the initiation of the re of the expenses really depends on the action of the board. Um, but if the expenses were to occur next fiscal year, I would anticipate that in that first year, the district would um, expend four hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars. That would be for the full cost of the um, the liaison position. Um, 
and uh, that's including salaries and benefits, um, as well as um, there's um, ninety thousand dollars for a project manager ha uh, half time or half an FTE. Uh, we looked at fifty thousand dollars of costs with aligning the forms um, and other documentations with uh, state law. Um, and then finally, $160,000 for the signage. Um, and of that 480,000, I would anticipate that um, 260,000 is really just one time in that first year, um, whereas 220,000 would be ongoing. You would see it in the second and third years, so forth. Um, however, costs would escalate over time uh, to account for um, the the growing uh, cost of personnel and non-personnel expenses. Does that, and you might not be the best person to answer this, but I, I guess my question is, so with the budgeting being kind of set up for next fiscal year, that would mean that all these things would be established and in place over the, the course of that school year or at the start of that school year or some mix of that? Um, yes, I believe so. One example would be that if we were to create a position, um, it would take some time to hire and um, that position to you know, post um, and fill. Sometimes if you know that a position will be included in the budget, you can start that recruitment process. So it could start at the very beginning of the year, but typically you would see some sort of delay. Um, and then uh, with something like if we needed um, any additional support, um, or uh, you know, looking at the signage, it might take some time uh, to identify exactly who would create the signage um, and get it uh, put up. So yeah, there's definitely um, there are elements of um, you know delays that could reduce the cost in that first year. Um, but I would anticipate that by that things would even out over the course of um, the first couple of years. Right, we can, we'll, we'll hear this after Commissioner Moliga makes a comment or question. Commissioner Moliga, did you have a question or comment? Oh, uh, thank you, President Lopez. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the conversation I wanna bring to the board is really the one that we had last week, you know, around budget, you know, and. Um, Again, for me, really, uh, my sole focus tonight is, um, you know, uh, sorry, I'm on this virtual thing, it just keeps messing around. Uh, the, the couple of things I want to address tonight, you know, for our board is really having this conversation around, you know, uh, in our budget, right? And so obviously, you know, um, I definitely support, you know, the work of, you know, our LGBT community. Um, you know, I've been supporting it, you know, since I've been on the board from our Queer Trans Advisory Council to, you know, to our Q groups, you know, the work I did around the Medi-Cal resolution, you know, goes directly into funding some of this stuff. But for me, you know, the, uh, the question at hand is, you know, how do we move forward? And this is why I asked for the resolution to go back to the leadership to, so that we could look at this as a whole with the other resolutions that are coming, right? Like we have like, uh, yeah, I think we, we uh, sent out, you know, pink slips, you know, we have, uh, you know, individuals showing up to our meetings, you know, you know, sharing about, you know, funding is at their schools. And for me, it's like, how do we have a fair process, you know, across the board, you know, in regards to the things that we want to, you know, uh, move forward on in the school district, right? And so that's, that's, that's what really I'm trying to get clear, you know, uh, tonight, right? And so I, I really would, again, ask for this, uh, resolution to go back, you know, so we have a further discussion with, you know, our board in regards to how do we want to move forward into funding resolutions, because resolutions, you know, such as this one, you know, and others, which are, you know, um, very, um, you know, important, you know, but we, we, we are facing a budget deficit and, uh, you know, we on a verge of being taken over by the state. Um, and so, you know, um, so how, how do we have these conversations, right? These real conversations around, you know, how do we want to, uh, you know, move forward in terms of, you know, ident identifying areas we want to pour into in terms of revenue fund, you know, honest conversation, right? And so to me, that's still not clear, 
you know, and I'm not really too sure how we're going to land on that. You know, what are we going to do with the next resolution and the resolution that comes after that, right? And so um, I'm not 100% sure yet how I want to pursue, you know, with uh, my vote tonight, but I do want to get some clarity around that. Um, so I don't know um, where that lies, you know, within our school board. And, you know, I don't know how we're going to, you know, have that honest and open, transparent conversation, right? Um, but, but I would like to know. So, um, but saying all that, you know, I, um, I am curious, you know, with the, uh, with the budget, you know, folks, uh, Chief Wallace, and Deputy Lee, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, the funding, you know, kind of touched on it a little bit, you know, um, are we going to have to cut from other areas? You know, when we talk about we're going to go and look for other fundings, like, what does that mean? Are we looking for grant funding? Are we looking for a new additional, you know, revenues coming from outside sources? Do we have to cut from other areas, right? Like, uh, what, what does that translate to in terms of, like, process? Um, I'm happy to take the first uh, stab at, at responding, Commissioner. I think, um, in my mind, an ideal way to move forward would be to allow the several resolutions that are coming through the committees currently for example, um, I believe that we have one related to literacy. We have the um, uh, your own resolution in support of partnership with Simone Community Development Center. Um, all of these resolutions should be uh, reviewed and evaluated by the committees. Um, and if they could come together at the point of um, reviewing the budget in its entirety, um, that would allow the board um, to help make some decisions with regard to overall priorities. Um, if all of those resolutions, for example, are prioritized, and let's say they all add up to an additional $2 million um, to the budget, you know, you think of the balancing plan as a point in time where we had a balanced budget plan for next year. We added $2 million to that plan, additional costs. Um, We'll continue to look at revenue streams. We'll see if the state generates more uh, revenues from for us, such as during the May uh, revise, um, the governor's May budget, um, and as well as possible grants. It is possible that other funding sources will be identified that would align well uh, with these new investments. Um, but if the board were to determine that these new costs um, are the highest priority, and we don't have new revenue identified, we would in fact need to identify other expenses to cut. Um, and so it's, it's literally a balancing act. If we don't have a way to pay for these, then I would not advise that we move them forward. Um, but I don't think we'll have a clear answer to that um, until we're closer towards the point um, of the board adopting our budget. Got it, I appreciate that. You know, and. Um... Again, um, that helps with a little bit of clarity. I'm I just, again, I'm confused, you know, like um, we're talking about like not making, making cuts to Central and then we're adding more positions to Central, which I think is confusing for the public. So again, putting it back on the board as a whole, like right up, as a seven, like, you know, what, a, what is our process and how do we want to move forward with this kind of, uh, these kind of decisions? You know, if we're saying one thing, you know, and then we go, and we create more positions in central that we're saying we want to cut, you know, like that to me is confusing for me. And also I feel like it's confusing for the public. So, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm really unsettled around this financial piece only, financial piece only, the spirit and the intent of the work, you know, I 100% agree. And I'll finish it with this question. Um, can some of this work be done now without any funding support or does it need to be funded in order for it to, to start to have to, some legs to move? Uh, I don't know of any of my colleagues who are uh, closer to the type of activities, um, you know, that would uh, and funding sources that would support this work. I might just share the one way to make this work happen currently would be to look at our existing resources, and that's uh, staff and current budget. And keeping in mind that if we were to ask existing staff. And, um, and to call on uh, current, our current budget to be directed to support this work, we just need to recognize that there are trade-offs. 
Um, an example might be, are there currently uh, liaison staff who could you know, split their time, uh, start to initiate the work of uh, working with this new advisory committee? Um, or if we're looking at uh, the facilities budget, <laughs> uh, thinking about uh, what, what work might be foregone and delayed so that we could initiate um, this effort. Um, so just purely from um, kind of a resource standpoint, um, that might be one way that we go about uh, prioritizing doing this work. But I certainly um, encourage any of my colleagues who manage those staff or funding sure. resources to speak up. Commissioners, if I could, uh, with respect to signage, and um, we, we do, as we modernize building sites right now, install signage as part of bond projects and make sure to designate at least one um, single stall bathroom. I think to the extent that the board um, directed us to move forward with uh, making sure that we got to the over 1,000 single, there's about over 1,000 single stall restrooms right now in the district. So just focusing, focusing on that universe. Um, we could move ahead with fabricating signs and installing them, um, but my recommended funding stores would be out of our deferred maintenance budget. So again, the trade-off there is just less funds to work on windows or other kinds of uh, capital needs that come up over the course of the year. Um, but we have been tackling this, but it has been at a slower pace and associated with our overall modernization program. I wanted to follow up on that too. I don't know, Vice President, I mean, Commissioner Maliga, if you were going to respond to that, because I had a question regarding signage as well. Oh, um, thank you, President Lovers. I just wanted to conclude my comments with saying, you know, um, if there's areas around, you know, this effort that has to, re that relates to compliancy, I'm 100% all right. Right. If we got to get to compliancy, and if there's areas that we're violating compliancy, you know, then those areas that I want to support, 100%, support, sorry, 100% support that we, that we meet tomorrow, you know, should have probably been done yesterday, you know, but anyways, thank you for the time, President Lopez, I appreciate it. Yes, uh, and then just to follow up on that, given uh, some of the comments made from the public and what's what we've been discussing now regarding state mandated signage and its uh, high price tag uh, for the resolution, I, I just think it gives off this, this again, questioning around our budget, which of course we, we have to be during this time, but adds a level of uh, additional requirements in a way when this is a st state mandated issue. So I think I just, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm needing more information around how this is tied into the resolutions efforts uh, when it's something that is required by law. Commissioner, if that question is directed specifically to me and around the signage efforts, I would actually defer to legal counsel to speak to the extent to which that this is uh, required or not. Uh, and also Chief Wallace, if you have more information regarding the budget and funding. Uh, so I can, I can chime in Chief Wallace before you get to the funding. Uh, so with respect to the signage, if we have uh, single sex restrooms, which we should have at every school, and I think uh, Chief Kamala Nathan just told you we did, um, that signage needs to be gender neutral. And to the extent we have signage, it always needs to be ADA compliant. So um, we are working towards getting into full compliance. Uh, it sounds like consistent with our renovation and our, um, our bond program. Uh, but if we need to change uh, approaches, then that's something we can do, but there will probably be some level of cost to that. So is that cost included in this budget that you presented? Was the cost of bringing all of the bathrooms into full compliance, both with um, the non-gender bathrooms and ADA compliance for those bathrooms? Commissioner, 
I want to differentiate between ADA compliance for a bathroom and having signage that is ADA compliant. So just- uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so the so, ADA <laughs> compliance for signage on the non-gendered bathrooms. Right, and so yes, we provided a cost estimate to Chief Wallace to include as part of her staff report for a, a rough estimate of signage materials. It did not include actually labor because um, again, we've been delivering this the, the signs right now as part of overall construction contracts. Um, should we need to designate a staff person or staff persons to go and install this? Um, again, we can do that. Um, so I guess what I'm questioning is, was that included in the budget estimate? And then I'm also hearing that we're, we're not, I'm hearing this from the our, our state advisor, we shouldn't be including compliance related budgetary items in this budget if we're considering additional costs because those should be covered just like we cover costs for students with dis disabilities those are not considered extra costs things that are we were required to provide so if those estimates were in your bu previous budget analysis one of the things i think commissioner alexander and i asked and it's a fair question is can we see a revised budget which excludes things that are required by state law. Uh, Commissioner, again, I would emphasize, I believe that the estimate I provided Chief Wallace as part of the resolution, the analysis on the resolution included only, it did include a materials cost. It did not include a labor cost. So again, we would, um, that would need to be covered in some respect with our budget. And we would either address that using in-house staff or contracting um, with an uh, appropriate kind of contractor to help us with the installation of the signage. I, I think some of us are just trying to get uh, the question answered. Uh, Commissioner Alexander. Okay, so just, I, I think what we're trying to find out is why is the budget cost for something that is state mandated connected to this resolution? Why, why is the funding tied to something that we are required to do by law? Um, oh, President Lopez, I can go ahead and try to answer that. Um, my understanding is that um, per Chief Kamala Nathan, that she's been working to implement um, this process over time as restrooms are being renovated. And so this cost would really be for those additional restrooms that aren't on that lineup of, of upgrades. Um, and that while um, it is worth working to implement it over time, uh, within those resources dedicated towards um, doing the the uh, renovation, that this would be a new cost to our operating budget. Um, so that is the primary reason why it's called out, um, because um, this would be um, tapping into our operating budget in a way that it is not um, currently. And so keeping in mind that the balancing plan is that point in time where everything balances mm -hmm. if we're identifying a new expense it does need to be called out um, and so be it to um, align um, with our laws or not in this case it is it's the it's the funding mechanism uh, that is different and that we would need to um, uh, address in in our balancing plan so i guess this is where uh, you know, I feel concerned because what I'm hearing you say is that we are not in full compliance. We are coming into full compliance gradually. And in order to, to implement the resolution in a way you wanted to include this as, an, as a different budget item because it would mean spending money sooner than we had anticipated spending it. And if that's correct, then that concerns me and that makes me really, really want a QT pack because it means that we are not prioritizing as a district something that certain families really need for their kids to feel safe in schools. And if a bathroom doesn't, it doesn't mean much to me and my kids because they can go to, to the bathroom without a, a unisex bathroom, but 
for a, if my children were non-binary and they weren't going to the bathroom because they didn't have signage that you know then it becomes a bigger priority and so i'm just just reflecting that it feels like you know we can talk about what it costs to come into compliance but this whole conversation is kind of problematic and the fact that that hasn't been separated out is in a way a justification for why we need this resolution because the only parents that are consistently advocating to make sure that we are in compliance are families that are directly impacted so i i'll yield I, you know my time but i feel like this is this is the problem and this also while it is it is reasonable to say we should consider costs for uh, somebody to lead a, a pack and that is an additional cost i do think that's a valid conversation what we're seeing is that without this official group families that have children that are non-binary or families that are non-binary transgender and queer are going to be deprioritized and considered an added expense when it comes to making our schools free of discrimination commissioner alexander um i think this is a good discussion and I think the concerns around budget that are being raised are really good ones. I also think we are getting a little bit into the weeds, and I think that that's why I support the proposal that Deputy Superintendent Lee and Chief Wallace made around this amended language, because I think it's always a question of priorities, right? And if we pass this resolution, what we're saying is this is a priority, right? We're saying as a board, we believe this is a priority. It maybe hasn't been as much of a priority as it needed to be, and now we're emphasizing that it should be even more of one. But we're also trusting the staff to go through a process of trade-offs, right? As whether it's facilities or um, whatever other area of the district, the, you know, in terms of staffing the, the pack, right? As, as people said, there and, there and there's different ways it could be approached, right? Um, there's creative thinking that could, that could occur. Maybe it's not a position that costs $180,000. Maybe it's a teacher on special assignment who staffs the committee, right? I mean, I think there's, so I, I just think the, the amended language would say this is a priority and then allow staff to, to do their work and come back in the context of the whole budget and make some trade-offs and say, okay, we've heard this is a priority. Now here's our plan for implementing this and here's how we're gonna trade. Here are the other things we're maybe not gonna do in order to fund this. Um, and so I think that's what I, I, I think, I mean, we could we could debate this all night around the specifics, I guess is what I'm saying. And I think, so, so this, that's why I think the amended language might be a way to move forward and say, we're, we're declaring this a priority and we're asking staff to then in the balancing process, identify those, those trade-offs and creative ways of doing this um, and, and prioritizing it. Thank you. Um, thank you to the public and for the parent leaders that have been engaged in putting the resolution together with Commissioner Collins. And you know, I, unfortunately, I did have to have to leave the Budget and Business Services um, Committee last week early um, due to a family commitment. But I did express my support for the resolution, and particularly with the added amendments that has been brought forward this evening for. Um, how do we incorporate the budget commitments um, in this resolution to be part of the full package of the balancing plan moving forward? I think we have to acknowledge that there are tough decisions ahead for this district, for this board, um, and that we have to see things holistically. So as um, Chief Wallace had raised tonight, and thank you to um, Chair Alexander to really say that this is a priority, but how are we going to be able to put forward a balancing budget overall um, and how this will be um, part of um, a broader package. So I think I also want to, you know, acknowledge and, and recognize um, that this, if this resolution does pass, it is state, you know, stating that this is a priority for the board and for the district. So I, I will be supporting um, the resolution tonight, the establishment of the um, the PAC, um, and to move forward with, um, I look forward to what that budgeting looks like. I also wanna be clear that depending on how the budgeting process happens this spring, that I also expressed at the BBS meeting that 
I didn't want the work to, to stall or stop. And we've had those discussions tonight about, you know, how could the work be leveraged um, and that and acknowledge that this work is really important and that creating safe and inclusive school communities is key, while also, again, balancing that we have a structural budget deficit, but this work um, should not um, be stopped. Okay, Commissioner Bogus, and then I'll make one final comment. Uh, Commissioner or President Lopez, I'd like to comment as well. I was just going to ask, as far as the balancing around the budget, would we be looking to balance the ongoing costs, the one-time costs, or both costs? I know in our balancing plan, we're really looking at the structural impacts and minimizing those. And so just, I guess I would love to get a comment on staff as far as how much dollars and cents are we looking to adjust for the current year, kind of understanding these expenses will kind of be happening over time. And then after that, I have a, one more comment, and then I'll close out. Thank you, Commissioner Bogus. Um, we are looking to balance um, three years out, keeping in mind that when the board adopts the budget, that will be for fiscal year 2022-23, and the state requires us to look uh, two fiscal years beyond that in our multi-year projections. So that is one reason why it's important to look at those ongoing one-time versus ongoing expenses, um, because that will uh, change um, how much uh, we need to balance the budget to adapt, um, you know, in those out years in particular. So is that three years of the ongoing plus the one-time expenses that have to be balanced for, or is it just the three years of the ongoing? Um, it's both. I mean, really just keeping in mind, we have to identify the funding sources for all of the expenses. But in that first year, it's a higher cost because there are both one-time and ongoing. But in the following two years, it is just the ongoing cost plus inflation. Okay, no, I appreciate that clarity. And I, I think, yeah, I think for me, it's really important that we figure out a way to support and prioritize families and family voice and really kind of, I feel like that is an anchor to kind of us being successful as a district and how we accomplish that. I think one thing I am challenged by though is I feel that our parent advisory council structure isn't working well right now um, and that we have a lot of gaps. We have a lot of frustration from families and groups that don't feel heard. And so I, I think that as we as, as, as I support us moving forward with this, that we really figure out what is it going to take to really transform that system and make it more effective um, and also identify if there's other groups and communities that have been left out that need to be identified and how we lift them up and how we can create um you know a fiscal plan forward to allow us to really support students parents and families um to advise us guide us help evaluate and hold us accountable um so i just wanted to share that as we we move forward to think more thank you thank you i, want, I really want to thank uh, commissioner collins for your work on this resolution bringing it forward to the board and your work with um, community groups and the communities affected um, by essentially queer bashing that's been going on in our community for decades and hundreds of years, obviously. Um, so it couldn't come sooner. I mean, it, this is very much needed and it's a big priority for our district. So I'm hoping that everybody votes for it. Um, I also just had some questions around, I, I think the budget issue is paramount too, but I, I do agree with Commissioner Alexander that we should trust our staff uh, with uh, moving forward with this and making recommendations about how we do that. Um, but I do have a couple questions about the structure of this um, uh, advisory group, um, how many folks would be on it. Did you, I don't know if I saw that in the resolution itself and how would they be chosen? Is that from our hire, they would do that? Well, I guess, you know, the APAC, you know, we have groups that, that all, you know, we have a Samoan Pacific Islander group, we have a special education CAC, and they're all you know, organized very differently. Mm -hmm. It's not the same as like an advisory group where we have, you know, like for the mural or for, you know, even the charter, you know, PEEF, you know, this, this is, I really do believe that the community itself needs to decide, you know, what makes sense in terms of their um, kind of governance structure. I know that the APAC doesn't have a formal chair. You know, they have folks that volunteer and they have like a kind of a cabinet, but it's people that want to volunteer more, whereas others, other groups have an official 
chair, vice president, secretary. And so I really, that's why the having a, a person as a liaison mm -hmm. to help work with the community and our family coalition, they have an external kind of a non-official group that has been very supportive. And in having a staff person work with community members that are interested in, in being the you know founding members of the group, that I really do believe that it should be up to them to determine their, their structure, but it is not a group that we would be appointing members okay. or approving members. This is really an officially recognized parent group that is kind of exists on its own, just as the APAC exists on its own mm -hmm. and reports to the board and has an official kind of recommendation structure, but doesn't and exist, you know, to advise any specific okay, policies. Thank you for that or clarity. And would they be um, devising their own bylaws? Yeah, okay. exactly. And would they then be just like other committees where they'd have to um, abide by the Brown Act when posting their meetings? To... They would have to follow all the same rules that any of our other parent advisory committees follow. Okay. All right, okay. And I don't specifically, you know, but that we should, you know, be following, all of our committees should be following those, those guidelines and they would want to do that as well. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And I, I think what I just wanted to be clear around is when we are having discussions around the budget and what's required and uh, how we bring up the cost of, of the work that we're required to do versus what we want to prioritize, I just think it's important that this isn't on the backs of voices who are already struggling to be at the table, who already want to be included. And we make every effort to, as mentioned, trust our staff to do this work. Uh, I also want to point out that the resolution itself does have resources to fund the initiatives that are being called for. So uh, hopefully people can take a look at that, including members from our staff. So with that, I'd like to do a roll call vote on the motion. Student Delegate Lamb? Yes. Student Delegate Liang? Yes. Commissioner Alexander? Yes. Commissioner Bogus? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Vice President Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Maliga? Hi. President Lopez, are we voting on the on the amendment or on the motion? I'm sorry. The amended document. The amended, the amended document. Right. I, I pass. Can you come back to me? Okay. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. And President Lopez. Yes, but I do want to just hope that everyone is clear on what we were voting on. Your yeses are okay. So, yes, from me. It's the re the amended resolution, correct? Yes. Commissioner Maliga. No. Six eyes. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to section H on our agenda. Special order of business. Item one, resolution finding that as a result of the state of emergency declared by the California governor, Gavin Newsom on March 4th, 2020, it is necessary to continue to conduct virtual meetings to avoid imminent risks to the health and safety of attendees. Item 219-28 SO3, I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent Matthews. Uh, yes, uh, well, at least the beginning of the discussion will be our general counsel, Danielle Hawk. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, this is the same item that you have been seeing for several meetings every 30 days. Uh, it is necessary for you to adopt this resolution in order to continue meeting over Zoom. Um, I'm happy to answer questions about the resolution, but I think staff is also prepared to answer other questions. Great, before we do that, let's open it up to public comment for one minute each. Yes, please raise your hand if you care to speak to the resolution extending virtual meetings. It could have repeated in Spanish and Chinese. Buenas noches, por favor, levante la mano si desea añadir un comentario público. Gracias. Oh, so let me just 
，如果你想繼續有呢、這個我誒、呃、網上開會嘅決議，誒、呃、以前發表意見嘅話，請舉手。Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Julie. Did you care to speak? Yes, um, I'm hoping board members will ask these same questions. But when this has come up previously, um, there have been technical challenges that would prevent um, when it is safe in the future for in-person board meetings to happen, um, while also being the public also being able to participate remotely via Zoom. And so I wanted to make sure that we get clarity on what it would take to enable to make sure that was a technical possibility. Um, and I, I know this is something that the city of San Francisco and other boards and commissions are looking at. So I'm hoping that SFUSD can both, um, you know, be a part of those discussions and help us figure out how to maintain, um, you know, this this access in an equitable way, um, and to potentially line up um, support and resources to create the technological upgrades that would make it possible. Thank you. Thank you. I believe it's Mr. Hoa or MRHOA is the handle. Yes, that's uh, me. I am a uh, parent, LGBT parent. Um, and I have just a quick question. Are you, um, do all marginalized groups have similar programs or i'm sorry i'm sorry um, to interrupt but this section of public comment is only uh, regarding the resolution to extend the option of virtual meetings for the board of education oh sorry no problem the handle says 14086 14086 hello hello yeah, uh, so uh, I just wanted to make sure um, that I understand what was, uh, did you guys vote for uh, just for resolution to uh, create what kind of bathrooms? Can somebody explain? I'm <laughs> sorry, this, this is a public comment know. time. We are, we are not responding to questions during public comment. You can just make comments about the item that we're on. Well, in order to make a comment, uh, I need to understand what you voted for. I read like all these propos proposals and uh, resolutions and- uh, Hello, hi, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Right now we are discussing the state of emergency declared by California Governor Gavin Newsom and whether we will conduct virtual meetings or not. That is what we are commenting on currently. But I am asking about the vote. Can we move on to that? Right, we're moving on. Thank you. This is not the time for this. Oh, yeah. It's so hard to explain what we voted for. I can't figure out. Can you find her? Right, thank you. <clears throat> Hello, Alita. Hi. Um, thanks again, everyone. Um, so the CAC as an advisory committee of the district, we understand that we have to do this exact same process every month. And so we um, at our board meeting had the first conversation about that this month to bring ourselves into compliance and um, our members are really grateful to be able to have a way to connect virtually. Um, but one of the comments that was made that really resonated with all of us is, man, oh man, do we miss the ability to get together in person and commiserate and, um, like I mentioned earlier, find that affinity space and just connect with the parents who are going through exactly what we're going through now. Um, give each other a hug when it's safe to give each other a hug. Um, there are just those connections that help us all feel part of our schools that would be so much easier to do in person for many of us. Um, so having that ability would just be so helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Rianda. Good evening, board commissioners, deputies, uh, sorry, Superintendent Matthews, deputy superintendent for Martell. And everybody listening tonight, I would once again ask the commissioners to approve the resolution 
because again, as a mom with now, I guess, a toddler, so she's uh, almost 16 months, it makes it very easy for me to attend the meetings going late into the evening because it doesn't interrupt his bedtime, his bath time, or anything else that I need to do with him. And I'm sure any families with young um, babies would appreciate the same, or even um, school-age babies. As we all know, the board meetings sometimes can run until 11 and 12 o'clock at night, if not later. <laughs> And it's very difficult um, for families with young children to be able to participate in person for that length of time. I understand some families do want the in-person, so maybe if it is voted for the in-person option, if we can do like a hybrid in-person Zoom, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, Patrick. Patrick? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, so I, I think we all agree that Zoom access is, is a very good thing. It's, it's good for people to be able to, uh, to attend remotely, but you know, the emergency um, order says it's necessary to continue to conduct virtual meetings to avoid imminent risk to the health and safety of attendees. And I have to say, we've been able to conduct school in person for the entire year. Teachers are in school, Students are in school. It is not a health emergency. It is certainly a health um, you know, risk that we have to manage, but we're able to do it. I think we ought to be able to do in-person meetings. So I would like to ask that the board and staff really think about over the next month, moving to uh, having in-person, fully in-person meetings, because I think we can do this. And as uh, the previous caller was saying, there's a real benefit to it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Brandy. Hello, I want to voice my support for um, having these meetings available are uh, uh, accessible virtually. Um, as a previous caller said, um, for those of us with young children, um, it is wonderful and provides us with more access to our to these meetings that we would not have if they were solely in person. I also want to um, bring up um, a memo that was sent out by um, Attorney General Merrick Garland, the National School Boards Association asked President Biden um, for security um, from the FBI, the Secret Service, given um, that some people have shown up at school board meetings um, and caused problems. I, I'm sure you're all aware of this. Um, the fact that this is, um, is coming from the Attorney General of the United States and it specifically mentions attacks on school boards means that it is something that we need to take very seriously. So should the meetings be in person, we need to make sure that they are um, in an atmosphere in which our um, school board members and our parents and students feel both physically safe and also, also um, culturally and emotionally safe as well. Thank you. Thank you. Celestina. Hi there. Um, I just would like to um, advocate for um, a hybrid, uh, for hybrid meetings, both in person and virtual. Um, I think that um, there's really good points for both. Um, I think that that would be a really great step in the direction of um, greater accessibility. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Hava. Hi, um, I wanted to call in separate from even COVID protocols and separate as a parent of a SPED student. Um, I have a physical disability in my own right. Um, and what this experience, the one silver lining 
has been is Zoom technology. That has allowed me to participate in a way that I just literally could not do prior. So when I hear these conversations, I appreciate personal connections as anybody else would, but I can't access bi-weekly or bi-monthly meetings and other meetings. I just physically cannot do it. So I just wanted to just put it out there. If there is a possibility to streamline this or to provide some sort of technology so I can continue to do something that really matters for me. Um, I cannot explain to you what it's like to feel trapped in your own body and to want to participate in this world and not be able to get there. So I just, please, thank you. Thank you. Michelle, would you like to go ahead? Yes, thank you, Judson. Um, Michelle Jacques Menegas, again, the coordinator for the PAC. Um, I just wanted to elevate comments you've already heard this evening from Julie and Rianda, Brandy and Hava in particular, and um, express also what myself and the PAC have heard which is that uh, maintaining the virtual option to participate for families is absolutely vital. For PAC members, um, they wouldn't be able to be there to present the report um, because they have to be picking up their kids or they need to be making dinner. Many of our families have talked about the fact that they have um, younger children who cannot yet be vaccinated like you heard tonight um, or family members um, who are immune compromised and then that doesn't even cover, as you heard, you know, families with students with disabilities or parents themselves with disabilities. And so um, it doesn't seem truly equitable to return to in-person meetings unless we can maintain some kind of virtual participation option. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, Greg. Thank you. Uh, this seems like a no-brainer. I would keep the, um, the virtual meeting uh, as, as an option. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Roberto. Roberto. Yes, how you doing? I'm a parent and I'm also a school district employee. And I would just like to say that I've worked on a lot of Latino families and African-American families that don't have Wi-Fi. Their kids might have a district provided laptop, but the parents don't have Wi-Fi. And so just, this is one of my first meetings I've attended today. and. I, I haven't really heard too many Latino parents calling in. And so I know they're limited to the participation in these meetings. And so if we can be able to provide virtual and in-person meetings for families to be able to access and be able to give you guys more feedback, even our homeless population families, they don't have internet. And so how are they able to participate in these meetings? Thank you. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Okay, thank you. So as we know, we have this discussion every 30 days. Any questions or comments from commissioners or student delegates? Commissioner Bogus. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I, I do feel that we need to start meeting in person again. I, I do wanna lift up the concerns from the public as far as how do we maximize accessibility for everybody, as well as the accessibility, not just to watch, but to comment during the meeting um, that Zoom has provided. Um, I, I do feel like for me that is, as, as, as we have children in classes and people are going back to work more often, it's really helpful for us as elected officials to have members of the public and the audience to hold us accountable. Um, I think that's a separate issue from whether or not we're able to have hybrid meetings. I mean, I think figuring out the logistics and the cost of that, I think we're a little bit separate from where we're at in this moment. Um, but I just wanted to, to share that, that I would not be voting for this and the, the reasons for it. Thank you. I'll hear from Commissioner Moliga and then Commissioner Alexander. Thank you, President Lopez. Uh, question to staff, where are we with the uh, hybrid uh, approach? Um, and I've had conversations with uh, school districts and our neighbors, uh, Jefferson and down in Ravenswood. And it seems like folks have been able to kick off a, a hybrid model. 
And so, you know, obviously I think those school districts are way smaller than ours, but uh, what, where, where are we in terms of that? Because I, I tonight would like to, so, to not support this resolution, you know, but I also want to hear where we're at because I, I do believe we should be in person in addition to having uh, a virtual component. So I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Hogan-Dyke, who's done some research on this to uh, address that question. Yes, thank you, Superintendent Matthews. Good evening, commissioners and members of the public. Um, we have been able to connect with our colleagues across the street. Um, as you know, SF uh, Gov TV supports us with our regular meetings. Um, we feel with the existing support that we have for our regular board meetings, we would be able to um, host that as a hybrid option, although there's still some provisions and protocols that we'd like to discuss with board leadership relative to room capacity and security and um, those types of things. Um, I think the question would be um, for our committee meetings. Um, and what provisions we would be able to make, which would require additional staff because we don't have support from SFGov TV for those particular meetings. So again, would be happy to meet with board leadership to discuss those details. Thank you. And then uh, just for clarification, thank you, uh, Jill. Uh, so when we, if say we do kick off this hybrid model, you know, potentially if all goes well, um, would this also take into consideration the uh, committee meetings or is it just for our general, uh, General sessions. So the resolution actually pertains to both the committee meetings and the uh, board meetings. So if the vote, if the board voted not to support the resolution uh, to keep hybrid, to keep uh, virtual meetings in place, um, you, as you just heard, we 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 currently could support the board meetings but we don't have staffing to support the committee meetings. So if the committee meetings are not virtual, they would be here, but not, unless, unless we don't have current staffing to support that. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Matthews. Commissioner Alexander and Commissioner Vice President Lamb. Um, I'd like to offer, if, if I could get staff's assistance with this, I'd like to suggest to offer an amendment to make this resolution only apply to committee meetings, committee of the whole, special meetings, and other non-regular board meetings. In other words, that we would we would not have this resolution apply to the regular meetings of the Board of Education, but it would apply to all other meetings. Is that possible to do with an amendment? Ms. Hulk? Yeah, um, it is possible. I think uh, it is a little problematic, commissioners, because um, the premise of the resolution is that it is not, uh, we are not set up to safely operate a meeting with the public in the boardroom. Um, and it's a little opposite of that premise to say we are set up to do it safely for smaller meetings than we are for larger meetings. Um, so I think what you're getting at, Commissioner Alexander, is that you would like to see the hybrid option, um, but that is something different than this resolution. So we um, we can discuss the hybrid option, but we we cannot. I, I would not recommend amending it in the way that you suggested. I guess is is the bottom line. Does that make sense, Commissioner, about the inconsistency? Yeah, definitely. I hear exactly what you're saying. Um, well, and honestly, that's why I've been voting no on this resolution, because I feel like it actually is safe, and I think it's actually more of a logistical challenge. So I feel like I've been uncomfortable, honestly, with the recitals saying it's not safe, when I feel like, I mean, maybe we could have made the argument in the last month during the Omicron surge, but I feel like last fall, we were at points where I was not comfortable with the recitals declaring it's not safe. So I'm going to have to vote no again. Again, I'm not trying to create problems for staff. I think if there's a way around this, I would love to figure it out, but I think at least bringing public back for the regular board meetings would be important. So I'm gonna have to vote now, unfortunately. I had a question for staff. If we know what the Board of Supervisors and what City Hall, how they're conducting their committee meetings or their full Board of Supervisors. Ms. Ogendike. 
Um, uh, thank you, Commissioner Lamb. Um, from what I understand, they are still hosting the meetings virtually with supervisors in their office. So that was the last I heard of it. They also have a whole department to help support that technology um, and any moves that they would make. And have we heard from the Board of Supervisors from um, the clerk, uh, what plans that the city has to bring them back to in-person yet? I do not have that information from the clerk, but I'm happy to follow up with that. Thank you. And I'll just recommend, I, you know, if board leadership, if we get this, you know, working with the superintendent and staff and working towards uh, what return to in-person for board meetings would look like, I would certainly be available to with that planning. Student Delegate Lamb and then Commissioner Collins. Yeah, I think um, we keep coming back to this agenda item every 30 days and each time we're kind of increasingly more and more open to bringing the public back. I think right now uh, I'm feeling that I'm going to vote yes just because it seems like if we were to vote no on it then everything would have to be in person um, and I agree with Vice President Lamb in that hopefully before the next 30, 30 days are up and we have this again in March, we have a plan to fully staff our committee meetings in addition to our regular board meetings so that we can return to in person, but also um, advocating for a hybrid option here, obviously. I just want to say currently, I hear with your the request and totally understand the request, but in order to uh, make the committee meetings hybrid. We just, we currently do not have that staff and we would not be able to get that staff in place in 30 days. So I just want to be completely transparent. And it might be helpful uh, to remember when we would have committee meetings and they were in person, it didn't have the video recording. It was an audio in a completely different setup. So I believe that's what you're referring to. I guess by fully staffed for committee meetings, do you mean uh, having SF Gov TV or so if we were to go without SF Gov TV and just do it on Zoom, would that still be all right? Like, uh, I, I would, well, we could do what we could to work that out. I just know the technology, it, we, the technology issue, issues, glitches, even tonight, um, and at uh, some points during closed session we use, and it's a pretty difficult process to just use them. Every you, it's turning on, turning off. One only one commuter can be on. It's a pretty difficult process. I feel like we're kind of having two conversations. I think that are important, and um, obviously, I think varying people have varying opinions about whether it feels safe or doesn't feel safe. Um, but I think the other conversation that we're having is that we're realizing that in some cases, the fact that we've gone virtual has allowed more people to participate. And families that previously could not participate, such as parents with young children um, or folks with disabilities and are actually more able to participate in our meetings. And, and I, I really feel that and want to maintain that level of participation. Um, and so I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, I did make a request and I'm just wondering, is this something maybe that the community might be able to help us with in partnership, you know, with these, cause it's, we're talking about technological um, challenges that if we had more resources or maybe more technical support, we might be able to overcome. And and I, I would like to see a report if there's a way that we could get a report from staff about what would be required in order to put a hybrid model in place, then that gives us something to then go to the community and say, hey, help us out. You know, we don't, you know, we're in a budget crisis. We wanna be fiscally responsible, but we also wanna maintain these really high levels of parent involvement. There's 250 people on the call right now and that is not had you know i've been to board meetings for 20 years and you know if you have children my kids were doing homework in the back you know and not getting dinner so being able for parents 
especially for parents who have families with multiple children, being able to participate in these meetings virtually is very much, very, very important. Um, and so I'm just wondering if that's something that we could prepare as an item and, you know, this is what it would take. And maybe we can, you know, then go to the community and say, help us out. We want to maintain this level of involvement and we also want to bring folks back um, to in person as well. And I will continue until we have a solution. I'm going to continue to support family involvement. And so that means uh, maintaining the virtual meetings. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to note uh, Commissioner Alexander pointed out to me that this order, the governor's order expires March 31st. Do we have a sense of whether it's going to be renewed or could we contact uh, capital advisors to see if they have any word about that? We can definitely uh, contact capital advisors, Commissioner Alex, or excuse me, Commissioner Sanchez. Um, I would say you're going to see this if the board adopts this resolution tonight, you will see it again before March 31st because we have to do this every 30 days. So um, that will be another point where we check in. Okay, thank you. I was wondering about our plans if there is another surge. Say we vote no and we continue in person, what's the transition back to a virtual setting? Uh, in that case, President Lopez, we would need to have a special meeting. Um, we could have a special meeting virtually for the sole purpose of adopting a resolution that allows you to meet uh, in a subsequent meeting virtually. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's let's do a, actually, I'm sorry. I do, I do really, I guess I wanna be clear. If we vote no tonight, what should the public expect at our next board meeting? And similar question, if we vote yes, we'll just continue as is. So we will one, we will be working with board leadership on what that looks like, but a no, your, your question was a no vote. No. A no vote means that uh, you are voting that that we will that it's no longer necessary to continue to conduct virtual meetings. Um, the public would then be uh, able to come in to this meeting, and we would be working with uh, board leadership on what the uh, virtual option looks like. Uh, the committee meetings would also revert to uh, public meetings, and. At this current time, we would not have a virtual option for those. Okay, so that that adds a little clarity. If, so if we are in person for our regular board meetings, there will be a virtual option, except for committees. There will be, we'll, we will have GovTV for sure, uh, but we will be working with you on what it, whether that's hybrid or there will be coverage, but we will be working with you on whether that's hybrid or not, meaning public public uh, participation. So we have GovTV for these meetings. We didn't have, uh, if you weren't here, you, you could watch, but you could, couldn't call in or couldn't participate, at least publicly. Uh, but So we know that, but we'd work with you on if, that, if, the hybrid, if we were going to do hybrid or not, but we, we wouldn't have that option for the committee meetings. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Roll call vote. Student Delegate Lamb? Yes. Student Delegate Liang? Yes. Commissioner Alexander? No. Commissioner Bogus? No. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Vice President Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Maliga? No. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. President Lopez? Yes. That's four eyes. So, I, I want us to pause for a few minutes before we begin our next item, which is section I. I recognize we've been sitting for a long time and we're about to get into another important discussion. So we will be back at 8.20.
Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. And my colleagues, sometimes we need to step away. But we are now in section I, discussion of other educational issues. Item one, fiscal year 2022-23 budget development update. I'd like to call on Chief Financial Officer Megan Wallace. Actually, President Lopez, I'm, I'm going to lead off for us. Thank you. Ooh, yes. And then uh, we will have a team, including our CFO, Megan Wallace, and Anne-Marie Gordon, our Executive Director of Budget Services. But I'll, I'll provide a little bit of an introduction. And tonight, this, is, this presentation is going to include some information that was also shared at last Wednesday's Budget and Business Services Committee, as well as some additional information. So if we can go to the, to the next slide. Okay, there we go. So when the board passed the budget balancing plan back on December 14th, and uh, importantly, a few weeks ago on January 10th, the governor released his proposed budget for the upcoming fiscal year, which is usually the kickoff of the the budget development process. Um, we, we had anticipated a number of improvements and we're happy to see that there has been significant improvement in, in the budget forecast in terms of our revenues. Uh, but back then when the balancing plan along with the first interim report for the current fiscal year was adopted, there were a number of uh, commitments that were made and I'll, I'll outline a few of those in the next slide, but uh, we also identified options for funding restorations. We uh, discussed at that time and since examining our central functions in the event that additional cuts were needed. Um, and tonight we're gonna uh, share some information about all of that and also report on progress in developing our weighted student formula allocations, our multi-tiered system of supports or MTSS allocations and direct service um, full-time equivalent, in other words, staffing allocations. And then tonight, we also wanna provide a preview of the next steps and key dates, key milestones in the budget development process through the rest of the spring. So on the, on the next slide, just to repeat back some of the information that was shared in the board's adoption of the balancing plan, there, and this, this was repeated multiple times in, in the uh, agenda items about things that would happen after the, the balancing plan was, was approved. Um, so just to summarize a couple of those points, one was that after uh, the governor's budget was released, that we would update the board on the fiscal, the revised fiscal outlook. And then we would continue to explore patterns of central budgets. So those would be taking place in, in January and then report to the board on WSF and MTSS allocation. So these three highlights reflect work that's happened, uh, including this evening's report um, tonight. And then uh, some additional steps to follow are to revisit and update the balancing plan accompanying the second interim report. And that would come back to the board on March 8th, so four weeks from tonight. Uh, and also we would continue to advocate all of us would continue to advocate at the state level for increased funding. And that, that's gonna take place through now the legislature's uh, work on the budget, which will culminate in June. And that link that's in the presentation links to uh, the memo that I think we talked about back in December about uh, the districts and other large urban districts priorities for, for the state budget. And importantly, that if revenue and or expenditure projections improve, the highest consideration for funding restoration 
would be given to school site budgets, direct services, and central office services that most support students. And so we, we wanna go into some details about the, the work we've done along all those lines. So with that, I will pass to our Chief Financial Officer, Megan Wallace. Thank you, Myung. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, so on the next slide, I just wanna provide an overview of the improved revenue outlook um, that we have identified um, as a result of the governor's January proposed budget. Um, to begin, when we first uh, put forward the budget balancing plan, I just wanna share that the local control funding formula and our special, educating, special education funding were, um, were lower based upon uh, prior forecasting assumptions and um, information that we were uh, reviewing with regard to declining enrollment. However, with the governor's January budget, we did see significant improvements in both of these areas of, of the LCFS and special education, um, the AD602 funding, uh, which is provided um, based upon uh, per the number of people. Um, in, um, in our school district. Um, as these two tables show, um, you can see uh, both for LCFS and for special education funding, what our prior assumptions had been uh, for both fiscal years 2022-23, as well as fiscal year 23-24. Um, and in the case of LCFS, you'll see that the cost of living adjustment or COLA um, increased from 2.48% to 5.33%. Um, and at the bottom, you'll see that the change um, is a $34.6 million improvement in our revenue outlook. Um, and similarly, you can see in the second year for LCFS, there is additional growth. And then for special education, we had previously assumed $715 per pupil. That has now gone up to $820 per pupil. Uh, resulting in a $5.4 million increase in our revenue. And so together, these two funding sources represent a $40 million improvement in our outlook for fiscal year 2022-23. And then in the following year, a $36.4 million improvement. Um, now taking that on the next slide in the context of our balancing plan, um, you can see uh, what our um, our current budget uh, forecast for fiscal year 2022-23 is, and then the, um, the proposed column represents our balancing plan and then taking into account adjustments um, resulting from this $40 million improvement. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, you know, it was agreed upon um, the adoption of the balancing plan that staff would look at that revenue outlook and uh, consider ways to restore funds if revenues should improve. Um, and so in keeping with uh, the priorities set out in that statement um, that we would look at improving our site budgets, um, direct services, and then any other um, uh, central office supports that have the highest impact on students. Um, staff is now proposing that we go ahead and restore site-based budgets by $35 million. Um, and you can see in the notes that that's a split between weighted student formula or the allocation based on enrollment to our school sites um, and as well as our multi-tiered system of support. And that would leave a remaining uh, reduction of $15 million to our site-based budgets. And I just wanna remind everybody that due to our declining enrollment, staff has determined that we really should be declining our budgets by about $15 million, uh, representing the lower number of students in our schools um, and their, therefore the reduced uh, uh, amount of resources required at our site. And then looking at our central budget, um, we evaluated programs based upon their cost effectiveness and impact on students. Um, and looking at our direct services, we did identify $5 million of, of uh, restorations that we would propose. Next slide, please. Another aspect of the, um, this point in time that we had agreed to um, when the balancing plan was adopted uh, was for staff to continue to look at our central office functions. At that point in time, 
we didn't know exactly how revenues would look with the January budget. So, so staff did continue to go down that path of looking at our functions to see if, um, you know, how we might go about um, uh, making additional cuts to central office in the event um, they were required. Um, and the methodology we took was really to focus in on three of our largest divisions in central office. You can see they're listed here, um, curriculum and instruction, student and family services, and technology. Um, and we asked the chiefs overseeing those divisions to assume just over $3 million of reductions in their budgets. How would they go about um, making those reductions? And what would the impact be um, on our students? On the next slide, you'll see that there's a lot of detail here. I'm not going to read all of it. Um, really, I just wanna highlight that um, staff um, identified those impacts um, on students, on services that would be provided to, uh, to our school sites, um, to our staff. Um, and keeping in mind again, that you know, with a lens of uh, needing to identify $3 million or more of reduction uh, from their budget. Um, I just wanna highlight some of the changes and I, I think maybe we can dive deeper in the question and answer section if uh, anybody wants to you know, understand uh, what any of these um, adjustments would entail. But for curriculum instruction, recognizing that the central services that we provide are really around uh, professional development, thinking about support to our educators, and the development of our curriculum, you'll see that a lot of the descriptions here are around reducing those supports or eliminating outright um, things such as uh, central office support for site content coaches and interventionists. Um, similarly for student and family services, um, thinking about the supports from that division or anything ranging from supports to students and their families to health and safety needs. And so you will see um, descriptions such as uh, reducing um, or eliminating um, uh, services such as um, our student and family resource link um, or eliminating central office support uh, for our peer resources program. Um, and then finally for technology, um, just thinking about um, the variety of supports that our technology division offers, uh, both to school sites and central office, um, you're going to see everything ranging from the day-to-day -day sort of, you know, you can feel the technology, you know, supporting of like, I need assistance with um, my laptop or uh, needing to see um, improvements um, with uh, tools that we're using online. So those things that are more behind the scenes and you're not going to um, realize uh, that we might be scaling back in areas that could lead to increased risk of cybersecurity incidents, for example. On the next slide. And Sorry to, uh, sorry to interrupt, but if you can sure. slow down just a little with the information sure. you're sharing. Thank you. Happy to. So really in conclusion, in this area of looking at our central office functions analysis, um, I just want to highlight that the indirect, indirect operations and administrative investments that we provide, um, you know, such as professional development, infrastructure, accountability, and essential organizational functions are all held within central services. Um, and that making reductions in these areas um, will result in greater distributed responsibility to school sites. So really these central services um, are, are um, enable school sites to really focus on um, their day-to-day -day educating our students and supporting them uh, while these central services, you know, focus on distributing support. Um, and so really uh, through these reductions, um, the superintendent and district staff um, do believe that any further reductions that to a significant degree uh, will um, impact 
our ability to provide ser services to students. So it's just, it's essential that we recognize that cuts in these areas will impact students and our school sites. Um, and so we don't recommend deeper cuts in these areas um, at this point in time. Next slide, please. And on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Executive Director Anne-Marie Gordon. Can I ask a clarifying question? Just, um, are you recommending not more than the $10 million that's here or not to do the $10 million reduction at all? Uh, we are not recommending the $10 million reduction at this time. Got it. Should I continue? Yes. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Anne-Marie Gordon, and I'm the Executive Director of Budget Services. And the last few slides of the presentation tonight um, are an overview of the current plans um, that are underway to prepare for budget development, which uh, we, we intend to, to launch the, at the end of this week, ideally, um, sharing allocations with the school sites. I will get to the timeline in just a moment, but here you can see an overview of the, um, the pieces of school site and direct service um, funding and resourcing that both Myung and, and Megan mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, I wanna take just a few minutes to go over some of the details underlying the approach that we are looking at for school site allocations uh, for next year. For weighted student formula, the plan is to make enrollment based reductions to school site budgets, um, totaling $15 million in total, less being, uh, being allocated to school sites. So this means that allocations will reflect the decline in enrollment that we have seen district-wide over the past two years. And enrollment projections will be based on current enrollment at each site, uh, with the assumption that students are all going to move up a grade next year um, and looking at patterns we have seen for enrollment in kindergarten and sixth and ninth grade as well. We are also looking at incorporating a rounding up policy for our baseline teacher staffing in weighted student formula. The idea here is that it will help balance some of the uh, recommended reductions that we are that we are considering in direct services where we have used additional resources uh, to provide partial allocations. Um, we see this adjustment within weighted student formula as an opportunity to avoid that fragmentation and have a, a more coherent uh, method for ensuring that schools have the funding for their base staffing. For the multi-tiered system of supports, or MTSS, uh, we are moving forward with plans to fully restore what had been in the balancing plan to reduce. Uh, what we do intend to do and what we are planning on is updating our school tier designations. So updating that student and staff input data for each school um, to reassess and make sure that school's tier assignments are reflective of our current student population. Schools that change tiers that move from one tier to another um, for next year will receive a transition policy um, to mitigate disruptions and unexpected change in those allocations. Uh, but we do also, we are looking at um, eliminating the transition policy where schools have been on that transition policy for several years as we have kept all of our allocations leveled and have not updated our tiers. Um, there are only a few cases of that uh, that remain. And so for the most part, we see 
this as a very, you know, very stabilizing um, restoration for our school sites. And with direct services, there are in this most updated version of the balancing plan about $5 million of reductions that we that we recommend upholding. Um, this, I think, to be clear, is not is not um, an intention or not not really meant. It is not meant to strip schools of valued resources, but it is an attempt to take advantage of of what is a challenging situation. Um, trying to put the pieces together with updates on our funding, um, balanced with the plan that was passed in December, um, to really reflect on our current practices and make deliberate but thoughtful changes um, to yield more coherent and clear allocations across those direct FTE um, or staffing allocations. And so there are cases here where despite our best intentions and really our best efforts, there are cases where we haven't been able to successfully maintain some of the programs um, based on requirements imposed on us by external bodies to be eligible for funding and maintain compliance. Um, there, are, there are also cases where that rounding up policy and weighted student formula is intended to balance out um, or help right, kind of mitigate the impact of, a, of an allocation going away. Um, and there are also places where we have, for example, allocations that were intended to help with the initial rollout of new initiatives, new curriculum that we always intended, or it was they were always meant to scale back after that initial rollout took place. So I think there are there are different cases for you know each of the different components of these proposals, and I think I know I am willing, we are willing to to share you know specific examples or talk through particular cases during the discussion if that would be helpful. Um, and we do also see, as you can see at the bottom, that if additional revenues materialize, there is also the continuing opportunity for some of these investments to be considered for additional restoration. On the next slide, uh, we have a, a fairly comprehensive um, outline of the next steps in our budget development process. Um, really beginning this coming Friday when we plan to share weighted student formula, MTSS, and direct services or centrally funded allocations with, with site leaders. Next week, uh, site leaders will receive their budget templates to right, use those allocations to create plans in consultation with their communities through the school planning process. We're looking at dates for a budget town hall before the end of the month to share more information. And then as you move through the rest of kind of winter into spring towards the end of the year, um, there are updates related to the LCAP or the local control and accountability plan our second interim report, and then towards May and June, recommendations on our LCAP and presentation, discussion, and approval of our LCAP and budget for the 2022-23 school year. That concludes our presentation for this evening. Um, so thank you, and we look forward to to discussing this with you all. Yes, thank you. And I know there is no action tonight. We are just updating and discussing. But before we hear from the board and our student delegates, let's open it up to public comment, giving one minute each. Thank you, President Lopez. Um, is it okay if I start by reading in a comment that was emailed to us for yes. this item? Thank you for doing that. Great. All right, this email is from Dorothy Chu. Um, it says, Dear Board of Education, I ask you to consider a plan to cut, or I ask you to reconsider the plan to cut five classrooms from Lakeshore Elementary. 
I am a parent of a current kindergartner that did not list Lakeshore as a first choice when we applied, but Lakeshore has exceeded our misguided as we did not have the chance to have tours in the pandemic year expectations. I'm so happy we ended up at the special place where my daughter and our family could be participants in a progressive, diverse, and harmonious community of learners. Lakeshore is unique in its ability to successfully carry out critical intersectional work that will serve to advance the future of SF, not further drive division and segregation. My daughter's classroom is a bona fide harmonious mix of equitable representation from SF, SF's communities. I fear taking away the resources will hinder their school's future irreparably. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, can we have, um, raise your hand if you care to speak to uh, the budget presentation. Can that be repeated in Spanish and Chinese before we proceed, please? Uh, buenas noches. Si usted desea hacer comentarios públicos con respecto a la presentación relacionada con el presupuesto del distrito escolar, por favor, levante la mano. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Rianda. Good evening, board commissioners. Once again, Dr. Matthews and Deputy Superintendent Board Martel. My name is Rianda Batiste, and I am joined by two other APAC leadership team members. Excuse me. As an African American Parent Advisory Council or APAC, we have been closely following SFUSD's budget forecast and impending cuts to classrooms, services, and staffing. Tonight's presentation gave us a little more hope, although it confuses us as well. Though we understand that hard decisions must be made to balance our budget and meet the current realities of our district, we are incredibly concerned about the impacts those decisions will have on African American students, one of our most vulnerable and historically underserved populations in SFUSD. Looking at tonight's presentations, we are even more concerned with the potential cuts to safe and supportive schools, professional development for coordinated care, curriculum and instruction, training for tier two and three interventionists, and more if we go against staff recommendations. <coughs> Excuse me. There was mention of reducing COVID health and safety coordination, but we know that our schools are holding a lot of work and depend heavily on central supports. Black children being a focal population in addition to one of the most impacted populations of all harms are often the recipients of everything that is possibly on the chopping block. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mary. Hi, good evening. Um, we are curious about your analysis of the potential negative impact of the budget and want to know what safeguards are being put in place to ensure that our black students are not overly burdened by any cuts that must happen. How has the team assessed the potential negative impacts they will have on our focal populations? If we move forward with cuts, we worry about the downsides in classrooms, potential layoffs of newly hired black and brown staff, reduction to transportation routes that typically bus black children and cuts to academic and social emotional supports that our children heavily rely on. If you have assessed the impacts of the budget cuts, can you share those reflections and actions that are being considered to uphold SFUSD's core values to stand with those most vulnerable in our community and put our students' needs first? In this assessment, you should also look at the district and how are you going to actively partner with families, especially in making critical decisions like the budget, which directly impact our children? Please involve families throughout the process. Let us know how we can help and work together to support our children. Nothing about us and our children without us. Thank you. Sienna? Good evening. We were recently contacted by the Lakeshore Elementary School site-based APAC. They have lifted some alarming concerns to their proposed budget cuts that include losing five classes next fall and possibly a sixth the following year, and a recent reduction of buses leaving the Bayview Hunters Point area this year. It is said that they went from three buses to one, dramatically impacting the access, um, the access our students have to schools of their choice. Are you able to share the direct impacts that changes to transportation have had on Black student attendance? and enrollment at Lakeshore. Also, what, it, what guidance has been offered to school sites around engaging families and funding decisions? We stand with schools and families who are, who are and will continue to struggle with budget cuts 
as inevitable as they may be. We ask that you critically, that you critically, that you think critically about our children, our black children, and ensure that they don't take the brunt of the harm. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Gregory. Hi, thank you. Uh, the board was unhappy that a large majority of the proposed budget cuts were from school sites. Please consider hiring an outside agency to do an audit to see what we can be cut from the central office. I don't think the central office is capable of proposing cuts to itself. Please remove explicitly race-based criteria from the MTSS criteria. These rules prevent poor schools with a large number of Asian students from receiving the supports they need. Specifically, Rosa Parks and Jean Parker end up in tier one instead of tier two because of those criteria. Also, I didn't see any mention in the budget update about the proposal for the state to cover busing costs. If that happens, can we please revert the awful start time changes that were forced on SFUSD families? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Chris. I'm Chris Klaus, a SPED teacher at Washington High School, and my fear is that the central office cuts from December's budgets may have been conveniently disguised as cuts to centrally funded positions that provide direct services to students as well as positions that make sure that those services work well. At that point, we all will get to have a surprise, more cuts to school sites moment, and I just don't understand how this is supposed to work. This year, like no other, has shown what it's like to not have enough educators or paras in our classrooms, and we have received a ton of layoff notices. Our educators respond to students when they are in crisis, and now, and they are the linchpins between students and their uh, students, their families, and the district. And now we are terrified of losing our jobs or our amazing coworkers. When educators feel secure and stable in their jobs, they are more able to effectively support students. To think that you can have a stable school without critical staff, including our paraeducators, please don't forget them, flies against everything that we know about education. It's unacceptable and negligent to continue down a path that denies students the resources. That Thank you. Hello, Julie. Hi, I want to echo the comments and concerns around the equity of cuts that are being proposed. I want to specifically ask for um, more transparency and an analysis uh, by school by school of both staff and dollars um, over the past three years so we can look at we can assess changes. And I would like not a PowerPoint presentation with bullet points on what the impact of central office cuts might be but an actual assessment of which staff would be cut and what responsibilities they're holding. Um, what I saw in the central office recommendation was a plan about adults, not about students. I'm concerned about the cuts to professional development and other, other family liaisons and crowds and other folks that um, provide direct support to students. Um, this, uh, this plan um, should also, this data request should also look at the um, proposed closures to classrooms. Um, again, site by site and with an equity analysis, we have this ad hoc student assignment process working towards integrated schools in this effort. Thank you. Hello, Tiana. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Tiana Tillery and I'm an officer with UESF and parent educator. Almost 150 educators, mostly women and people of color, receive potential layoff notifications. And while not everyone's going to receive an official notice, I don't understand why even one parent is being considered for um, as new positions are being discussed tonight. Uh, one administrator position can easily pay for several pair of positions to be saved. I feel like that. I feel like parents are in an abusive relationship with SFUSD. You tell us you love us, you need us, um, you can't do this work without us, but every time concerns around budgets arise, SFUSD is quick to want to dump us. You are constantly, we are constantly being used, abused, but we stay because we love our schools and we care about our communities. Our schools need more parents, um, need our parents, and honestly, we need our schools. Think about the direct impact um, it will be on our students. Um, during moments of crisis, students as well as educators count on us to help our students feel safe. Please show that you love our pair of educators as we consider the potential layoffs. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Frank. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, my name is Frank Lara. I'm the Executive Vice President of UESF. Thank you for your time. Uh, I'm glad to hear that there was a comment on reflecting of past practice because really what I'm seeing right now, the tone is very similar to what I saw unfold in December that led us to the current cuts. You know, educators are tired and we as a district cannot afford to lose the full opportunity to rebuild SFUSD on sound footing with this amount of money. My major concern at the moment is a presentation around central office cuts. After my first three office, three months in this union role, I received dozens of district pleas to address their maternity leaves, family support leaves, benefits and pay. I was told that it was because the union said cuts to central office that the benefits and payroll was cut to one person, right? So for me, the folks that are making those decisions made that decision back then. And we're seeing the consequences now of having an understaffed department, area member facing area. We really need to be questioning that. It's extremely concerning that the that district is looking to lay off entire classifications of paraeducators, mostly women, folks of color and long-term employees. We are paying very much close attention on this issue and we will not stand aside to see our classifieds just cut and thrown out. Thank you. Hello, Leslie. Good evening. My name is Leslie Hu. I'm the secretary of UESF. Um, I'm here to stand. Um, I'm deeply concerned about what I'm hearing tonight. Um, this is really, really detrimental to, um, the, to our young people. Um, and just to give an idea of what it looks like on the ground, an amazing paraeducator who works at a high potential school, who has been a stalwart in the community, who has been working in SFUSD since 1983. He has been an SFUSD employee for 38 years and he got a layoff notice. This is not okay. This is disrespectful, inhumane and shameful how we are teaching how we are treating our paraeducators in particular. Please consider the young people and educators who are working tirelessly every single day. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Maggie. Hi, my name is Maggie and I am a school social worker in the district. Um, I worry that district management and top leadership has continued to prioritize central funding cuts to the centrally funded positions that are less than two degrees away from direct services and programs that provide direct services to our students and families. This is not what we meant when we asked for central positions to be evaluated and reduced. Where are the checks and balances to ensure that those at the top of our central offices, particularly three plus degrees away from directly working with students, are being evaluated and considered for reduction, as well as transparency around the process of how those at the top of central offices are analyzing, prioritizing, and deciding on which positions to cut, what data they're using to support those decisions, and the impact it's going to have on our most vulnerable students. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Jerry. Hey, good evening. How's it going? Um, I'm Jerry Almanza. I'm an officer with UESF, and I'm also here. Um, I mean, you guys, you guys hear it, right? But just one point that I thought was interesting: just last week, we heard from the HYA consultant group for, for the superintendent, and a big topic of conversation was about how our um, how we already know that central office is has too many administrators, and there was reports from all these different cons small groups that they interviewed that talked about how there was a frustration from our site administrators and how our site, our site based direct services, our educators, our paras, our uh, psychologists, our social workers, our nurses, how uh, our, our staff support staff, how they uh, are still wanting to provide support for their students that they can't find the right resource in central office, right? So we know how valuable the people on the site are. And it's important to fund our schools first. Thank you. Forgive me if I mispronounce, but Yahira, Yahira. Hi, good evening, folks. Uh, buenas tardes. My name is Yahira, Yahira Quapio. I'm a school social worker at Viz Valley Elementary. 
And um, what I want to share tonight is that I'm very concerned that this presentation was rushed and that the public may not have been able to fully access mm -hmm. and digest the information that was presented. Specifically on slide seven, are we to gloss over the suggestion of decentralizing SFSD staff? We need to address the potential harm that this will cause and the additional work for our site administrators. District management has conveniently defined central funding as cuts to centrally funded positions that provide direct services to our educators, students, and their families in the form of consultation, professional development, crisis, and mental health support. Shout out to the SIT program and our mentors. We aren't, uh, why aren't we making a recommendation to decrease the size of our district management? For example, in SFSD division, we have hired multiple new supervisors, managers, and administrators. In the midst of a mental health crisis impacting our children and youth, we cannot entertain the cuts of SFSD central services. It will greatly impact our school communities. Please share how our students and families are sharing their input in order to center their needs. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Tom. Hi, I'm a special education teacher and a parent in the district. I'm uh, gonna tell you what I tell my son and my daughter and also my students, I'm gonna challenge you because I know you can do better, right? This is not okay. When you say you're gonna cut or reduce the, uh, the help to new teachers, new teachers, when I was a new teacher seven years ago, I didn't get any support from the district. Luckily, my site people helped me. But to just to say, oh yeah, that's great, whatever, we're not gonna cut it. And also to kind of say, we're not recommending. And once again, I've said many times at the board meetings, are you going to schools? Are you talking to people? Are you seeing what's needed? No. I see that when the budget is talked about, we're talking about it really late. This should be the first item, just like when the COVID thing hit, but we're not, we're putting it in very last. This is not, this is people's jobs and livelihood. I also speak about paras and raising the pay. And it's not just about paras, it's classified, but I, I think people are just out of tune and don't, don't really care about the people who are in day in and day out. They say this is good news. I, I don't see how this is good news. Please do the right thing, please. Thank you. Hello, Penelope. Hi, Penelope Van Tile. I'm a parent at Lakeshore and a member of the school site council. Our SSC sent a detailed letter seeking reversal or revision of the disproportionate proposed cuts, a meaningful public engagement and a transparent reporting from the district of how enrollment reduction were being allocated to school sites across the district. We asked for a response before today, February 8th, when we understood that the proposed enrollment capacity reductions would be finalized and have really severe budget impacts for us. We heard crickets. School site councils should not have to beg district staff to communicate with us about policy decisions this consequential. One minute of public comment at a board meeting should not be our best way to be heard. After following up again this morning, I at least received acknowledgement of receipt of the letter from the superintendent, but we have had no substantive response to our objections. And meanwhile, staff at our schools are getting pink slips and the first round school assignment process is barreling forward. This process is grossly inadequate and is facilitating unjust and very poorly rationalized outcomes that undermine every single one of the district's self-professed core values. This is wrong. Thank you. Hello, Erin. Hello, thank you for your time. Um, on top of budget cuts identified earlier by district staff because of a flawed and rushed agreement between UESF and the district, forgive me, I'm a social studies teacher at the high school level. Um, so on top of those budget cuts, there are going to be increasingly and dramatic cuts to personnel at many high schools across the district. These cuts totaling 6.7 million will mean a loss of programs and supports for students across the district. They, these cuts will hurt students and teachers. Please do not approve the contract extension, which will come up for a vote to you next um, meeting. One which over 45% of UESF voters, which includes certificated teachers, as well as classified staff and paraeducators did not approve. 45% of us did not approve this contract. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Rennell. Yes, good evening. I'm a teacher at Dr. William L. Cobb School. Our children and families desperately need your help. 
Our school community is devastated by the decision to close one of our two kindergarten classes and give preliminary layoff notices to two classroom teachers, both teachers of color. COVID has further furthered the divide and inequities that our students experience compared with other schools in our district. We serve a social economically disadvantaged community. 72% of our families fit the criteria for socioeconomic status. Many of our families face homelessness, poverty, and intense trauma. Stability and trust are crucial to our school community. Prior to COVID, our school was growing. Multiple generations of extended families have trusted us with their children. Our families are clearly at a disadvantage and do not have the resources and capacity to raise money to fund our own positions as many other schools in our district Thank are you. able. Hello, Cassandra. Hi, good evening, folks. Cassandra Curio, President of United Educators of San Francisco. You've heard from many of our members tonight and community members with the same sentiment in that these cuts, as you had stated in December, would come through to school sites. We reiterated and pressured at that point to highlight the fact that these cuts will ultimately come down on the backs of workers at the school site and impact students and families negatively. And now we're dealing with those consequences in the midst of the what looks to be a downturn in this surge. This isn't fair. This isn't fair for families. This isn't fair for students and certainly not for the workers, for all of the educators who've been working their butts off all semester long. This is especially uh, disjointed when we look at how this is coming down. We know that there was a plan to right size schools. We know that there was even a resolution to right size the funding mechanism by which that occurs by funding schools first. And that is ultimately what you're hearing tonight. You need to fund schools first. That means the school budgets. That means the individuals that work at those school sites and to make tough decisions about who further away, you heard degrees, you heard student facing services, whose jobs could potentially be stalled, paused or held off on in an effort to right size and make sure that schools are kept whole. Central office positions that don't work directly with students, that don't work directly with schools. Instead, as one mentioned, SFSD having 15 new administrators, but how would they have that if they have no workers next year? Who would they be administrating over? The goal here is not to point fingers, although that is in the situation, the unfortunate truth, but instead to prioritizing schools and funding for schools and the people that work with them first. This is necessary and difficult, but that is the call. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Lisa. Lisa? Um, sorry about that. Hi, my name is Lisa DiMatte, and I am a parent and employee at Lakeshore Elementary. I'd like to urge the board to reconsider 20% cuts at Lakeshore, which will mean losing five of our dedicated teachers and key staff members from our Title I school. Using only round one data for a popularity contest of funding schools is unjust. I absolutely understand there is a need to cut to balance the budget, but cuts must be made fairly across the district. We are the most diverse school in San Francisco, and that's a key reason why so many families find a fit at our school. For a board that values diversity, please don't dismantle what we've built. As a new Lakeshore employee, I've seen from within how hard our staff works to meet the needs of each and every student. Just last week, our social worker and student advisor hustled and even drove to homes with applications to make sure fifth graders are registered, registered for middle school. Lakeshore is a model of diversity. Learn from us, don't dismantle us. Thank you. Thank you. And Sophia? Good evening. I'm a teacher at Dr. William L. Cobb Elementary School. 
And like the rest of the people who spoke before me, I'm extremely concerned about how the budget cuts will disproportionately harm our black and brown students, families, and staff. Though Cobb is small, it is truly a special place. Cobb is not just a community, it is a family. And because of that, every single person at Cobb is important and essential. Currently, we're at risk of losing not only one of our kindergarten classes, leaving us with only one class and no potential to grow, but we are also at risk of losing teachers and staff, specifically teachers and staff of color. Because our school is a family, losing just one person will end up hurting so many. Every single person is an essential part of our family and the impact that everyone makes in our community is so deep and connected that we simply just cannot lose anyone. Dr. William, Dr. William L. Cobb Elementary School was named after the first black man to become a principal in SFUSD and it has served and continues to serve students and families of color. I ask you to uphold these values, the core values of SFUSD and reconsider taking away our kindergarten class and any funding thank, for our thank staff. You. President Lopez, I conclude the public comment. Thank you for that, Judson, and to the public for commenting. I'd like to open up the discussion to student delegates, board commissioners, uh, student delegate Lamb. Thank you. Um, I have, first of all, just a clarifying question. There's some talk about finalizing in public comment. I just want to confirm that we're we're not voting on anything tonight we're not taking action okay cool that, that is correct this is the opportunity to have an update and for uh, the you uh, commissioners to give feedback okay thank you and i guess one of the first questions i have is we outlined all the negative effects that would happen um and gave examples of what we might see with the central cuts but i'm wondering uh, regarding the money that we're getting at the site level um, from the governor's budget, will that change the expected amount of FTEs that we would be losing at each school site from last December? Like, would we be gaining any of that back? Uh, yes, that would mean, um, so originally in the, in the balancing plan from December, uh, there would have been $39 million of reductions in weighted student formula and $11 million to MTSS. And with this update, there will be $15 million of reductions in WSF, right, instead of 39 and no reductions to MTSS. So that would mean that um, I don't, I don't have a number, an estimated number off the top of my head, but that is a significant number of likely staffing reductions that will no longer take place. Thank you. I think that's all for now. Go ahead, Commissioner Bogus, and then Commissioner Maliga. Just to, to clarify, the staffing reductions you were just talking about that potentially could be saved through the additions to the weight and student formula are separate and different from the reductions based on decreased enrollment over the course of the last few years that are all kind of happening um, in this upcoming cycle. Is that correct? Um, sorry, can you... Say that one more time. I, I just missed the beginning of your question. Yes, I was uh, just following up on the, the question from student delegate Lamb in regards to the additions to the weighted student formula. Like those funds that are being back added back in won't reduce reductions that are being proposed in future years based on decreases in enrollment since um, 2019. Is that is that correct? That's correct. Um, what what this what this updated uh, balancing plan reflects is only reductions corresponding to declines in enrollment, but no other reductions on top of that. Okay, yeah, no, I think that that clarity is really helpful for people who are, are wondering about reductions in the number of, of teachers and classes at their school site and how this will impact that, understand that 
the weighted student formula money being added back is separate from that. Thank you for that, Clary. The next question I had was around the base teacher staffing roundup. And just if you could talk a little bit more about the impacts that that would have on the schools that are receiving the roundups and I guess the schools that aren't and kind of how we would see that play out through the district and kind of if there's any more you could just add to have us better understand what that shift does at a school site level both ways. Sure. Um, so the idea there is that, um, and I think I will I will do my best. Uh, it does that question does get a little bit into the the kind of technical pieces of weighted student formula, but the the idea is that our current weighted student formula teacher baseline um, does not round to a full classroom. So if you take the example of a kindergarten, a, an elementary school with 30 students in kindergarten, um, even though that enrollment of 30 means that they would need two classrooms um, per our student teacher uh, ratios. The funding is per pupil, right? It isn't rounding up to two in the baseline, uh, in that baseline calculation. And so this, this revision would, um, would round up. So, so to say, even though um, 30 students in this case means two classrooms of 15, it would round up to two teachers, but that is, is paired with, um, with that close review of, of enrollment capacities um, to make sure. So that, so it means that um, the, the baseline in weighted student formula for each school will align with the number of classrooms that are being set up through um, through that capacity review. Um, I don't know if that was, <laughs> please let me know if I if I should try that uh, again to be a little bit more clear and simple. No, no, I think that made sense to, to me. I, I think my question is, can, can we talk a little bit about how that impacts other sites and kind of the distribution of staffing and if that is any way being used um, or if that is any more, is that more possible to do now because of the decreases in enrollment that we are gauging for across the district or are those two things totally separate and unrelated to each other or are they indirectly related? I guess I'm trying to see how those two things are impacting each other in this moment. Got it. Um, so I do think that it is it is something that is much easier for us to do with um, that review of capacities and aligning them to our actual enrollment patterns. Um, because right now we have right a little bit of we have cases where the example I used, we have schools that have the equivalent of like one and a half classes worth of students, which can be very challenging for a school when it comes to budgeting. Um, so with making those adjustments to the expected number of classrooms, uh, it basically creates more alignment between the plans on the capacity side, the enrollment patterns that we're seeing, and then what that means in terms of staffing at a school site. So that was um, that was the idea. And part of the reason that we also have been looking at that is a way to, to balance some of those other reductions to the sense to the direct service FTEs. Um, one example being some of our multilingual pathways, language pathways allocations where we have used supplemental funds to support language pathways, uh, but with this proposal, we would incorporate language pathways staffing needs into the weighted student formula baseline instead. So the supplemental allocations would no longer be necessary. Thank you for that clarity. Um, the last comment I have is in regard to, I think, the slide on page seven, which focuses on the additional reduction targets for the $10 million. 
and I guess I'm just curious. I definitely hear from staff that they aren't recommending that we move forward with this. And I think reading the slide, it also, I think, indicates very strongly how opposed staff is to this um, and kind of the negative impacts. And I think one thing that I see from this is uh, from staff, I guess, indicating that the, a lot of these central office positions that are in these three categories directly support the work that students in the classrooms do and that these would be the impacts of them. Um, and I, I appreciate that clarity. I think the thing that I'm wondering is at the next presentation or people have it now, if we could get a little bit more clarity about what reduce means um, and really quantify that in terms of a percentage or number of people um, to just really get an idea of what the, the full scale is. I, I definitely understand from staff that it is not something we want to do, but with what's presented, I actually don't have an idea of what the actual impacts would be. I just kind of, I'm just scared because <laughs> I, I just see a lot of bad things happening. And I think that clarity um, would be helpful. I'm also interested if there was any analysis done on the divisions outside of the largest three um, and just if there is any indication of there isn't enough money there, there's not enough things to examine there. Um, and I guess just kind of lifting up why we we chose the, the largest three divisions and why those those are the, the ones we feel like would be the best to, to find those funds. Well, the short answer is that if we're uh, making uh, reductions at, at, at the large numbers, at the numbers that we have to hit, um, those are the, those that, you know, the, the dollars are is where the people are. And so that's why the three largest divisions were, were looked at first. Okay, so that makes sense. So basically the rationale is basically these are the three largest divisions. They give us the best chance to make the reductions without crippling the work that's being done and kind of eliminating that. And so that's kind of how we ended up with these three as the ones versus other divisions. I would agree with all of that except the crippling the work part. Okay. I think that as you heard and saw, I think that um n you know it's it's no matter what it's it's not a good uh choice we we know we have to make these reductions uh we know we have to right size the district so uh in order to do that yeah in this case th this is the place that we looked at because we knew those that's where the most dollars were but when you looked at the work the the, the biggest issue for us or the, the biggest concern for us and we wanted to you know, this is a discussion. This is the opportunity to hear from you as a board. Um, but what we really want to make clear is that in um, we know that this is a, a the board has you know made it clear to us uh, many times over that um, that uh, that the classroom is the highest priority. So that's why uh, so many dollars were targeted from Central. But we felt it also critical to make sure that the board and the community understands that the supports that uh, sites have uh, traditionally and over these last years uh, been expecting from Central uh, definitely are not going to be in place as these cuts go forward. So we're not saying they're not going to go forward, but we want to make a clear picture of what the impacts of these cuts are. No, I think that's helpful. Um, and, and so I, just as far as the clarity on the scale of the cuts and the reductions, is that something that we have available or we could have shared at the next update with a little bit more detail and clarity just to kind of see what that looks like? I just want to be really clear. The numbers of FTE like that this is, is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. I'm open to FTEs. I'm also just open to like getting like when I when I see the word reduce, I just I don't actually know reduce. Uh, this one maybe is a good example. Reduce supports to focal populations such as targeted counseling. Yeah. Like what does that mean? Got it. Okay. So yeah, and it's numbers of FTE is what it is. Okay. So we will we will we, yes we can get that. No, that would be perfect. And I think having how those FTEs add up to the dollar amounts that are indicated, even though this isn't a supported recommendation, I just think having that extra clarity would be good. And I, I think the last comment from me is, I think what I'm just seeing is that the budget process and the way that we examine the the structure of our central office maybe need to kind of happen in two separate parts. Also, I, I, I 
I have a hard time figuring out the best way to change the way that we operate centrally to support school sites at the same time that we're trying to reduce and make budget cuts across the district. It feels as if we are potentially not prioritizing everything in the way that we need to as we maintain our current structure and shape. And just to say, I think as we transition our current superintendent to our next, that we really think about the way that we structure our central office in our district and what new ways that we can operate to ensure that school sites are focal and central point and potentially more staff to support more of the things that they need to do. So less of that is coming from central office in places where it makes sense and is like cost prohibited. And so I think just lifting up the, the need for that conversation not separate from the budget conversation, but I think um, married to it just so that we can can really re-envision the way we provide services to maximize savings um, as well as making sure people get what they need. Thank you. Okay, I, I know Commissioner Moliga is making comment and student delegate Lamb, did you wanna follow up? Just wanted to add on to Commissioner Bogus. I also am paying attention to slide seven and I'm wondering like how we decided which I mean, which cuts or which impacts to put on this slide? Like, for example, how did we decide versus all the possible um, reductions we would have to make to like student family services that we are listing things that um, clearly are very important, like um, reducing COVID health and safety coordination um, or like the student and family link. So uh, in addition to Commissioner Bogus's um, request for an update, the next time I would like to know exactly how we determine that these would be the ones that would be reduced or eliminated, that's all. Thank you. Well, I can just tell you that the, each of the division leads worked within their teams as they were developing their own reduction plans inside. So as they were reducing their divisions, uh, they they wanted to highlight, they wanted to make sure it's highlighted what 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 as a community we can expect moving forward. Go ahead, Commissioner Moliga. Uh, thank you, President Lopez. Uh, thank you to staff for um, working on the uh, budget. Uh, I know it's been um, just a long, tough process. Uh, so thank you and just, you know, cheering you on as you continue to like, you know, hold it down for us in terms of the numbers. Um, I had a, a couple of, uh, inquiries around just process and how we're moving forward with things and is uh, I think Mr. Duchon is on with us tonight, right? Yes, that's correct. Elliot, you hear me, man? Somebody I am here. There you go. You know, I thought you was having a hard time still trying to figure out technology, but there you go. You got it. Um, so question, uh, Emery, you know, uh, Mr. Duchon, du du Duchon, spoke about, you know, this uh, weaving or this uh, new way of like bringing our formula together in terms of distributing funds, right? And like, I constantly hear over and over, you know, um, our tier systems, you know, like um, some of the ways we're currently funding. And, and, that's, and this is why I brought up Elliot because Elliot could describe it a little bit better. He's actually the one that brought it up. Um, but I'm curious to know where we're at with that process as we're moving forward. Right. How do we get to like one, you know, funding formula? Um, and Elliot, feel free to like chime in if uh, if you could clear that up for me. Yeah, you, well, let me take can. a stab at that. So basically, when I look at this budget, you have been budgeting for a school district that's much larger than what you are now. It's what you were. It's kind of like you went on a diet and you're still buying big clothes. Maybe bad analogy, but I can't think anything better right now. And so I've, you know, I've heard from, you know, the, the beginning true up or right sizing. <clears throat> and that's the most critical part of this budget is that you've got to right size. And, and that really means changes at the school site, because that's where the largest number of your staff are. I, I don't know, you have something like probably. 10,000 employees in the district and probably 80% of them are at the school site. So when I talk about the formulas you use, you apply 
basically three or four different things. And the key ones are, you have your weighted student formula, which looks at the numbers of students in certain subgroups, basically underserved kids at each site. And you apply a formula to that for both staffing and funding. Then you also look at the school in a holistic way and put it in a tier. And you give the schools funding based on that tier. The issue that comes up then, and then you have a third way that you really don't talk about because it's incorporated in those two and that's your LCAP. So you, you're obligated by the state to provide services that are, list, that are, that are explained in your LCAP. So you approach that with your MTSS and your weighted student formula. But when you started out, you had last year a deficit that was structural. That means it's ongoing from year to year. And that was really about $116 million, which interestingly, if you look at where you were three or four years ago in enrollment, you were basically budgeting for that same amount. And then you had some things that kind of helped you along the way, in a way. And I'll, I'll point out one, because it actually was on the slide that your <clears throat> student board member brought up regarding COVID health and safety coordination. You got a lot of federal and state money for things just like that, but you also use them to offset your structural changes in your budget. So from a very, you know, the, the helicopter viewpoint, you've got to look at the structure of how you come about your budget, which is your, and the major part is your funding formula that goes to the schools. And I think you use the term right size and that's got to be right sized. In a separate process, it's, it certainly is critical to look at the central office functions but it's a little bit more difficult. And I'll give you an example. You may have 10 payroll clerks. I don't know how many you have. And you can't cut them by 5% because that would cut half a payroll clerk. So it's much more difficult and it's gotta be functional as opposed to numerical. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, very, it's, it's gonna be important. And that is one thing that Pamela's on and I are looking at and looking at both recommendations for your funding formulas <clears throat> and your central office staffing. But I have to tell you from the beginning of at least my look at this budget and Pam's, the fundamental issue in your ongoing um, debt is that you are staffed for more people with more people than the number of children you have. And unfortunately, that's gonna mean fewer staff. Now, in the end, I know there's a lot of pink slips going out. You may end up by people retiring um, to be able to pick up those people and, and with other vacancies. Even the, your central office positions, people who go to the central office oftentimes have a skill set they brought from a school site and can be put in another position. So it's very hard to tell at this point in time because you have to plan for the worst. You have to plan for that you're gonna lose enrollment again in the fall. You don't wanna staff for a thousand kids more than what you're gonna have. So you've gotta be very conservative about your staffing. And, and that's really the issue about where the state weighed in that you had what was called a structural deficit. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you overspent on one shopping trip. It meant that your ongoing operational funds expenditures cost more than the money you were getting in for that. And you have some very strong assets in your district. You have P funding, you have your measure G funding, you have support from the city. So those things all come into play. And I have to tell you, you have a very complex funding system, but you're not gonna meet those sustainable changes unless you build a process to adapt to declining enrollment. And I wish I could tell you that I thought that was gonna change, but it, it doesn't appear to be every district in the state is dealing with it. I hope that answers your question. 
Hey, Mr. Duchon, I appreciate you, man, like always. Thanks. And Mary Gordon, um, I just wanted to like close it out by saying, you know, in terms of this formula that uh, Elliot talked about, you know, um, I would like to see us um, you know, get a progress or an update in terms of where we're at, you know, because I think once we can land on this um, piece, hopefully it'll help give more consistency to school sites in terms of like, you know, what they're going to be uh, provided in terms of resources. Um, the whole tier thing going from one to two to three is, I think it's it's really confusing for uh, schools. And so, uh, but um, but again, thank you staff uh, for the work and uh, Elliot, appreciate your uh, feedback. Yeah, if I might add just one thing and that's a thank you to everybody. I have talked, I think with every commissioner, I've spent an inordinate time. Thank you staff. I, I know I've taken you away from the big job of doing this. Um, I've met with your, a lot of your community committees. You have a, just an incredible amount of resources in this district at every level, from your parents to your students to your staff. And, and yes, even the central office, um, I know they get maligned a little bit, but, and the commission itself, I, I think you are really taking on a very strong burden in approaching this in a very critical way and I have every faith that the district will resolve this issue. So. Okay. Thank um, you. I have just a very, a very short response to Commissioner Maliga. Um, I think the the feedback from from Elliot and Pam around, you know, aligning our the you know our method our methods for allocating resources and being really clear about that vision um, has been really helpful feedback for us to, to look closely at weighted student formula and MTSS. Um, you know, we are, we want to be careful not to make too many changes at the time, at a time that we're also making reductions because it, that can, that can compound the confusion. Um, but there are, I think there are opportunities for us to be more clear and aligned to, to LCFS, to the LCAP. Um, and I think just a, a quick update is that for MTSS, uh, our research planning and assessment team is actually in, in collaboration with Stanford to do an evaluation of MTSS as an intervention. And we, we expect to get the results of that evaluation in the spring. Um, in May. And so I think, I, I expect, I imagine that we will be sharing the findings of that study so that we can think about whether there are changes or evolution, um, right, to continue to align and be mo more coherent. But in absence of that right now, it felt like the restoration made the most sense to make sure that we weren't introducing more confusion for schools. Thank you, and thank you, staff, for uh, your continuing work on this, uh, on our budget. Um, I have a couple things. Um, one is, generally, I'm in favor of the $15 million total reduction from weighted student formula because it's aligned with our reduction in, in students at the schools. However, I want us to, to think about how we can avoid creating situations where schools will have one kindergarten. Um, which we're hearing from school sites because, I mean, for obvious reasons, but I'll state some of them. I mean, if you reduce a school to one kindergarten, it makes that school that much less attractive to the community. And it makes it so that over time, we will be put in the position of having to look at closing more schools. And the schools we've closed in the past disproportionately, far and away disproportionately affected African-American families by far and then uh, Latinx families after that. Um, so I just want us to think about, even if we're gonna have these cuts, how can we avoid creating that situation? Because um, I just don't think it's fair to those communities. So we might wanna adjust our thinking. And uh, my question is, how did we come up, uh, people in the public said that we're using uh, round one numbers to determine uh, funding. Is that accurate or are we using current uh, the, this year's current enrollment to make predictions for next year's costs? Or is there a combination of efforts being made? Deputy Superintendent Lee. Actually, I believe uh, Orlo O'Keefe has just uh, 
joined us, and I would ask Chief O'Keefe to, to lead off in responding to that question. You are on mute. We can't hear you. I apologize. Um, good evening, commissioners and uh, superintendent. It's actually a combination of things. When we were setting the capacities, we didn't even have the round one data. Um, and uh, so we were looking at uh, current enrollment. So if you um, take a look at the capacities as they were, as you know, we've lost about over 3,000 students uh, since before the pandemic, so our enrollment has shrunk. And at the same time, our capacities hadn't been aligned for years really with current enrollment patterns. So there's actually 6,000 more seats than there were um, students enrolled in schools. So that's a huge delta. Um, and we wanted, as Anne-Marie and others have said, you know, to make sure that we were as coherent and as aligned as possible, that our capacity numbers um, are a reflection, a closer reflection of our enrollment than they have been in the past. Um, so that was a big piece of it. Um, we also, um, when we shared the uh, enrollment or the draft capacities with schools to provide them with an opportunity um, to review them and give us feedback before they got finalized, we shared that we were also going to look at um, the number of children that are applying to go to school. And next year, the enrollment application just closed yesterday. Um, but as many families have already um, shared, uh, round one data is just one part of the snapshot, right? So we know that, for example, about 16% of families who enroll in round one um, do not become students. Um, about 10% you know, receive their first choice and they still don't enroll in SFUSD. Uh, we also know that a significant number of families, particularly our focal families, enroll closer to the start of school. So we're taking that into account as well. So while we see you know, attrition uh, from round one demand, we also see a whole new applicant pool that comes in. So we're looking at that um, data over time to see approximately how many it is. So it's a combination of those, uh, those data points that we're going to be using, as well as reviewing the feedback from school sites that we've received uh, to finalize uh, the capacity numbers. Okay, thank you. Um, the other area I wanted to address was the um, staff has made it really clear that they prefer, prefer not to have an additional reduction target of $10 million cut from central office from curriculum, student, family services, and technology and at the same time recommending a $5 million cut in direct services. So I'd like us to think about whether we could, I think there's an echo, um, maybe have a $5 million additional reduction target for uh, those three departments and maybe other departments to equal 5 million and then reduce to zero the direct services, um, $5 million reduction. So I'd like us to think about that as we move forward. And I'll save my last question for later. Uh, just quickly, um, I'll hear from Commissioner Lamb and Commissioner Alexander, but to the point that was just made around round one numbers, if we're expected to get more applications, then isn't it premature to make a decision on cutting classrooms before we get more students who are applying? Would you like me to respond? Yes, sorry, we just have an echo for some reason. Um, it's, it's one of mel multiple factors that we're taking into account. So we look at, um, for example, that we're going to get a certain number of families that apply in round one. And we know that not 100% of families who apply actually enroll. We see about only 84%, so we take that into account. And then we know that we get a number of more students that apply um, after round one right up. And so we look at those numbers as well. So it's kind of like you have your round one numbers minus what you're assuming for attrition based on past patterns with round one, not everyone enrolls, plus the new students. 
and um, that we anticipate getting um, after round one and up to the start of school. And it's those three numbers, when you put them together, it gives us an opportunity to project what our enrollment might look like by the time school starts. So it's, 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 it's multiple, it's not just looking at the round one data, um, it's looking at other aspects as well. Right, and I think my question is then, how has a decision been made already if this is just the beginning of that data? Oh, a decision, the, the round, the capacities aren't finalized. We um, shared drafts with school with schools um, to provide them with an opportunity to review and provide feedback. So we've got that feedback that we've to review as well as the applicant data uh, before we finalize the numbers. So we're in the middle of that whole process right now. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Vice President Lamb and then Commissioner Alexander. Thank you. Um, thank you to the staff um, for the update and the progress that's been made. I have a specific question just following on Commissioner Sanchez's um, ask around the direct service of 5 million. Could staff go through a little bit of the rationale um, between, you know, of the 5 million, why is that recommended? Um, and how, what programs, um, you know, the scope would be helpful? Um, I can provide a little bit more detail and then I think if there are areas that we should go deeper, um, we can do that. I think uh, across the list of direct services that were in the balancing plan um, to be to be reduced or eliminated, um, across each of them, there are a few that it is recommended that we fully restore um, as you know back to what what they currently are. There are a few that uh, we are recommending we partially restore, um, and then there are a few that we do that we are recommending that we uh, right uphold the reduction. So, I think, um, for example, for um, for JROTC, uh, the recommendation there is that we partially restore those programs, uh, and specifically that we restore. The, out, the allocations at the schools where we are able to, um, where we're able to meet the requirements from the US Army that are necessary to successfully have a JROTC program. We have a number of schools that either don't meet the enrollment threshold for the, uh, having at least 100 students. Uh, we have sites that don't have the right number of approved instructors and have struggled to find uh, qualified instructors, uh, things of that nature. And so in collaboration with um, and feedback from, from high school principals, uh, the recommendation is to restore the programs and maintain the programs at sites that are able to successfully uh, administer the program. For, um, mm -hmm. So I think, for example, and Anne Marie, sorry to cut you off. If you're going to, yeah, it would be helpful to go through some of those initial restorations from your recommendations from the December. But for example, ROTC. I think you all know. I, yeah. you know, am a supporter of the program. We know what a difference it makes in in students' lives and their leadership development. And the fact that you know, I do know it is a big cost to the sites. Particularly, it, the, the threshold around the requirement from the U.S. Army is quite high. I believe it's an enrollment of 100, 75 to 100. You know, those are the type of creative solutions as well that, you know, for example, if you do have a school site that has lower enrollment, are there ways to, you know, be creative where those young people who do want to be in the program to be able to be engaged at, at you know, at other sites? And, and I'm not saying that we have to go into those details, but that's just an example, like, are there opportunities for that type of um, leveraging, um, you know, as an example? So, Anne-Marie, sorry, I cut you off there. Yeah, no, that's okay. And I think that that's really important and that we haven't, you know, we haven't gotten that that far in, in the discussion, but I think that it makes sense that we wouldn't want the students 
at the schools where the program might not continue to miss out on the opportunity to participate if there's a way that we can, right, that we can be creative and, and come up with a solution that would give them access, um, but not hold up, right, not put us in, in, in the situation where we're struggling to fill vacancies, which means that those students aren't actually even getting the program at their home site currently. Um, I'll go a little bit more quickly through the others because I know there are a number, but for um, multilingual pathways, uh, because of that roundup approach that we have, that we're looking at for weighted student formula, the recommendation for multilingual pathways would be to restore the allocations that support world language programs um, and some of the other um, kind of specific language programs, but that the language pathways supplemental allocations would not be restored based on this roundup approach in weighted student formula. Um, for peer resources, the recommendation is a partial restoration to ensure that the sites that are planning and and want to keep keep their peer resources program in place have the ability to do so, um, but that the allocations be revised to, um, to essentially to align to enrollment in the program. We have um, we have some really wide discrepancies between enrollment in different schools and their allocations. So schools with low enrollment with a high allocation and schools with high enrollment and a low allocation. So see that as an opportunity to create a, a clear through line between enrollment in the program and the allocation that the school receives. Um, recommend fully restoring the community schools coordinators positions and further recommend that should we receive the community school coordinator or community schools grant that we, we move those positions onto that funding source as part of a district wide initiative. Um, <laughs> let me see. And then there are, uh, there are a couple of programs, uh, the middle school math class size reduction. That is the program I referenced about where the funding was to help implement something that we have su successfully rolled out. And so would propose, um, eliminating that funding, which is very small FTE increments um, at, at many of our middle schools. Um, the secondary school redesign allocations are currently, those would also fall into the roundup um, approach for weighted student formula. So rather than these kind of allocations on the side to support supplemental staff, build that into the into the weighted student formula baseline, um, restore special education allocations. And um, the final piece is the enhanced social emotional supports, which um, is which we are recommending that we um, that we do not restore um, there the, those sites there had already been communication that central funding would not continue for those allocations. They were previously PEAF funded. They moved to the general fund. They are not, um, I think there are opportunities to look at a more systematic approach to the sites that are supported by that funding um, other than this, this particular method. And I, I think that covers all of them. <laughs> Thank you. That's um, particularly helpful. So I think maybe then as a follow up, I'll like to um, friendly amend or ask uh, what, for Commissioner Sanchez's request of that 5 million to maybe also do a mid. So even like, you know, zero to two to 5 million of that direct services. I guess what I'd like something. to know is what is being cut with the 5 million because we've just we just heard about what's being restored, but there's no specifics about what's going to be cut. Um, so I'd like to know that before. <laughs> so what would be cut would be 5.5 um, FTE of enhanced social emotional support allocations, um, about four FTE that are partial increments, and enhanced social emotional supports are all 0.5 allocations currently. Peer resources would, would be about um, 
four or five FTE in partial increments. Mass class size reduction is currently five FTE. Again, all of these are partial, partial FTE increments. Um, the supplemental language pathways allocations and the secondary school redesign supplemental allocations and JROTC funding at schools that have not uh, been able to maintain their programs according to Army requirements and Navy requirements. And the last two make sense in a way, but the others are seem to me to be fundamentally supporting kids at sites. It's direct services to kids. Um, with JROTC, it's talking about the sites not having the ability to hire somebody who's qualified or meets the standards. And the other for redesign, that's not direct services for the students. So, in the cases where we're offering to cut direct services to students, I think we ought to take a second look at that. In, in the instance when there's feedback from commissioners, what is the process as far as? Well, right now it just seems like it's an iterative process that we're giving feedback. I, yeah. I, I wasn't making an amendment. I was just saying no, I know. what I personally would like, I'd like us all to consider, but I'm obviously, um, it's up for a big discussion, yes. Okay, so Commissioner Alexander and then Commissioner Collins. Okay, is it, I should go, did you want more on from staff? Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just echo everyone's thanks to staff for working on this. I know that it's um, a ton of work and I know that um, it's challenging and, and that everybody is working hard and with the best of intentions. Um, so I do have some critical comments tonight and I just want to preface them by saying that and saying that I really do value and respect um, where staff is coming from on this. And um, but, but I want to express some um, disappointment and concern. Um, first, I want to go back to the capacity question, um, and I don't know if uh, Chief O'Keefe is still available, but um, I just have real uh, equity concerns around how that's being rolled out. I mean, if we if we just even looking at the three schools that um, were represented well tonight in public comment, Cobb, Sheridan, and Lakeshore, Cobb is twenty nine percent Black students. Sheridan is 18% black students and Lakeshore is 12% black students. Our district-wide average is 7% black students. So, so we already see from those three schools that we have, we're having a disproportionate impact, impact on black students and families, which several of the public commenters mentioned. If we eliminate kindergartens at those schools, we essentially are, are as Commissioner Sanchez said, saying that per, we're permanently reducing their size. Um, so I guess, one question is, how is that being factored? How, is, how are those concerns around equity and race being factored into the process, um, Chief, Chief O'Keefe? Yeah, thank you. Good evening, Commissioner. Yeah, I agree. It's absolutely a point of concern. I think that um, you know we have 21 uh, kindergarten classrooms throughout the city um, that we reduced. There are six schools um, where it's reduced to one kindergarten class. And as Commissioner Sanchez said, that's a real point of concern. Our kindergartners are our future. And it's frightening to think that as we're seeing a decrease in enrollment in the district, that some schools are more impacted than others. Um, and so that, that, is, that, that is really unfortunate and true. We're also recognizing that it's got absolutely nothing to do with the quality of the schools or the brilliance of the students or the staff and the work that they are doing. Um, during this pandemic, we have lost a lot of students and some schools are more impacted than others. Um, we're also hoping that it's temporary, that it's not a permanent state um, and that we will do a lot as a district to re you know, to build up faith in us as a district and begin to take steps that will help increase our enrollment. I also think shifting away from a full choice based system, which has not served uh, the interests of our schools, especially our schools in the Southeast, to more of a controlled choice where we um, develop zones, where families choose within zones. There's hope that 
um, that that will be a disruption, by the way. I don't mean to um, make that sound like it's a rosy solution. It's not, nothing we do is a rosy solution. Everything comes with challenges. But when you've got unconstrained choice that's really hurting our schools, particularly schools that have a significant number of our focal students and children of color, um, that, that is a problem um, that we need to do multiple things to arrest and, and turn around. And so there is great concern all around about the, the schools, um, especially those that are in densely populated areas, um, reducing hopefully on a temporary basis to one kindergarten. Uh, Lakeshore is different than the other schools. It actually has four kindergarten classrooms right now, and it's being reduced to three. Um, and uh, their current capacity is set at like 91. They've got you know a, a difference of enrollment and capacity of about 91. Um, so they're going from four kindergartens to three kindergartners. Three kindergartens classrooms are um, more uh, financially efficient at the higher level. I know it's, I'm saying that tonight because it's a budget context. I know as a parent, there are different ways to think about a school and what's important. But in the budget context, if you've got three kindergarten classes, when they get to fourth and fifth to the higher grades, it turns into two of those classrooms as opposed to three, right? Because well, you've got 66 yeah. turns into two thirty-threes. So, well, that's um, a concern with the with a school like Sheridan, though, because so I mean, if you only have one kindergarten, what do you what even happens at fourth and fifth? That was one of my questions because then you don't yeah. then you can't combine them to create the larger yeah. fourth and fifth. So yeah, it almost exactly. feels, I mean, the creating, going to one kindergarten at a school does feel to me like a not temporary solution. It feels like a, we're closing this school type of conversation. And I, that concerns me. If that's what's happening, we need to be honest about it. And I, I just, I just have real concerns about that. So I, I would, and, and in particular, I guess the other issue yeah. and, and that came up. I and feel I don't, concerned that it's. Sorry, go ahead. I apologize. Go. Oh, she's frozen. Um, I was just saying that this question of school closures is um, not part of this context at all. And in fact, as we were trying to work to uh, find a way to reconcile the difference between the number of children enrolled in our schools and the number of schools we have, um, we were clear that we did not want one of the solutions to be closing schools. And that is why you're seeing situations where schools are going you know, down to one kindergarten. As I said, it's temporary. It's also draft. Like we have not, like this is, this is why it's an, an open process. We shared draft numbers. We haven't um, finalized them yet. And we are in the process of doing that. Right and can, I, can I ask a question about process that I appreciate you bringing sorry, up? Because just, I... one, just one, what, one other thing I forgot to add to provide context. You know, the capacities are not determining enrollment, right? So we're not going to set enrollment um, below what we anticipate. We're not going to set capacities in a way that it will suppress enrollment. Um, so if, if it, um, even, if, it, even if you were to set, you know, capacity uh, at, at a higher number, it doesn't mean to say that they're going to fill up more than one kindergarten classroom, right? Well Right. Well, and that relates to my question around process. So, I mean, I, I talked to one principal who said, I understand we have to reduce enrollment, but why can't I do a two, three combination or a one, two combination and keep two kindergartens because I actually have lower enrollment at these middle grades. So, I mean, I guess one of my questions is why aren't we giving school, like if we're reducing the capacity based on reduced enrollment and thus reducing budget, why can't we then let give schools some flexibility to say we want to maintain two kindergartens, but we want to do a two three combo, let's say, as an example. Does that make sense? My, my question. What, why does it have to be determined centrally? It makes perfect sense. Um, and that's the kind of feedback that we're getting. Uh, we shared uh, the capacities. Principals have responded. We're in the process of reviewing all the feedback. That is one of the suggestions that's come in. Um, and all of that feedback will be used to finalize the capacity numbers. So like I said, they're not final. This is sausage making, right? So we shared draft capacities as a, um, as a recommendation and we're getting feedback and we're gonna be making adjustments based on that feedback and other data points. And, and are you the decision maker on that? I'm trying to clarify that too, because several principals said they didn't know. They said they had to, they filled out a Google form 
they talk to their boss and lead, their boss and lead talk to the head of EPC, and the head of EPC to talk to some mysterious decision maker. Um, so I think there's also this question just around people not understanding the process and being able to engage with it. So is, is that, are you the decision maker on that, Chief O'Keefe? And if so, are, is there a, are you gonna be able to talk directly with principals and heads of SSCs that have sent letters and not gotten responses, that sort of thing? Yeah, so for months, it's actually been a cross-departmental collaboration where um, budget, EPC, lead, special ed, multilingual department, there's actually a team of people that are um, working on this together. So it's been a cross-departmental collaboration. Um, and uh, so that group um, will review the feedback. We'll then um, uh, share what we've uh, uh, the information with lead before responding to the principals. And who's on that group? You Who want to members? know the name? I do, the, yeah. The, yeah. The names absolutely. of the folks? Yep. Okay. Dr. Matthews, do you want me to say this out now or do you want me to email yes. it? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and share it. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Just wanted to check. Um, so the group includes, and let me bring up the list here. Um, this is crazy that we don't have transparency around this. It's totally insane. I also have the list, Orla, if you'd like. I mean, um, yeah, sure. If I, I, I'm happy to do it. I'm, I'm right here. I'm just, I'm just opening up okay. the. Um, but thank you, Anne Marie. So, um, uh, sorry, I just to we have a clarifying question. I think yeah. out of this, um, while you're pulling up the list of folks, I think following on Commissioner Alexander, Superintendent, I would really appreciate, you know, through this, if there can be one point of contact so that around clarity around, I understand it's a working group interdepartmental, but as far as, you know, who is that point of contact ultimately around process, I think it's really important for both the board as well as tonight for our conversation um, for the public. Yeah, I mean, that's what, this is what makes principals and parents at site council so frustrated is it, it feels like there's no transparency around how these decisions are being made, right? And people feel like stuff's being done to them instead of with them. Like that's what's going on here. It was the same thing with the start time issue. And it's the exact same thing that's happening right now. And that's why you heard so much frustration in public comment tonight. It's not because people can't make hard decisions, even when it might impact them negatively or their school community negatively. People can make hard decisions if they're involved in the process and there's transparency. So the fact that there's this working group and that people don't even, and that there was reluctance to share the names, right? People had to, Chief O'Keefe just deferred to you, Superintendent Matthews, because there was almost a sense of, are we allowed to say? And I just, I think that's troubling in terms of how we make decisions in this district. And it's, and it, you know, like I said, I literally talked to a principal who said, I, I have no idea. I filled out a Google form and I have no idea who's going to get back to me. They said, you know, several, I've talked to multiple principals who said, my boss in lead is advocating for me on this but I don't understand the process. So again, I'm not saying that we don't need to reduce some kindergartens, I, I'm not. I'm saying, where is the space for collaboration? Where is the space for dialogue and discussion? Not filling out a Google form, but actually being in dialogue with community, right? Thinking through these issues around race and equity and, and what will be the impact and are there creative solutions? I said, like I said, I talked to a principal where there was a creative solution of we could combine classes and do this but they've just sent this off into a Google form ether and gotten no response. And so then, then their community spends all this time and effort and energy coming out to the board meeting, giving public comment. Um, and, and so I guess that's, to me, I'm more concerned about the process than the outcome. I don't wanna micromanage these decisions. That's not our role as a board, but I think the transparency and the decision-making process is, is really key. So let me just answer one of the things you just said is this is the same as the, uh, the time start. So you you just heard uh, Ms. O'Keefe say that the schools uh, got the information uh, so that they could give feedback. So the information has gone out to them. They're giving feedback both through the form and through lead. Uh, their lead director is on that team. So feedback is being given. And as you just heard, and as uh, Commissioner Sanchez said earlier, this is an irritative process where we're trying to get to the best solutions. Um, the 
the forms just went out last week. So we're, we're, we're making sausage and we're trying to get to the best place. So there, we're getting feedback in, in the best ways that we can. And, if, and uh, uh, I'd say another part of it is we're also taking feedback from the board tonight. Thank you for can clarifying just, that. Can and I just it, add, I just want to be really clear that it wasn't just here's a Google form, fill it out. There were actually a number of opportunities that we had for leaders to engage for Ms. O'Keefe and team and, and all of us were on the working group to get that feedback that Dr. Matthews and Orla spoke about. Um, not only did our, our leaders meeting with their lead teams in the one-on-ones, in the check-ins, looking at their numbers and giving feedback that way, we've also had a uh, professional development that, or sorry, a, a meeting that had both our elementary leaders, PK-8, as well as middle school to talk about it, where afterwards, EPC and folks from the budget team actually had office hours with leaders to talk about their particular uh, situations and their issues and get that feedback. So I just want to be clear, it is never perfect and we could always take feedback to improve it. But I want to be clear that it wasn't just a, here's your numbers, do a form without any conversation and communication. And I understand that EPC actually just met with the folks from uh, Sheridan, I think the leadership team. So as, as Orla said, the conversations are still happening and definitely welcome feedback to how they can happen better, but I don't want it to be said or shared or miscommunicated that it was fill out a Google form and it was not a humanizing process, even though it's a very frustrating process for many folks involved. Well, and just to be clear, I don't, you know, as a board member, I don't Thanks. share this kind of stuff unless I'm getting calls from people and we're hearing public comment. This came up at the budget committee last week. So I guess also, I just want to be clear. I don't want to be having, like I said at the beginning, of this, I trust you all, I respect you all, I think you're doing really good work. I don't want to be having these difficult conversations in a public board meeting. So if it were actually, if the process were working, I wouldn't be brazing it. So just, again, like I don't, I'm not trying to question people's intentions or hard work or any of that. But I think there's a cultural challenge in this district that, you know, again, I, and I think it relates, it's, 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 it's related to my other point. I'll just make that and then I'll be quiet because I've taken up a lot of space here. But the other point is just around the central office um, functions analysis, which I think is also um, disappointing. Um, we heard really clearly from the HYA report that our central office is oversized and siloed and that that actually has an impact on instruction. Like that was the thing that, that was in that report. And so, um, Again, I, I feel like the, the central cuts that were presented to us tonight were, uh, you know, Commissioner Bogus mentioned the word that it's frightening. I think it was presented in this sort of frightening way. There wasn't a look at dupli possible duplication of services um, or the effectiveness of services. It was just like if we cut people, there won't be services, right? And I just don't, I don't think that's how, how people in schools experience this. So I guess I just want to say that and say I hope that, um, again, I, I'm not, going to say this million or that million of direct services. If there's reasons we need to cut some, di some direct services, let's make that case. But I think we also need to look at, at, at central services. And so on that point, I just um, would like to ask about um, the, we have layoff notices also going out. That's the other thing. So within central office, and I assume a lot of these layoffs are not just, there's the 15% of way to student formula, but there's also central office layoffs. And I heard the concern expressed tonight that upper management wasn't impacted. So I did an info request last Wednesday evening after the budget committee asking for that information. I haven't gotten it yet. So I just would like to know when, when are we going to learn about the, the unrepresented reductions to FTEs and how that offsets with respect to the para and teacher reductions? Because again, I think this, we have to be clear and transparent about these things. Um, so that people trust when we're asking them to make sacrifices. Can I try to respond to that? So thank you, Commissioner. Uh, on the issue of the information request that you that you submitted to us uh, a couple of days ago, I think, Ms. Gordon, I believe, has responded to say thank you for the, the question and, and we will work on it. Um, very soon. I, I know we've started to pull that information together, but um, Ms. Gordon, can you speak to the ETA on that? I know there are so many things going on this week. It's a, it's a bit of a balancing act. Yes, and I, um, I will be coordinating with uh, 
with Kristen Bajur, a Chief Human Resources Officer. She is also working with her team um, to pull together pieces of that information. And so um, in terms of in terms of timeline, personally, I am not 100% sure. Um, I do need to coordinate with Ms. Bajur to see where they stand. Um, Sorry, I, I, maybe this won't be a time for to figure out when we'll get those responses. I think it's clear you, you've made a request and then. Well, can I, sorry, President Levin, just on that one, I just want to, I need that before we vote on layoffs. I mean, I guess that's the thing. Like we, I just want to make sure that that's come soon enough that before we're asked to vote on the layoffs on that issue, if that makes sense. Right. Sorry, I had a flash that we're not voting today. So. Right, right, right. I wasn't saying that I needed it today. Yeah. yeah I just. Again, I, I think my larger point, if I can just, I'll wrap up, so I, I know you're trying to, like, is just that on all these things, and so, so on the, the other info request I submitted was, was around what are the schools that are getting enrollment de declines? Because we don't, like I just heard tonight, 21 are reducing kindergarten, six are reducing to one. Those are all information that we didn't have. And so I think it also makes it really, really difficult when the public doesn't have information, when the board doesn't have information, and then this stuff goes out, layoff notices go out, or the capacities go out, and nobody provides the, the whole picture. And all that information is kept, with, I would, I'll use the word secretly, but I mean, I know that's not the intention, but it feels that way from the outside. And so I guess I just wanna say, please, in this process, when we're making hard decisions, we have to be transparent. We have to be inclusive. We have to go the extra mile around um, making sure that we're including people. Um, in those processes. And we as board members get that feedback. Like we're the ones that people call, we're the ones that people are like, you know, you all need to fix this. So, it, it, because we're hearing from people at schools, because it comes, they, co they come to the principal, they come to the, so I, I know you all know this, but I just think, honestly, I think we need to do better. And so that's my plea <laughs> tonight. So thank you again, staff, for the work on this. And um, I look forward to continuing the collaboration. Yes, and just um, and to did you want to respond? Because I I'm, I want to support hearing other voices. I know there yeah. there is actually Elliot Duchamp, no, um, other people who want to respond to what's being said, and then I think Commissioner Collins also wants to comment. But um, yes. trying to help wrap it up. I just wanted to confirm that we will have a response to the information request before the board is asked to vote on layoffs and that it will include both unrepresented and represented staff who work in central office. Thank you. And I know there was a request for names to be shared uh, for people to be able to contact someone directly and a point of contact to make it easier for, for folks to get that information. Elliot? Duchamp, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, th thank you. And, and good evening again. And I, I know this is a very difficult process, but let me point out a few things since I'm actually paid for by the state. And my job is kind of a dual role. One is to advise you and your staff on how to get your budget in line. And the other is to report to the state on how well you are doing with that. And I think Deputy Leung, Chief Wallace, and Director um, Gordon can attest to this. Probably the second question I asked is, how are you doing your enrollment projections? Because those are the fundamental um, fact that underlies how you create your budget for next year. You know, you, you know to some degree how much money you're getting in, and that moves through May. What you don't know are how many students you're gonna have. And because you have, you know, you've had other monies to cover for that, you're still budgeting. And I wanna say this again, for probably 55 to 57,000 students and you have 50. One of the things that I know that we as fiscal experts were looking for and the state was looking for is are you going to align your staffing with the number of students. So that's staffing. And this is a practice that happens in every school district every year, growth or decline, where at this time of year, they do staffing allocations to schools. And, and I, will, I, I don't mean to be 
Well, let me just say that in most districts at this point, it's a mathematical calculation. It's not a process that's either transparent or not. Information is gleaned from schools based on what's happening there. Your central office takes that information and does like a dartboard, which is what you're calling your capacities. Your capacities doesn't mean, if, if you lay off one teacher at a school and you're losing one kindergarten class, chances are it's not a kindergarten teacher that's gonna be laid off. So you're gonna have to do a lot of adjusting in the fall. This year, you chose not to do that. And you know that, that was a cost to the district that will be very upfront and blunt about that. I also wanna tell you that $5 million to direct services is half of a percent of your budget. Well, it's actually less than that. It's half of a half of a percent. So I, I wanna tell you from an oversight point of view, I think your staff is looking very clearly at to frame the, the hurt, the pain from the classroom. That doesn't mean it's perfect. What's going to have to happen, this is step one. And whether I'm here or not, or Pam's here or not, the state will always be looking at what you do in the fall when you true up your allocations with your staffing and your number of kids. And it's an ongoing process. So I, I will tell you that I was actually quite relieved when I found out that what process your staff was going through to do your projections for what your school sites will be. And, and I'll be honest that at first I didn't understand how the term capacity was being used, but capacity ends up being the dartboard for where the staff believes your enrollment will be. Your staff is not shrinking the enrollment at schools, your population is. Um, you have a lot of schools under 200 kids that is very difficult to staff just because you've got, you know, K through six and now probably TK and, and more coming along the line. It makes it very tough because you have bubbles in your, in your cohorts that move through. So it's a very difficult mathematical process. And I am more than sure that the dialogue is not done between the district office and the staff. What you're hearing now, and, and I, I understand this completely, I've been through both sides of this, the layoff side and the being laid off. Neither side is fun, but a lot of fear and a lot of unknowns that unfortunately will not be known until that you get the students show up in the fall. So I, I hope that helps. And I, I hope that the commissioners understand that we are paying a very close eye to the staff also and the information that they bring to you. So uh, I hope that's clear. We are also looking at district office staffing. That's a little bit more problematic because it ends up being a reorganization in some cases. So I just wanna say that, thank you. And I commend you all, it's painful. And commissioners, I know you literally hear the word on the street when you go to the grocery store. Um, you know. I, I live in the middle of my district I have for the last 40 years. And I've heard the word on the street when I worked in the district and when I didn't. So it can be very tough. So I, I sympathize with that. So thank you for your good work. I know it's a painful step, but it's a necessary one. Thank you. Commissioner Collins. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to really appreciate um, some of the questions from my colleagues. And um, I guess I wanted to highlight a few and then ask some questions. So I really appreciated um, Commissioner Sanchez and Commissioner Alexander's questions about kindergartens. Um, I would like to see a, a list of all the kindergartens that would maybe meet the requirement of being only one class that is very concerning. My kids went to a very small school and there were two kindergartens. So, I mean, even two kindergartens going, you know, there's just two classes per grade level. That's a small elementary school. And I do have serious concerns about a school's ability to um, stay open. Um, and then I guess 
one of the questions that I have related to that is, you know, the question that we've heard is how are we determining doing our enrollment projections? I, I think about that as a district, but then I also think about that at a site level. And I know that there was a time, I think Commissioner Sanchez, we were, when, when we had a, a school year where we saw a, an enrollment increase in certain schools and decreases in other schools. And it brought up a question for us of like, how are we allocating students to sites? And as, um, you know, um, Ms. O'Keefe mentioned this idea of full choice, unconstrained choice can cause problems. And so, um, you know, how are we balancing our enrollment projections based on, you know, schools? Because if we have a school, you know, for example, in a neighborhood where we have an under-enrolled kindergarten, you know, 15 to 18 kids, and then two blocks away, we have another school that is over-enrolled and we're kind of expanding their classrooms, it seems logical that we would be balancing enrollment between those schools. And, and I've never, you know, I know it's not perfect, you know, we see movement, but, you know, where we can maintain at least two kindergartens at every school, I think that is kind of necessary for, you know, school, every school to be healthy. We want to make sure, and we know, I mean, we've got future projections that we're going to see an increase in enrollment at some point. That's why we're building schools, right? And so we don't want to see any close during this time period when all schools in the, in, the, in the state are experiencing enrollment issues. We want to make sure that we have kind of healthy, you know, cohorts of kids and, and as, as equally distributed, I think, as possible. So um, I appreciate those questions and would love to see a list and, and I would love to be able to look at it just based on maybe even if we could analyze it based on demographics, it would be really great to see that would help me, you know, have, have a lens to look at of the schools that are potentially, you know, being reduced to single kindergartens. Are there larger, you know, proportions of those populations that are in our focal populations and things like that? Um, and then I guess the other, um, I wanted to get the list of names for the points of, um, I'd like, if I can know who a point of contact is now, that would be great. If you have to tell me later, that's fine. But I would love for that to be available to the public. Yes, I think we're make, we have said that will come up today. So, so we'll we'll hear it today. Yes, okay. that's the request. Okay, and then I would also like the the list of names on the committee. Um, I'd like to hear that. I think somebody was going to read it. I'd like to know who's on the working group. Can we just hear that now? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to share that. Great. Um, and I, I want to, to build on, on some prior comments. So, um, you know, in the past, uh, capacities were set by school sites, um, reviewed by LEAD, and um, then used by EPC. And EPC facilitated um, that discussion. It was decided this year that it was really important in light of the budget crisis, the shrinking enrollment, and the massive delta between the capacities set at the school site level versus actual enrollment, that it was our responsibility um, to uh, take more of a constructivist approach. So it is a different process that we've used this year. And um, we were asked to, um, to take that approach for a variety of reasons. One, because sitting at the central office, we have a system lens that's not always available um, easily to um, every individual school site principal. There was also the amount of time and effort that it was going to take um, school site principals to do it. And the fact that we wanted to be aligned and coherent. So working across departments, like working with the budget and EPC, multilingual, special education, kind of a variety of groups um, and collaborating closely with LEAD who are the primary um, you know, uh, supporters and contact with uh, principals. Um, and so, and as, uh, as uh, Deputy Ford Martell shared, it wasn't just a Google form that, yes, that was one part of it, but we had lunch and learns, we presented as citywide, we had office hours. Um, and so there were, it was a quite an elaborate process with lots of um, opportunities for discussion and interaction. 
Um, and so we've been working with the lead on it and the group that's been working. And so I would say in terms of point of contact, principals should always work with their lead folks. That's who principals should work with. Um, and that's who I would encourage schools to continue to work with. And we are working with lead. Um, the people that are on the work. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be rude. I just really wanted a, just one person. And the question that Commissioner Lamb had asked was, is there one point, point of, of contact point. that's in, in charge of overseeing this process? Not, you know, for individual. So I, I just, if I could just get a quick answer. I know right. it's getting late there, and there, I don't there, know, I appreciate all the information, but. You know, yeah, there are two, there are two sponsors for that. And that's Myung Lee and Nikki Ford Mortel. And then there's everyone on lead that's involved. And then there's staff from EPC, from budget, from school portfolio planning, from multilingual departments, um, from the multilingual department team and from lead. But I would say in terms of points of contact, we've our deputy superintendents and then, um, uh, but I think for schools, you know, following up with uh, their lead is would be the person that they should follow up with. Thank you. And, and if sorry. we could get it, I'd love just a list of names of people on this working group. Maybe you could give that to me. Right. And I'm just going to say, sure. um, yeah. for the sake of this meeting, looking at the time, please, let's just give a direct question, a direct answer, then we will wrap up. We're, yeah. we're, we are going on around an hour and a half. Thank and you. We're at the point where just ask your questions, get yeah. give us the answers, and then we can move on. Thank you. And so um, the other thing that I wanted to ask is, um, I'd like, uh, I'd like to, I guess, reinforce questions that the commissioners had around when I see potential impacts of additional reductions. I'd I'd like to see the FTE, the actual job title in the department and the amount. Um, and and um, I would like that available to the public as well. I think for me, the biggest, you know, what I'm hearing from my colleagues, and I think it's really important for me as well, is that there's a level of transparency in understanding how decisions are made and that the, the, the information is shared um, in a way that allows for the public to participate. Um, so, um, and as far as central office staff goes, I think, um, I guess what I wanted to know is it feels like my colleagues have consistently asked about ways that we can reduce central office staffing um, for our unrepresented staff. That's like at the highest levels of central office. We've heard that that involves reorganization, but Commissioner Alexander and Commissioner Sanchez wrote a resolution this time last year, which we approved. Before that, I believe Commissioner Sanchez and Commissioner Moliga also wrote a resolution um, when they first announced they wanted to do zero-based um, budgeting. And it's been a consistent request since I was the budget chair that we have a way of evaluating, you know, how we should be more efficiently using our resources in our administrative positions. And so I'm wondering if we can't do this, if staff is not able to do this after three years, maybe we need somebody else, and this came from public comment, to help us evaluate how we can be more efficient with our administrative staffing. Because as Commissioner Alexander has said, it, we are top heavy, we've heard that in the report. We may not be able to make immediate changes like this month, but I'm just wondering, when are we going to start doing that analysis? And if we have another budget cycle, we're saying we're going to wait. That's going to be four years since we've been asking. So um, I would like to know, um, Superintendent Matthews, maybe you can tell me, you know, how can we start to evaluate? What's a, what's a way that we can start to evaluate how we can maybe better reorganize central staff and make reductions, whether they happen now or in the future? When are we going to begin that process and how is that, you know, what would you suggest? Later this month, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm uh, meeting with uh, several people um, and um, I've spoken with uh, 
Commissioner Alexander about this. Actually, Commissioner Alexander had suggested one of the people. Um, and the goal is to move that process forward in terms of looking at forms and functions in central office, especially uh, looking at an analysis of the positions and a comparison to districts our size and uh, looking at the numbers of FTE as well as the management structure for the district to determine if in fact uh, we are top heavy or not. Sorry if my answer was too long. Many comments from Commissioner Lamb and Commissioner Bogus. I'll try to be brief, but I think ultimately we went through this in December. What we heard from Elliot just to this evening is absolutely yes. The analysis and the work that has to happen around our central budgets and you know the four categories, rec service, indirect, and operations administration. But ultimately, I really, at the core, what I also want to understand through the analysis, through a process, is given our conditions, we have seven years of declining enrollment. We're soon going to find out, at least imperfect, but we're going to know what early signs of what enrollment's going to look like. By May, we will know as well, because that's when our round twos are due. To me, what is also very critical is looking in multi-year projections around the portfolio of our schools and the number of students that we have. What type of enrollment increase escalations would we need in order to meet kind of the structures and funding that we have? I think that is a fundamental discussion. And granted, look at our colleagues right now, they're probably going on hour four, if not five, a public comment in Oakland around sustainable schools and a sustainable district. So I think that has to be done in this holistic way and we've talked about. And that is something that we cannot deny because that is how the state of California decides to fund its public education at this moment. So I just wanna be able to lift that. That is something that we fundamentally have to address in a longer term. Um, which has already been raised um, through the fiscal analysis and recommendations from um, from our fiscal experts. Thank you. Uh, I guess my, my first comment is a request for board leadership. I would love if we could schedule at a committee a whole a conversation about the enrollment decline projections as well as the enrollment increase projections that we have in relationship to our new school being built and just how we're kind of putting those kind of different numbers together and what kind of collective strategy do we have to ensure that we don't get to a place where we have to close schools. So I would just ask board leadership to entertain that and figure out a way that we can have that conversation. Um, and I guess this, this next one, I guess, is for, for board members and staff. I think for me, the term right size in the district doesn't accurately capture like the moment that we're in and the severity of what we have to do. I mean, it seems that we're saying right size, which means a reduction of 7,000 students within our district. And that is separate from any, and even if we get additional funds from the state, that wouldn't actually change our reductions in that way. So I think just for people to understand the scale of what we're being asked to do in this moment, and that there isn't anything in upcoming budget projections that is gonna change that because it's based on a drop in our enrollment. And we are being told repeatedly that we have a school district that is too big and so I think we need to figure out how we want to wrestle with that and what that actually means and be really clear with everyone in our community about the severity of the actions we're taking and what is being asked of us to do. Because I think a lot of people don't understand it. And when they hear from the staff that there's a chance that we're going to have a positive outlook from the state budget, I think they think that means that their schools won't have to be reduced because of these decreased enrollment. And that's not true. Um, and so I just think I just want to make sure that's clear to folks and if we can work collectively on our language to not to scare people, but to make sure people are really clear about the position we're in as we start to develop strategies to get everything back right. So that, that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Okay, thank you everyone for your comments and your work.
we will continue to bring this item on our agendas. I know it's set for the next regular board meeting, which is February 22nd, and we will make sure this comes up earlier in on our agenda. Thank you to our staff and for Elliot for coming. Um, okay, I'd, I'd like to call for a vote to extend the meeting since it's now past 10. And I also am going to relieve our student delegates. Oh, that's, that's right. So we're going to vote to see if we extend the meeting and then we'll be able to have, bring up the closed session item. I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. second. Okay, roll call vote on extending the meeting. Student Delegate Lamb? Yes. Uh, Student Delegate Liang? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Alexander? Yes. Is she here? Oh, okay. Um, Commissioner Bogus? Yes. Commissioner Collins? Yes. Vice President Lamb? Yes. Commissioner Maliga? No. Commissioner Sanchez? Yes. And by, uh, President Lopez. Yeah, yes. Okay, six eyes. Thank you, Student Delegate Liang, for being with us. Okay, now we are on Section K. Reminding everyone, Section J was heard earlier tonight. Section K, board members reports. We'll hear a report from standing committees beginning with the special meeting on Thursday, January 27th. I'd like to call on Vice President Lamb to share. I'm sorry, can you come? The superintendent's here. Can you come back to me, President Lopez? I'm sorry. Yes. I, let's go, let's move to the report from Buildings and Grounds and Services Committee, which happened on, it says here, Thursday, January 31st. Commissioner Moliga. I guess I can't pass it to another committee, all right? So let's see. So we, we talked about three items. Uh, last BNG meeting, uh, we had a good meeting. Uh, we talked about the resolution with the uh, Samoan Community Development Center. Uh, we had uh, SEDC come out and, and made some, some pretty good remarks about the partnership. Um, and then um, we gave it a positive recommendation back to the board. Uh, that resolution is gonna go over to the budget committee next. Um, we also discussed an update on the uh, 2016 general bond obligation. Uh, we have hired a new staff who is now taking charge in terms of uh, rolling out these uh, bond measures, which we're really excited about. Um, and so, Within that discussion, um, there's going to be ongoing, you know, follow-ups in terms of um, how the bonds are being carried out, uh, especially, you know, with some of the items that have been mentioned tonight of the comment and things that we've been talking about, uh, uh, you know, in, in the last meetings around, you know, outdoor learning, you know, the Southeast funds, et cetera, and uh, one of us horsemen men and, and those others. Um, we also um, had a conversation around the uh, facilities division capital condition assessment. And so that's underway. Uh, there's going to be, um, we hired on a group to come out and uh, look at our buildings and kind of give us a, um, I think it's called a, a general plan, uh, capital general plan. Sorry, I'm not a expert in that category, but um, you know, they're, they're going to be giving us some analysis on uh, areas and improvements that we should uh, be looking into as a district. Um, all in all, you know, hopefully, you know, we could uh, put ourselves in a position where we can go out and try to, um, you know, put to, put out another uh, bond to the voters. And so, uh, next uh, BNG meeting will be the uh, the fourth Monday of the month. Uh, so, looking forward to seeing people there. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Chair Alexander regarding the Budget and Business Services Committee, and we already heard about the action item. Yeah, we covered pretty much everything because even so there was action item, which was a QT pack resolution and the budget item was covered uh, tonight as well. It was kind of a, a preliminary version of what we a lot of what we heard tonight around the budget. 
was it covered tonight? I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was. I think we spent some time discussing it. Thank you. Okay, next is a report from the Augmented Rules Policy and Legislation Committee, which happened yesterday. Chair Bogus? Yeah, I can give a quick update and report out. Uh, we took action on one item, Board Policy 5023, Translation and Interpretation, and we made a positive recommendation for it to come to the full board. Uh, and we also had an informational item on the California Community School Partnership Program and Grants. Um, and that'll probably be a standing item for the next few board meetings where we'll have more opportunities to talk and provide the community with information about what we're doing and how we're preparing for that. Uh, thank you very much. Great, and last, Vice President Lamb sharing around the committee, the, the special meeting on the superintendent search. Thank you, and thank you for the extra time to collect my thoughts. So it was on January 27th. Um, it was around the superintendent search, but particularly around the desired characteristics of the next superintendent, and that was identified in four key leadership skill sets, um, which is grounded in a systems thinker with a laser focus on instructional quality and results, passionate cha champion for social justice, effective communicator and relationship builder, and an engaged manager. Um, HYA also presented their detailed report around the over 1,000, um, over 1,200 uh, survey results, as well as the 60 plus um, both town hall and individual meetings with our stakeholders. Um, there's a very comprehensive um, update and in, including on our superintendent search on the website of the school district's website. I really encourage folks to continue um, accessing that website in a, uh, web pages in order to know where we are with the progress of the superintendent search. Thank you. Okay, item two, report from board delegates to membership organizations, CSBA or CGCS. From CSBA, there are, are a number of trainings that are available for board members to participate in. So I will forward those, um, have staff forward those along to the board members to consider. I think it is a really great opportunity to also not only skills build around governance um, for as individual board members, but also an opportunity to network and meet colleagues around the state as well. Can I mention, um, I'm the delegate to the Council of Great City Schools and their policy and legislative uh, conference is coming up in March. I think it's March 8th. It's actually not an ideal time. It's during our interviews, <laughs> um, but um, as they stand now. But if there are any uh, commissioners that would like to join, uh, let me know. It's in Washington, D.C. It's, it's, it's in person this year. Thank you for those announcements. Yes, now you can. Um, I'm, I'm not on any committees, um, but I would like to request that the Building and Grounds Committee meeting take up the uh, agenda item that relates to um, supporting families or schools in planning for, um, for outdoor lunch or outdoor learning. Um, it's in the COVID recovery resolution, and we've heard con consistent public comment <laughs> since last year, um, and I as a district in approving that resolution, we have committed to coming up with a plan for a way that we might support schools in, in outdoor lunch and outdoor learning. And so I'd like that to be taken up in the next building and grounds committee meeting. And then additionally, last meeting, I brought this up. And so I would like to know from um, board leadership when we will be able to um, hear about um, sexual harassment and sexual assault. I've been asking since November and I wanted to get a commitment from board leadership and the superintendent. I'm interested in knowing both what the policies are um, and, and how we implement our, um, our, our own policies in relation to Title IX but, and discrimination, but I'd also like a report from, um, in terms of curriculum, because I've been hearing, I heard consistently from students that we aren't doing a good job of educating students about what sexual assault and sexual harassment is. So I'd like to, to have a full, fully rounded presentation that includes both of those components. Um, and so I would like 
for that to happen. And then finally, I also um, wanted to, to get an update. Um, last year, we had cyber attacks um, on Zoom. There were pornographic um, involving hate speech. We never received a report um, on what the district has done in order to report and investigate those incidents. And last fall, we also had an incident in one of our equity audit um, meetings. And so I would like to request just a report for the public on how we've reported, if we've reported that to the FBI, if we've you know followed up and done an investigation and how we're moving forward to protect students from cyber harassment and pornography and hate speech um, on our online learning platforms. Thank you. Okay, that is publicly noted. Item three, all other reports by board members. There are none tonight. Item four, calendar of committee meetings. Between now and our next regular board meeting, which is February 22nd, there will be a curriculum and programs committee meeting on Monday, February 14th. Yes, it's at 4 p.m. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to section L, other informational items. Side letter between SFUSD and UASF regarding evaluations for spring 2022. Posted on the agenda is a side letter between SFUSD and UASF regarding evaluations for spring 2022. Oh. Okay. And with that, we'll have our memorial adjournment before we go into closed session. We adjourn this meeting in memory of Michael Baroja. Mike Baroja was a beloved member of the Robert Louis Stevenson Elementary School community for over six years. He served the community as the technology educator, testing coordinator, st stop, drop and go coordinator, and after school Excel teacher. He passed away unexpectedly in a car accident on the way home the evening of January 26, 2022. He was 31 years old. Mike was the epitome of graciousness and joy. His laughter and signature smile vividly filled the campus. He was selfless and generously shared his time, resources, and thoughts. He made the effort to help anyone in need, changing a tire, tutoring someone after school, or playing the guitar for events. Whatever the need, it was never too great or too small. He consistently used his talents for the good of others. Mike invested the time to truly help people and cultivated relationships with students, staff, families, and district colleagues throughout his many years of service and dedication to the community. His creative spirit, quick mind, and kindness allowed him to create a legacy that will live on in the hearts of everyone who knew him. Mike embodied what we hope all of our students will become, inquisitive, courageous, community-oriented, and above all, mindful and considerate of others. The students, families, staff, and district alongside his family respectfully grieve the loss of a great man and a life well lived. Thank you for sharing that. We are now on section N, closed session. At this time, before the board goes into closed session, I call for any speakers to the closed session items listed in the agenda. There will be a total of five minutes of speakers, and I do want to recognize our student delegates. Thank you, student delegate Lamb. Why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Um, I'd like to specifically speak to item five, the conference with labor negotiators. Um, I take issue with one piece in particular, and that's cutting the AP prep period bonuses in exchange for one-time bonuses to teachers. Back in December, we were tasked with passing a zero-based budget ting plan to avoid state takeover, but I remember we walked away from that discussion with a promise, and we promised to minimize the damage that would affect students directly. 
This should be our mindset for open session items like budget balancing, but also the closed session items, particularly any labor contracts we make. In December, we grimaced as we saw the breakdown of how many FTEs would be cut. Moving forward with this contract with this clause still in it means that over 60 additional teachers will be cut from our sites. Uh, that might look different for each site, but for example, at Lincoln, that's seven. Wash, that's 6.75. At Soda, that's five. At Wallenberg, that's two. Galileo, five. Balboa, three. And I could go on. At Lowell, it's 23. We also talk a great deal about Vision 2025, about having well-rounded graduates, about prioritizing learning. And students want classes that reflect their interests, that allow them to explore new subjects. And at the high school level, that comes in the form of AP classes. Um, this AP cut means that APs that are not grad requirements might be lost, and these are the classes that we know that students look forward to. Moreover, this affects non-AP classes as well. Programs that time and time again are on the chopping block, like arts or AVID or peer resources or wellness, are funded by the AP funding as well. These are programs that directly support our students and make all the difference for our learners. And maybe we are student-centered in the sense that students always bear the brunt of the burden, whether that is constantly seeing programs they love go or having to witness their newest teachers grapple with being the first on the chopping block, being in tense environments as we all wait for this contract to be voted on, student-centered in the sense that it's always students that take the time and the energy to learn and dive into implications about teacher contracts not because we should, but because we care. So please, as you enter closed session and this item, request an addendum, an alteration, an amendment to this contract that would restore the AP prep period bonus. Thank you. Thank you, Student Delegate Liang. Yeah, thank you so much, Joanna. Um, I just wanted to say that she basically covered everything that needs to be spoken, but I do think that it is very important to, to really truly hear what every student is saying. Um, even in the beginning of our meeting, we had students come and talk about um, this topic. And although I understand that our district did go through various challenges with our budget, I want us all to take a moment to remember why you are here and that we made a promise and that we made a commitment to avoid cutting programs like AVID and these different resources for students to make things more equitable um, on school sites. And I just want to, um, and I really believe that it's time to listen to how students feel about the very issues that impact students the most. And it's not only hurting a certain school or a certain group of students, but it's impacting everyone across the district. And therefore, I urge the board to reevaluate what the passing of this contract meant and the people that it impacts. And moving forward into closed session, I hope that there could be an alteration to this contract. Thank you. Just to note, there are two minutes left. Hello, Aaron. Hello, um, I am a high school social studies teacher. I do not teach an AP class. However, I want to join the student representatives in speaking against the contract, which was opposed by 44% of the UESF members. Um, it was billed, it was sold as a raise to Paris. It does not give them a raise. It only gives everyone a one-time bonus and it will have devastating impacts on AVID, peer resources, and on AP classes, which many of our low income and first generation to go to college students use to prepare for college. So please help our low income students and reject this contract. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Cal. Sorry, Cal, go ahead. There's a minute left. Joanna and Agnes so eloquently highlighted the effects on students. I want to also talk about teachers. I mentioned earlier that it seems really like there's a lack of care for the teachers who are being fired. Um, it is 60, again, it's 60 real people. They do have real bills, they have real families, etc. But moreover, as a student, it's kind of traumatic when you go to class today and see teachers crying because they're worried that they'll, they know they'll be cut first because of the newest teachers. When you see students crying because they know that their favorite teacher will be cut and their favorite program will have no funding, the program that makes school worth going to for them will not be funded. Those students deserve to have those programs that make school bearable for them. And taking away this funding is taking away those programs. So again, like everyone else said, I urge you to reconsider this agreement. Thank you. Alita. Hi, thank you, Judson. Um, and I'm 
while I'm frustrated to hear that AP prep classes might be um, might be cut, I'm even more frustrated to hear that RSPs and gen ed teachers and other folks never had these prep periods to begin with. Um, I think it's important to note that there is an inherent inequity in our system when the only teachers who got prep periods were our AP teachers. So I'm never in favor of cutting anything, but if we are really the equitable district that we think we are, we need to look at what students need the most supports and what, what students require the most planning. Our RSPs often have to work with 28 kids across seven, eight, 10 different classrooms. If you wanna talk about folks who need planning periods, I would encourage you to look at other, other areas, not to take anything away from our AP teachers. Everyone needs planning periods, but let's move equity to the front and center of this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes public comment, President Lopez. Okay, thank you. The board will now go into closed session. Thus, I call a recess of the regular meeting. Recording stopped.